by Edward Gibbon. The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire In the last four centuries of the Greek emperors, their friendly or hostile aspect towards the Pope and the Latins may be observed as the thermometer of their prosperity or distress, as the scale of the rise and fall of the barbarian dynasties. When the Turks of the House of Seljuk pervaded Asia, and threatened Constantinople, as we have seen, at the Council of Placentia, the suppliant ambassadors of Alexius imploring the protection of the common father of the Christians. No sooner had the arms of the French pilgrims removed the Sultan from Nice to Iconium than the Greek princes resumed, or avowed, their genuine hatred and contempt for the schismatics of the West, which precipitated the first downfall of their empire. The date of the Mughal invasion is marked in the soft and charitable language of Zahn Vatices. After the recovery of Constantinople, the throne of the first Paleologus was encompassed by foreign and domestic enemies. As long as the sword of Charles was suspended over his head, he basely courted the favor of the Roman pontiff, and sacrificed to the present danger his faith, his virtue, and the affection of his subjects. On the decease of Michael, the prince and the people asserted the independence of their church, and the purity of their creed. The elder Andronicus neither feared nor loved the Latins. In his last distress, pride was the safeguard of superstition. Nor could he decently retract in his age the firm and orthodox declarations of his youth. His grandson, the younger Andronicus, was less a slave in his temper and situation, and the conquest of Bithynia by the Turks admonished him to seek a temporal and spiritual alliance with the western princes. After a separation and silence of fifty years, a secret agent, the monk Barlam, was dispatched to Pope Benedict the Twelfth, and his artful instructions appear to have been drawn by the master hand of the great domestic. Most holy father, was he commissioned to say, the emperor is not less desirous than yourself of a union between the two churches, but in this delicate transaction he is obliged to respect his own dignity and the prejudices of his subjects. The ways of union are twofold, force and persuasion. Of force the inefficacy has been already tried, since the Latins have subdued the empire without subduing the minds of the Greeks. The method of persuasion, though slow, is sure and permanent. A deputation of thirty or forty of our doctors would probably agree with those of the Vatican, in the love of truth and the unity of belief, but on their return, what would be the use, the recompense, of such an agreement? The scorn of their brethren, and the reproaches of a blind and obstinate nation. Yet that nation is accustomed to reverence the general councils which have fixed the articles of our faith, and if they reprobate the decrees of Lyon, it is because the eastern churches were neither heard nor represented in that arbitrary meeting. For this salutary end, it will be expedient, even necessary, that a well-chosen legate should be sent into Greece, to convene the patriarchs of Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem, and with their aid to prepare a free and universal synod. But at this moment, continued the subtle agent, the empire is assaulted and endangered by the Turks, who have occupied four of the greatest cities of Anatolia. The Christian inhabitants have expressed a wish of returning to their allegiance and religion, but the forces and revenues of the emperor are insufficient for their deliverance, and the Roman legate must be accompanied or preceded by an army of Franks, to expel the infidels and to open a way to the holy sepulchre. If the suspicious Latins should require some pledge, some previous effect of the sincerity of the Greeks, the answers of Barlam were perspicuous and rational. 1. A general synod can alone consummate the union of the churches, nor can such a synod be held till the three oriental patriarchs, and a great number of his bishops, are enfranchised from the Mohammedan yoke. 2. The Greeks are alienated by a long series of oppression and injury. They must be reconciled by some act of brotherly love, some effectual succor, which may fortify the authority and arguments of the emperor, and the friends of the union. 3. If some difference of faith or ceremony should be found incurable, the Greeks, however, are the disciples of Christ, and the Turks are the common enemies of the Christian name. The Armenians, Cyprians, and Rhodians are equally attacked, and it will become the piety of the French princes to draw their swords in the general defense of religion. 4. Should the subjects of Andronicus be treated as the worst of schismatics, of heretics, of pagans, a judicious policy may yet instruct the powers of the West to embrace a useful ally, to uphold a sinking empire, to guard the confines of Europe, and rather to join the Greeks against the Turks 
than to expect the union of the Turkish arms with the troops and treasures of captive Greece. The reasons, the offers, and the demands of Andronicus were eluded with cold and stately indifference. The kings of France and Naples declined the dangers and glory of a crusade. The Pope refused to call a new synod to determine old articles of faith, and his regard for the obsolete claims of the Latin emperor and clergy engaged him to use an offensive superscription. To the moderator of the Greeks, and the persons who style themselves the patriarchs of the Eastern churches. For such an embassy, a time and a character less propitious could not easily have been found. Benedict the Twelfth was a dull peasant, perplexed with scruples, and immersed in sloth and wine. His pride might enrich with a third crown the papal tiara, but he was alike unfit for the regal and the pastoral office. After the decease of Andronicus, while the Greeks were distracted by intestine war, they could not presume to agitate a general union of the Christians. But as soon as Cantacuzene had subdued and pardoned his enemies, he was anxious to justify, or at least extenuate, the introduction of the Turks into Europe, and the nuptials of his daughter with a Mussulman prince. Two officers of state, with a Latin interpreter, were sent in his name to the Roman court, which was transplanted to Avignon, on the banks of the Rhone, during a period of seventy years. They represented the hard necessity which had urged him to embrace the alliance of the miscreants, and pronounced by his command the specious and edifying sounds of union and crusade. Pope Clement the Sixth, the successor of Benedict, received them with hospitality and honor, acknowledged the innocence of their sovereign, excused his distress, applauded his magnanimity, and displayed a clear knowledge of the state and revolutions of the Greek Empire, which he had imbibed from the honest accounts of a Savoyard lady, an attendant of the Empress Anne. If Clement was ill-endowed with the virtues of a priest, he possessed, however, the spirit and magnificence of a prince, whose liberal hand distributed benefices and kingdoms with equal facility. Under his reign Avignon was the seat of pomp and pleasure. In his youth he had surpassed the licentiousness of a baron, and the palace, nay the bedchamber of the Pope, was adorned or polluted by the visits of his female favorites. The wars of France and England were adverse to the holy enterprise, but his vanity was amused by the splendid idea, and the Greek ambassadors returned with two Latin bishops, the ministers of the pontiff. On their arrival at Constantinople, the emperor and the nuncios admired each other's piety and eloquence, and their frequent conferences were filled with mutual praises and promises, by which both parties were amused, and neither could be deceived. "'I am delighted,' said the devout Cantacuzene, with the project of our holy war, which must redound to my personal glory, as well as to the public benefit of Christendom. My dominions will give a free passage to the armies of France, my troops, my galleys, my treasures, shall be consecrated to the common cause, and happy would be my fate, could I deserve and obtain the crown of martyrdom. Words are insufficient to express the ardor with which I sigh for the reunion of the scattered members of Christ." If my death could avail, I would gladly present my sword in my neck. If the spiritual phoenix could arise from my ashes, I would erect the pile, and kindle the flame with my own hands. Yet the Greek emperor presumed to observe that the articles of faith which divided the two churches had been introduced by the pride and precipitation of the Latins. He disclaimed the servile and arbitrary step of the first paleologus, and firmly declared that he would never submit his conscience unless to the decrees of a free and universal synod. The situation of the times, continued he, will not allow the Pope and myself to meet either at Rome or Constantinople, but some maritime city may be chosen on the verge of the two empires, to unite the bishops, and to instruct the faithful, of the East and West. The nuncios seemed content with the proposition, and Cantacuzene affects to deplore the failure of his hopes, which were soon overthrown by the death of Clement, and the different temper of his successor. His own life was prolonged, but it was prolonged in a cloister, and except by his prayers, the humble monk was incapable of directing the counsels of his pupil or the state. Yet of all the Byzantine princes, that pupil, John Paleologus, was the best disposed to embrace, to believe, and to obey the shepherds of the West. His mother, Anne of Savoy, was baptized in the bosom of the Latin church. Her marriage with Andronicus imposed a change of name, of apparel, and of worship, but her heart was still faithful to her country and religion. She had formed the infancy of her son, and she governed the emperor, after his mind, or at least his stature, was enlarged to the size of man. 
In the first year of his deliverance and restoration, the Turks were still masters of the Hellespont. The son of Cantacuzene was in arms at Adrianople, and Paleologus could depend neither on himself nor on his people. By his mother's advice, and in the hope of foreign aid, he abjured the rights both of the church and state, and the act of slavery, subscribed in purple ink, and sealed with the golden bull, was privately entrusted to an Italian agent. The first article of the treaty is an oath of fidelity and obedience to Innocent the Sixth and his successors, the supreme pontiffs of the Roman and Catholic Church. The emperor promises to entertain with due reverence their legates and nuncios, to assign a palace for their residence and a temple for their worship, and to deliver his second son Manuel as the hostage of the faith. For these condescensions he requires a prompt succor of fifteen galleys, with five hundred men-at-arms, and a thousand archers, to serve against his Christian and Mussulman enemies. Paleologus engages to impose on his clergy and people the same spiritual yoke, but as the resistance of the Greeks might be justly foreseen, he adopts the two effectual methods of corruption in education. The legate was empowered to distribute the vacant benefices among the ecclesiastics who should subscribe to the creed of the Vatican. Three schools were instituted to instruct the youth of Constantinople in the language and doctrine of the Latins, and the name of Andronicus, the heir of the empire, was enrolled as the first student. Should he fail in the measures of persuasion or force, Paleologus declares himself unworthy to reign, transferred to the Pope all regal and paternal authority, and invests Innocent with full power to regulate the family, the government, and the marriage of his son and successor. But this treaty was neither executed nor published. The Roman galleys were as vain and imaginary as the submission of the Greeks, and it was only by secrecy that their sovereign escaped the dishonor of this fruitless humiliation. The tempest of the Turkish arms soon burst on his head, and after the loss of Adrianople in Romania, he was enclosed in his capital, the vassal of the haughty Amarath, with the miserable hope of being the last devoured by the savage. In his abject state, Paleologus embraced the resolution of embarking for Venice, and casting himself at the feet of the Pope. He was the first of the Byzantine princes who had ever visited the unknown regions of the West, yet in them alone could he seek consolation or relief and with less violation of his dignity he might appear in the sacred college than at the Ottoman port. After a long absence, the Roman pontiffs were returning from Avignon to the banks of the Tiber. Urban V, of a mild and virtuous character, encouraged or allowed the pilgrimage of the Greek prince, and within the same year enjoyed the glory of receiving in the Vatican the two imperial shadows who represented the majesty of Constantine and Charlemagne. In this suppliant visit, the emperor of Constantinople, whose vanity was lost in his distress, gave more than could be expected of empty sounds and formal submissions. A previous trial was imposed, and in the presence of four cardinals, he acknowledged as a true Catholic the supremacy of the Pope and the double procession of the Holy Ghost. After this purification, he was introduced to a public audience in the Church of St. Peter. Urban, in the midst of the cardinals, was seated on his throne. The Greek monarch, after three genuflections, devoutly kissed the feet, the hands, and at length the mouth of the Holy Father, who celebrated high mass in his presence, allowed him to lead the bridle of his mule, and treated him with the sumptuous banquet in the Vatican. The entertainment of Paleologus was friendly and honorable, yet some difference was observed between the emperors of the East and West, nor could the former be entitled to the rare privilege of chanting the gospel in the rank of a deacon. In favor of his proselyte, Urban strove to rekindle the zeal of the French king and the other powers of the West, but he found them cold in the general cause, and active only in their domestic quarrels. The last hope of the emperor was in an English mercenary, John Hawkwood, or Acuto, who, with a band of adventurers, the White Brotherhood, had ravaged Italy from the Alps to Calabria, sold his services to the hostile states, and incurred a just excommunication by shooting his arrows against the papal residence. A special license was granted to negotiate with the outlaw, but the forces or the spirit of Hawkwood were unequal to the enterprise, and it was for the advantage, perhaps, of Paleologus to be disappointed of succor, that must have been costly, that could not be effectual, and which might have been dangerous. The disconsolate Greek prepared for his return, but even his return was impeded by a most ignominious obstacle. On his arrival at Venice he had borrowed large sums at exorbitant usury, but his coffers were empty, his creditors were impatient, and his person was detained as the best security for the payment. 
His eldest son, Andronicus, the regent of Constantinople, was repeatedly urged to exhaust every resource, and even by stripping the churches, to extricate his father from captivity and disgrace. But the unnatural youth was insensible of the disgrace, and secretly pleased with the captivity of the emperor. The state was poor, the clergy were obstinate, nor could some religious scruple be wanting to excuse the guilt of his indifference and delay. Such undutiful neglect was severely reproved by the piety of his brother Manuel, who instantly sold or mortgaged all that he possessed, embarked for Venice, relieved his father, and pledged his own freedom to be responsible for the debt. On his return to Constantinople, the parent and king distinguished his two sons with suitable rewards, but the faith and manners of the slothful Paleologus had not been improved by his Roman pilgrimage, and his apostasy or conversion, devoid of any spiritual or temporal effects, was speedily forgotten by the Greeks and Latins. Thirty years after the return of Paleologus, his son and successor, Manuel, from a similar motive, but on a larger scale, again visited the countries of the West. In a preceding chapter I have related his treaty with Bajazet, the violation of that treaty, the siege or blockade of Constantinople, and the French succor under the command of the gallant Bosicol. By his ambassadors, Manuel had solicited the Latin powers, and it was thought that the presence of a distressed monarch would draw tears and supplies from the hardest barbarians, and the marshal who advised the journey prepared the reception of the Byzantine prince. The land was occupied by the Turks, but the navigation of Venice was safe and open. Italy received him as the first, or at least as the second, of the Christian princes. Manuel was pitied as the champion and confessor of the faith, and the dignity of his behavior prevented that pity from sinking into contempt. From Venice he proceeded to Padua and Pavia, and even the Duke of Milan, a secret ally of Bajazet, gave him safe and honorable conduct to the verge of his dominions. On the confines of France, the royal officers undertook the care of his person, journey, and expenses, and two thousand of the richest citizens, in arms and on horseback, came forth to meet him as far as Charenton, in the neighborhood of the capital. At the gates of Paris he was saluted by the Chancellor and the Parliament, and Charles the Sixth, attended by his princes and nobles, welcomed his brother with a cordial embrace. The successor of Constantine was clothed in a robe of white silk, and mounted on a milk-white steed, a circumstance in the French ceremonial of singular importance. The white color is considered as the symbol of sovereignty, and in a late visit the German emperor, after a haughty demand and a peevish refusal, had been reduced to content himself with a black courser. Manuel was lodged in the Louvre. A succession of feasts and balls, the pleasures of the banquet and the chase, were ingeniously varied by the politeness of the French, to display their magnificence, and amuse his grief. He was indulged in the liberty of his chapel, and the doctors of the Sorbonne were astonished, and possibly scandalized, by the language, the rites, and the vestments of his Greek clergy. But the slightest glance on the state of the kingdom must teach him to despair of any effectual assistance. The unfortunate Charles, though he enjoyed some lucid intervals, continually relapsed into furious or stupid insanity. The reins of government were alternately seized by his brother and uncle, the Dukes of Orléans and Burgundy, whose factious competition prepared the miseries of civil war. The former was a gay youth, dissolved in luxury and love. The latter was the father of John, Count of Navarre, who had so lately been ransomed from Turkish captivity. And if the fearless son was ardent to revenge his defeat, the more prudent Burgundy was content with the cost and peril of the first experiment. When Manuel had satiated the curiosity, and perhaps fatigued the patience of the French, he resolved on a visit to the adjacent island. In his progress from Dover, he was entertained at Canterbury with due reverence by the prior and monks of St. Austin, and on Blackheath, King Henry the Fourth, with the English court, saluted the Greek hero, I copy our old historian, who during many days was lodged and treated in London as Emperor of the East. But the state of England was still more adverse to the design of the Holy War. In the same year, the hereditary sovereign had been deposed and murdered. The reigning prince was a successful usurper, whose ambition was punished by jealousy and remorse. Nor could Henry of Lancaster withdraw his person or forces from the defense of a throne incessantly shaken by conspiracy and rebellion. He pitied, he praised, he feasted the emperor of Constantinople, but if the English monarch assumed the cross, it was only to appease his people, and perhaps his conscience, by the merit or semblance of his pious intention. Satisfied, however, with gifts and honors, Manuel returned to Paris, 
and after a residence of two years in the West, shaped his course through Germany and Italy, embarked at Venice, and patiently expected in the Moria the moment of his ruin or deliverance. Yet he had escaped the ignominious necessity of offering his religion to public or private sale. The Latin Church was distracted by the Great Schism. The kings, the nations, the universities of Europe were divided in their obedience between the popes of Rome and Avignon, and the emperor, anxious to conciliate the friendship of both parties, abstained from any correspondence with the indigent or unpopular rivals. His journey coincided with the year of the Jubilee, but he passed through Italy without desiring or deserving the plenary indulgence which abolished the guilt or penance of the sins of the faithful. The Roman Pope was offended by this neglect, accused him of irreverence to an image of Christ, and exhorted the princes of Italy to reject and abandon the obstinate schismatic. During the period of the Crusades, the Greeks beheld with astonishment and terror the perpetual stream of emigration that flowed, and continued to flow, from the unknown climates of their West. The visits of their last emperors removed the veil of separation, and they disclosed to their eyes the powerful nations of Europe, whom they no longer presumed to brand with the name of barbarians. The observation of Manuel and his more inquisitive followers have been preserved by a Byzantine historian of the times. His scattered ideas I shall collect and abridge, and it may be amusing enough, perhaps instructive, to contemplate the rude pictures of Germany, France, and England, whose ancient and modern state are so familiar to our minds. 1. Germany, says the Greek, Calcondiles, is of ample latitude from Vienna to the ocean, and it stretches, a strange geography, from Prague to Bohemia in the river Tartessus and the Pyrenean Mountains. The soil, except in figs and olives, is sufficiently fruitful. The air is salubrious, the bodies of the natives are robust and healthy, and these cold regions are seldom visited with the calamities of pestilence or earthquakes. After the Scythians or Tartars, the Germans are the most numerous of nations. They are brave and patient, and, were they united under a single head, their force would be irresistible. By the gift of the Pope they have acquired the privilege of choosing the Roman Emperor, nor is any people more devoutly attached to the faith and obedience of the Latin Patriarch. The greatest part of the country is divided among the princes and prelates, but Strasbourg, Cologne, Hamburg, and more than two hundred free cities are governed by sage and equal laws, according to the will and for the advantage of the whole community. The use of duels, or single combats on foot, prevails among them in peace and war. Their industry excels in all the mechanic arts, and the Germans may boast of the invention of gunpowder and cannon, which is now diffused over the greatest part of the world. 2. The kingdom of France is spread above fifteen or twenty days' journey from Germany to Spain, and from the Alps to the British Ocean, containing many flourishing cities, and among these Paris, the seat of the king, which surpasses the rest in riches and luxury. Many princes and lords alternately wait in his palace, and acknowledge him as their sovereign, the most powerful are the dukes of Britannia and Burgundy, of whom the latter possesses the wealthy province of Flanders, whose harbors are frequented by the ships and merchants of our own, and the more remote seas. The French are an ancient and opulent people, and their language and manners, though somewhat different, are not dissimilar from those of the Italians. Vain of the imperial dignity of Charlemagne, of their victories over the Saracens, and of the exploits of their heroes, Oliver and Roland, they esteem themselves the first of the Western nations, but this foolish arrogance has been recently humbled by the unfortunate events of their wars against the English, the inhabitants of the British island. 3. Britain, in the ocean and opposite to the shores of Flanders, may be considered either as one or as three islands, but the whole is united by common interest, by the same manners, and by a similar government. The measure of its circumference is five thousand stadia. The land is overspread with towns and villages, though destitute of wine, and not abounding in fruit-trees, it is fertile in wheat and barley, in honey and wool, and much cloth is manufactured by the inhabitants. In populousness and power, in riches and luxury, London, the metropolis of the isle, may claim a preeminence over all the cities of the west. It is situate on the Thames, a broad and rapid river, which at the distance of thirty miles falls into the Gallic Sea, and the daily flow and ebb of the tide affords a safe entrance and departure to the vessels of commerce. The king is head of a powerful and turbulent aristocracy. His principal vassals hold their estates by a free and unalterable tenure, and the laws define the limits of his authority and their obedience. 
the kingdom has been often afflicted by foreign conquest and domestic sedition. But the natives are bold and hardy, renowned in arms and victorious in war. The form of their shields or targets is derived from the Italians, that of their swords from the Greeks, the use of the longbow is the peculiar and decisive advantage of the English. Their language bears no affinity to the idioms of the continent. In the habits of domestic life, they are not easily distinguished from their neighbors of France, but the most singular circumstance of their manners is their disregard of conjugal honor and of female chastity. In their mutual visits, as the first act of hospitality, the guest is welcomed in the embrace of their wives and daughters. Among friends they are lent and borrowed without shame, nor are the islanders offended at this strange commerce and its inevitable consequences. Informed as we are of the customs of old England and assured of the virtue of our mothers, we may smile at the credulity or resent the injustice of the Greek, who must have confounded a modest salute with a criminal embrace. But his credulity and injustice may teach an important lesson, to distrust the accounts of foreign and remote nations, and to suspend our belief of every tale that deviates from the laws of nature and the character of man. After his return and the victory of Timor, Manuel reigned many years in prosperity and peace. As long as the sons of Bajazet solicited his friendship and spared his dominions, he was satisfied with the national religion, and his leisure was employed in composing twenty theological dialogues for its defense. The appearance of the Byzantine ambassadors at the Council of Constance announces the restoration of the Turkish power, as well as of the Latin Church. The conquest of the sultans, Mohammed and Amurath, reconciled the emperor to the Vatican, and the siege of Constantinople almost tempted him to acquiesce in the double procession of the Holy Ghost. When Martin V ascended without a rival the chair of St. Peter, a friendly intercourse of letters and embassies was revived between the East and West. Ambition on one side, and distress on the other, dictated the same decent language of charity and peace. The artful Greek expressed a desire of marrying his six sons to Italian princesses, and the Roman, not less artful, dispatched the daughter of the Marquis of Montferrat, with a company of noble virgins, to soften by their charms the obstinacy of the schismatics. Yet under this mask of zeal, a discerning eye will perceive that all was hollow and insincere in the court and church of Constantinople. According to the vicissitudes of danger and repose, the emperor advanced or retreated, alternately instructed and disavowed his ministers, and escaped from the importunate pressure by urging the duty of inquiry, the obligation of collecting the sense of his patriarchs and bishops, and the impossibility of convening them at a time when the Turkish arms were at the gates of his capital. From a review of the public transactions it will appear that the Greeks insisted on three successive measures, a succor, a council, and a final reunion while the Latins eluded the second, and only promised the first, as a consequential and voluntary reward of the third. But we have an opportunity of unfolding the most secret intentions of Manuel, as he explained them in a private conversation without artifice or disguise. In his declining age, the emperor had associated John Philologus, the second of the name, and the eldest of his sons, on whom he devolved the greatest part of the authority and weight of government. One day, in the presence only of the historian Franza, his favorite chamberlain, he opened to his colleague and successor the true principle of his negotiations with the Pope. Our last resource, said Manuel, against the Turks, is their fear of our union with the Latins, of the warlike nations of the West, who may arm for our relief and for their destruction. As often as you are threatened by the miscreants, present this danger before their eyes. Propose a council, consult on the means, but ever delay and avoid the convocation of an assembly, which cannot tend either to our spiritual or temporal emolument. The Latins are proud, the Greeks are obstinate, neither party will recede or retract, and the attempt of a perfect union will confirm the schism, alienate the churches, and leave us, without hope or defense, at the mercy of the barbarians. Impatient of this salutary lesson, the royal youth arose from his seat and departed in silence, and the wise monarch, continued Franza, casting his eyes on me, thus resumed his discourse. My son deems himself a great and heroic prince, but, alas, our miserable age doth not afford scope for heroism or greatness. His daring spirit might have suited the happier times of our ancestors, but the present state requires not an emperor, but a cautious steward of the last relics of our fortunes. Well do I remember the lofty expectations which he built on our alliance with Mustafa, 
and much do I fear that this rash courage will urge the ruin of our house, and that even religion may precipitate our downfall. Yet the experience and authority of Manuel preserved the peace, and eluded the council, till in the seventy-eighth year of his age, and in the habit of a monk, he terminated his career, dividing his precious movables among his children and the poor, his physicians and his favorite servants. Of his six sons, Andronicus the second was invested with the principality of Thessalonica, and died of a leprosy soon after the sale of that city to the Venetians and its final conquest by the Turks. Some fortunate incidents had restored Peloponnesus, or the Moria, to the empire, and in his more prosperous days Manuel had fortified the narrow isthmus of six miles with a stone wall and one hundred and fifty-three towers. The wall was overthrown by the first blast of the Ottomans. The fertile peninsula might have been sufficient for the four younger brothers, Theodore and Constantine, Demetrius and Thomas, but they wasted in domestic contests the remains of their strength, and the least successful of the rivals were reduced to a life of dependence on the Byzantine palace. The eldest of the sons of Manuel, John Paleologus II, was acknowledged after his father's death as the sole emperor of the Greeks. He immediately proceeded to repudiate his wife, and to contract a new marriage with the princess of Trebizond. Beauty was in his eyes the first qualification of an empress, and the clerk had yielded to his firm assurance, that unless he might be indulged in a divorce, he would retire to a cloister, and leave the throne to his brother Constantine. The first, and in truth the only, victory of Paleologus was over a Jew, whom after a long and learned dispute he converted to the Christian faith, and this momentous conquest is carefully recorded in the history of the times. But he soon resumed the design of uniting the East and West, and, regardless of his father's advice, listened, as it should seem with sincerity, to the proposal of meeting the Pope in a general council beyond the Adriatic. This dangerous project was encouraged by Martin V, and coldly entertained by his successor Eugenius, till after a tedious negotiation, the Emperor received a summons from the Latin assembly of a new character, the independent prelates of Basel, who styled themselves the representatives and judges of the Catholic Church. The Roman pontiff had fought and conquered in the cause of ecclesiastical freedom, but the victorious clergy were soon exposed to the tyranny of their deliverer, and his sacred character was invulnerable to those arms which they found so keen and effectual against the civil magistrate. Their great charter, the right of election, was annihilated by appeals, evaded by trusts or commendums, disappointed by reversionary grants, and superseded by previous and arbitrary reservations. A public auction was instituted in the court of Rome, the cardinals and favorites were enriched with the spoils of nations, and every country might complain that the most important and valuable benefices were accumulated on the heads of aliens and absentees. During their residence at Avignon, the ambitions of the Pope subsided in the meaner passions of avarice and luxury. They rigorously imposed on the clergy the tributes of first fruits and tents, but they freely tolerated the impunity of vice, disorder, and corruption. These manifold scandals were aggravated by the great schism of the West, which continued above fifty years. In the furious conflicts of Rome and Avignon, the vices of the rivals were mutually exposed, and their precarious situations degraded their authority, relaxed their discipline, and multiplied their wants and exactions. To heal the wounds, and to restore the monarchy, of the Church, the synods of Pisa and Constance were successively convened, but these great assemblies, conscious of their strength, resolved to vindicate the privileges of the Christian aristocracy. From a personal sentence against two pontiffs whom they rejected, and a third, their acknowledged sovereign whom they deposed, the fathers of Constance proceeded to examine the nature and limits of the Roman supremacy, nor did they separate till they had established the authority, above the Pope, of a general council. It was enacted that for the government and reformation of the Church, such assemblies should be held at regular intervals, and that each synod, before its dissolution, should appoint the time and place of the next subsequent meeting. By the influence of the court at Rome, the next convocation at Siena was easily eluded, but the bold and vigorous proceedings of the Council of Basel had almost been fatal to the reigning pontiff, Eugenius IV. A just suspicion of his design prompted the fathers to hasten the promulgation of their first decree, that the representatives of the church militant on earth were invested with a divine and spiritual jurisdiction over all Christians, without accepting the Pope, and that a general council could not be dissolved, prorogued, or transferred, 
unless by their free deliberation and consent. On the notice that Eugenius had fulminated a bull for that purpose, they ventured to summon, to admonish, to threaten, to censure the contumacious successor of St. Peter. After many delays, to allow time for repentance, they finally declared that unless he submitted within the term of sixty days, he was suspended from the exercise of all temporal and ecclesiastical authority. And to mark their jurisdiction over the prince as well as the priest, they assumed the government of Avignon, annulled the alienation of the sacred patrimony, and protected Rome from the imposition of new taxes. Their boldness was justified, not only by the general opinion of the clergy, but by the support and power of the first monarchs of Christendom. The emperor Sigismund declared himself the servant and protector of the synod. Germany and France adhered to their cause. The Duke of Milan was the enemy of Eugenius, and he was driven from the Vatican by an insurrection of the Roman people. Rejected at the same time by temporal and spiritual subjects, submission was his only choice. By a most humiliating bull, the Pope repealed his own acts, and ratified those of the council, incorporated his legates and cardinals with that venerable body, and seemed to resign himself to the decrees of the supreme legislature. Their fame pervaded the countries of the East, and it was in their presence that Sigismond received the ambassadors of the Turkish Sultan, who laid at his feet twelve large vases, filled with robes of silk and pieces of gold. The fathers of Basil aspired to the glory of reducing the Greeks, as well as the Bohemians, within the pale of the church, and their deputies invited the emperor and patriarch of Constantinople to unite with an assembly which possessed the confidence of the western nations. Paleologus was not adverse to the proposal, and his ambassadors were introduced with due honors into the Catholic Senate. But the choice of the place appeared to be an insuperable obstacle, since he refused to pass the Alps or the Sea of Sicily, and positively required that the synod should be adjourned to some convenient city in Italy, or at least on the Danube. The other articles of this treaty were most readily stipulated. It was agreed to defray the traveling expenses of the emperor, with a train of seven hundred persons, to remit an immediate sum of eight thousand ducats for the accommodation of the Greek clergy, and in his absence to grant a supply of ten thousand ducats, with three hundred archers and some galleys, for the protection of Constantinople. The city of Avignon advanced the funds for the preliminary expenses, and the embarkation was prepared at Marseilles with some difficulty and delay. In his distress, the friendship of Paleologus was disputed by the ecclesiastical powers of the West, but the dexterous activity of a monarch prevailed over the slow debates and inflexible temper of a republic. The decrees of Basil continually tended to circumscribe the despotism of the Pope, and to erect a supreme and perpetual tribunal in the Church. Eugenius was impatient of the yoke, and the union of the Greeks might afford a decent pretense for translating a rebellious synod from the Rhine to the Po. The independence of the fathers was lost if they passed the Alps. Savoy or Avignon, to which they acceded with reluctance, were described at Constantinople as situate far beyond the pillars of Hercules. The emperor and his clergy were apprehensive of the dangers of a long navigation. They were offended by a haughty declaration that after suppressing the new heresy of the Bohemians, the council would soon eradicate the old heresy of the Greeks. On the side of Eugenius all was smooth, yielding, and respectful and he invited the Byzantine monarch to heal by his presence the schism of the Latin as well as of the Eastern Church. Ferrara, near the coast of the Adriatic, was proposed for their amicable interview, and with some indulgence of forgery and theft, a surreptitious decree was procured, which transferred the synod, with its own consent, to the Italian city. Nine galleys were equipped for the service at Venice, and in the Isle of Candia. Their diligence anticipated the slower vessels of Basil, the Roman admiral was commissioned to burn, sink, and destroy, and these priestly squadrons might have encountered each other in the same seas where Athens and Sparta had formerly contended for the preeminence of glory. Assaulted by the importunity of the factions, who were ready to fight for the possession of his person, Paleologus hesitated before he left his palace and country on a perilous experiment. His father's advice still dwelt on his memory, and reason must suggest that since the Latins were divided amongst themselves, they could never unite in a foreign cause. Sigismund dissuaded the unreasonable adventure. His advice was impartial, since he adhered to the council, and it was enforced by the strange belief that the German Caesar would nominate a Greek his heir and successor in the empire of the West. Even the Turkish sultan was a counselor whom it might be unsafe to trust, 
but whom it was dangerous to offend. Amurath was unskilled in the disputes, but he was apprehensive of the union of the Christians. From his own treasures he offered to relieve the wants of the Byzantine court, yet he declared with seeming magnanimity that Constantinople should be secure and inviolate, in the absence of her sovereign. The resolution of Paleologus was decided by the most splendid gifts and the most specious promises. He wished to escape for a while from a scene of danger and distress, and after dismissing with an ambiguous answer the messengers of the council, he declared his intention of embarking in the Roman galleys. The age of the patriarch Joseph was more susceptible of fear than of hope. He trembled at the perils of the sea, and expressed his apprehension that his feeble voice, with thirty perhaps of his orthodox brethren, would be oppressed in a foreign land by the power and numbers of a Latin synod. He yielded to the royal mandate, to the flattering assurance, that he would be heard as the oracle of nations, and to the secret wish of learning from his brother of the West to deliver the church from the yoke of kings. The five cross-bearers, or dignitaries, of St. Sophia were bound to attend his person, and one of these, the great ecclesiarch or preacher Sylvester Syropolis, has composed a free and curious history of the false union. Of the clergy that reluctantly obeyed the summons of the emperor and the patriarch, submission was the first duty and patience the most useful virtue. In a chosen list of twenty bishops, we discover the metropolitan titles of Heracle and Cyzicus, Nice and Nicomedia, Ephesus and Trebizond, and the personal merit of Mark and Bessarion, who, in the confidence of their learning and eloquence, were promoted to the episcopal rank. Some monks and philosophers were named to display the science and sanctity of the Greek church, and the service of the choir was performed by a select band of singers and musicians. The patriarchs of Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem appeared by their genuine or fictitious deputies. The primate of Russia represented a national church, and the Greeks might contend with the Latins in the extent of their spiritual empire. The precious phases of St. Sophia were exposed to the winds and waves, that the patriarch might officiate with becoming splendor. Whatever gold the emperor could procure was expended in the massy ornaments of his bed and chariot, and while they affected to maintain the prosperity of their ancient fortune, they quarreled for the division of fifteen thousand ducats, the first alms of the Roman pontiff. After the necessary preparations, John Paleologus, with a numerous train, accompanied by his brother Demetrius, and the most respectable persons of the church and state, embarked in eight vessels with sails and oars that steered through the Turkish Straits of Gallipoli to the archipelago, the Moria, and the Adriatic Gulf. After a tedious and troublesome navigation of seventy-seven days, this religious squadron cast anchor before Venice, and their reception proclaimed the joy and magnificence of that powerful republic. In the command of the world, the modest Augustus had never claimed such honors from his subjects as were paid to his feeble successor by an independent state. Seated on the poop on a lofty throne, he received the visit, or in the Greek style, the adoration of the doge and senators. They sailed in the Bukentar, which was accompanied by twelve stately galleys. The sea was overspread with innumerable gondolas of pomp and pleasure. The air resounded with music and acclamations. The mariners, and even the vessels, were dressed in silk and gold, and in all the emblems and pageants, the Roman eagles were blended with the lions of St. Mark. The triumphal procession, ascending the great canal, passed under the bridge of the Rialto, and the eastern strangers gazed with admiration on the palaces, the churches, and the populousness of a city that seems to float on the bosom of the waves. They sighed to behold the spoils and trophies with which it had been decorated after the sack of Constantinople. After a hospitable entertainment of fifteen days, Paleologus pursued his journey by land and water from Venice to Ferrara, and on this occasion the pride of the Vatican was tempered by policy to indulge the ancient dignity of the emperor of the East. He made his entry on a black horse, but a milk-white steed, whose trappings were embroidered with golden eagles, was led before him, and the canopy was borne over his head by the princes of Esta, the sons or kinsmen of Nicholas, the marquis of the city, and a sovereign more powerful than himself. Paleologus did not alight until he reached the bottom of the staircase. The Pope advanced to the door of the apartment, refused his proffer genuflection, and after a paternal embrace, conducted the emperor to a seat on his left hand. Nor would the patriarch descend from his galley till a ceremony almost equal had been stipulated between the bishops of Rome and Constantinople. The latter was saluted by his brother with a kiss of union and charity, 
nor would any of the Greek ecclesiastics submit to kiss the feet of the Western primate. On the opening of the synod, the place of honor in the center was claimed by the temporal and ecclesiastical chiefs, and it was only by alleging that his predecessors had not assisted in person at Nice or Chalcedon that Eugenius could evade the ancient precedents of Constantine and Marcion. After much debate, it was agreed that the right and left sides of the church should be occupied by the two nations, that the solitary chair of St. Peter should be raised the first of the Latin line, and that the throne of the Greek emperor, at the head of his clergy, should be equal and opposite to the second place, the vacant seat of the emperor of the West. But as soon as festivity and form had given place to a more serious treaty, the Greeks were dissatisfied with their journey, with themselves, and with the Pope. The artful pencil of his emissaries had painted him in a prosperous state, at the head of the princes and prelates of Europe, obedient at his voice, to believe and to arm. The thin appearance of the universal synod of Ferrara betrayed his weakness, and the Latins opened the first session with only five archbishops, eighteen bishops, and ten abbots, the greatest part of whom were the subjects or countrymen of the Italian pontiff. Except the Duke of Burgundy, none of the potentates of the West condescended to appear in person, or by their ambassadors, nor was it possible to suppress the judicial acts of Basil against the dignity and person of Eugenius, which were finally concluded by a new election. Under these circumstances, a truce or delay was asked and granted, till paleologists could expect from the consent of the Latins some temporal reward for an unpopular union and after the first session the public proceedings were adjourned above six months. The emperor, with the chosen band of his favorites and janissaries, fixed his summer residence at a pleasant, spacious monastery, six miles from Ferrara, forgot in the pleasures of the chase the distress of the church and state, and persisted in destroying the game without listening to the just complaints of the marquise or the husbandman. In the meanwhile, his unfortunate Greeks were exposed to all the miseries of exile and poverty, for the support of each stranger, a monthly allowance was assigned of three or four gold florins, and although the entire sum did not amount to seven hundred florins, a long arrear was repeatedly incurred by the indulgence or policy of the Roman court. They sighed for a speedy deliverance, but their escape was prevented by a triple chain. A passport from their superiors was required at the gates of Ferrara. The government of Venice had engaged to arrest and send back the fugitives, and inevitable punishment awaited them at Constantinople excommunication, fines, and a sentence, which did not respect the sacerdotal dignity, that they should be stripped naked and publicly whipped. It was only by the alternative of hunger or dispute that the Greeks could be persuaded to open the first conference, and they yielded with extreme reluctance to attend from Ferrara to Florence the rear of a flying synod. This new translation was urged by inevitable necessity. The city was visited by the plague, the fidelity of the Marquis might be suspected, the mercenary troops of the Duke of Milan were at the gates, and as they occupied Romagna, it was not without difficulty and danger that the Pope, the Emperor, and the bishops explored their way through the unfrequented pass of the Apennine. Yet all these obstacles were surmounted by time and policy. The violence of the fathers of Basil rather promoted than injured the case of Eugenius. The nations of Europe abhorred the schism and disowned the election of Felix V, who was successively a Duke of Savoy, a hermit, and a Pope, and the great princes were gradually reclaimed by his competitor to a favorable neutrality and a firm attachment. The legates, with some respectable numbers, deserted to the Roman army, which insensibly rose in numbers and reputation. The council of Basil was reduced to thirty-nine bishops and three hundred of the inferior clergy, while the Latins of Florence could produce the subscription of the Pope himself, eight cardinals, two patriarchs, eight archbishops, fifty-two bishops, and forty-five abbots, or chiefs of religious orders. After the labor of nine months, and debates of twenty-five sessions, they attained the advantage and glory of the reunion of the Greeks. Four principal questions had been agitated between the two churches. One, the use of unleavened bread in the communion of Christ's body. Two, the nature of purgatory. Three, the supremacy of the Pope. And four, the single or double procession of the Holy Ghost. The cause of either nation was managed by ten theological champions. The Latins were supported by the inexhaustible eloquence of Cardinal Julian, and Mark of Ephesus and Bessarion of Nice were the bold and able leaders of the Greek forces. We may bestow some praise on the progress of human reason 
by observing that the first of these questions was now treated as an immaterial right, which might innocently vary with the fashion of the age and country. With regard to the second, both parties were agreed in the belief of an intermediate state of purgation for the venial sins of the faithful, and whether their souls were purified by elemental fire was a doubtful point, which in a few years might be conveniently settled on the spot by the disputants. The claims of supremacy appeared of a more weighty and substantial kind, yet by the Orientals the Roman bishop had ever been respected as the first of the five patriarchs, nor did they scruple to admit that his jurisdiction should be exercised agreeably to the holy canons, a vague allowance which might be defined or eluded by occasional convenience. The procession of the Holy Ghost from the Father alone, or from the Father and the Son, was an article of faith which had sunk much deeper into the minds of men, and in the sessions of Ferrara and Florence, the Latin edition of Filioque was subdivided into two questions, whether it were legal and whether it were orthodox. Perhaps it may not be necessary to boast on this subject of my own impartial indifference, but I must think that the Greeks were strongly supported by the prohibition of the Council of Chalcedon, against adding any article whatsoever to the creed of Nice, or rather of Constantinople. In earthly affairs, it is not easy to conceive how an assembly equal of legislators can bind their successors invested with powers equal to their own. But the dictates of inspiration must be true and unchangeable, or a provincial synod have presumed to innovate against the judgment of the Catholic Church. On the substance of the doctrine, the controversy was equal and endless, Reason is confounded by the procession of a deity. The gospel, which lay on the altar, was silent. The various texts of the fathers might be corrupted by fraud or entangled by sophistry, and the Greeks were ignorant of the characters and writings of the Latin saints. Of this at least we may be sure, that neither side could be convinced by the arguments of their opponents. Prejudice may be enlightened by reason, and a superficial glance may be rectified by a clear and more perfect view of an object adapted to our faculties." but the bishops and monks had been taught from their infancy to repeat a form of mysterious words. Their national and personal honor depended on the repetition of the same sounds, and their narrow minds were hardened and inflamed by the acrimony of a public dispute. While they were most in a cloud of dust and darkness, the Pope and Emperor were desirous of a seeming union, which could alone accomplish the purposes of their interview, and the obstinacy of public dispute was softened by the arts of private and personal negotiation. The patriarch Joseph had sunk under the weight of age and infirmities. His dying voice breathed the counsels of charity and concord, and his vacant benefice might tempt the hopes of the ambitious clergy. The ready and active obedience of the archbishops of Russia and Nice, of Isidore and Bessarion, was prompted and recompensed by their speedy promotion to the dignity of cardinals. Bessarion, in the first debates, had stood forth the most strenuous and eloquent champion of the Greek Church, and if the apostate, the bastard, was reparated by his country, he appears in ecclesiastical story a rare example of a patriot who was recommended to court favor by loud opposition and well-timed compliance. With the aid of his two spiritual coadjutors, the emperor applied his arguments to the general situation and personal characters of the bishops, and each was successively moved by authority and example. Their revenues were in the hands of the Turks, their persons in those of the Latins, an episcopal treasure, three robes and forty ducats, was soon exhausted. The hopes of their return still depended on the ships of Venice and the alms of Rome, and such was their indulgence, that their arrears, the payment of a debt, would be accepted as a favor, and might operate as a bribe. The danger and relief of Constantinople might excuse some prudent and pious dissimulation, and it was insinuated that the obstinate heretics who should resist the consent of the East and West would be abandoned in a hostile land to the revenge or justice of the Roman pontiff. In the first private assembly of the Greeks, the formulary of union was approved by twenty-four and rejected by twelve members, but the five cross-bearers of St. Sophia, who aspired to represent the patriarch, were disqualified by ancient discipline, and their right of voting was transferred to the obsequious train of monks, grammarians, and profane laymen. The will of the monarch produced a false and servile unanimity, and no more than two patriots had courage to speak their own sentiments and those of their country. Demetrius, the emperor's brother, retired to Venice, that he might not be witness of the union, and Mark of Ephesus, mistaking perhaps his pride for his conscience, disclaimed all communion with the Latin heretics, and avowed himself the champion and confessor of the Orthodox creed. In the treaty between the two nations, several forms of consent were proposed, 
such as might satisfy the Latins without dishonoring the Greeks, and they weighed the scruples of words and syllables, till the theological balance trembled with a slight preponderance in favor of the Vatican. It was agreed, I must entreat the attention of the reader, that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son, as from one principle and one substance, that he proceeds by the Son, being of the same nature and substance, and that he proceeds from the Father and the Son, by one spiration and production. It is less difficult to understand the articles of the preliminary treaty, that the Pope should defray all the expenses of the Greeks in their return home, that he should annually maintain two galleys and three hundred soldiers for the defense of Constantinople, that all the ships which transported pilgrims to Jerusalem should be obliged to touch at that port, that as often as they were required, the Pope should furnish ten galleys for a year, or twenty for six months, and that he should powerfully solicit the princes of Europe, if the emperor had occasion for land forces. The same year, and almost the same day, were marked by the deposition of Eugenius at Basel, and at Florence by his reunion of the Greeks and Latins. In the former synod, which he styled an assembly of demons, the Pope was branded with the guilt of simony, perjury, tyranny, heresy, and schism, and declared to be incorrigible in his vices, unworthy of any title, and incapable of holding any ecclesiastical office. In the latter he was revered as the true and holy vicar of Christ, who, after a separation of six hundred years, had reconciled the Catholics of the East and West in one fold, and under one shepherd. The act of union was subscribed by the Pope, the Emperor, and the principal members of both churches, even by those who, like Seropulus, had been deprived of the right of voting. Two copies might have sufficed for the East and West, but Eugenius was not satisfied, unless four authentic and similar transcripts were signed and attested as the monuments of his victory. On a memorable day, the 6th of July, the successors of St. Peter and Constantine ascended their thrones, the two nations assembled in the Cathedral of Florence. Their representatives, Cardinal Julian and Vissarion, Archbishop of Nice, appeared in the pulpit, and after reading in their respective tongues the act of union, they mutually embraced, in the name and the presence of their applauding brethren. The Pope and his ministers then officiated according to the Roman liturgy. The creed was chanted with the addition of Filioque. The acquiescence of the Greeks was poorly excused by their ignorance of the harmonious, but inarticulate sounds, and the more scrupulous Latins refused any public celebration of the Byzantine rite. Yet the emperor and his clergy were not totally unmindful of national honor. The treaty was ratified by their consent. It was tacitly agreed that no innovation should be attempted in their creed or ceremonies. They spared and secretly respected the generous firmness of Mark of Ephesus, and on the decease of the patriarch they refused to elect his successor, except in the cathedral of St. Sophia. In the distribution of public and private rewards, the liberal pontiff exceeded their hopes and his promises. The Greeks, with less pomp and pride, returned by the same road of Ferrara and Venice, and their reception at Constantinople was such as will be described in the following chapter. The success of the first trial encouraged Eugenius to repeat the same edifying scenes, and the deputies of the Armenians, the Maronites, the Jacobites of Syria and Egypt, the Nestorians and the Ethiopians were successively introduced, to kiss the feet of the Roman pontiff, and to announce the obedience and the orthodoxy of the East. These oriental embassies, unknown in the country which they presumed to represent, diffused over the West the fame of Eugenius, and a clamor was artfully propagated against the remnant of a schism in Switzerland and Savoy, which alone impeded the harmony of the Christian world. The vigor of opposition was succeeded by the lassitude of despair, the Council of Basel was silently dissolved, and Felix, renouncing the tiara, again withdrew to the devout or delicious hermitage of Rapai. A general peace was secured by mutual acts of oblivion and indemnity. All ideas of reformation subsided. The popes continued to exercise and abuse their ecclesiastical despotism, nor has Rome since been disturbed by the mischiefs of a contested election. The journeys of three emperors were unavailing for their temporal, or perhaps their spiritual, salvation, but they were productive of a beneficial consequence. The revival of the Greek learning in Italy, from whence it was propagated to the last nations of the West and North. In their lowest servitude and depression, the subjects of the Byzantine throne were still possessed of a golden key that could unlock the treasures of antiquity, of a musical and prolific language that gives a soul to the objects of sense, and a body to the abstractions of philosophy. Since the barriers of the monarchy, 
and even of the capital, had been trampled under foot, the various barbarians had doubtless corrupted the form and substance of the national dialect, and ample glossaries have been composed to interpret a multitude of words of Arabic, Turkish, Sclavonian, Latin, or French origin. But a purer idiom was spoken in the court and taught in the college, and the flourishing state of the language is described, and perhaps embellished, by a learned Italian, who, by a long residence and noble marriage, was naturalized at Constantinople about thirty years before the Turkish conquest. The vulgar speech, says Philelphus, has been depraved by the people, and infected by the multitude of strangers and merchants, who every day flock to the city and mingle with the inhabitants. It is from the disciples of such a school that the Latin language received the version of Aristotle and Plato, so obscure in sense and in spirit so poor. But the Greeks who have escaped the contagion are those whom we follow, and they alone are worthy of our imitation. In familiar discourse, they still speak the tongue of Aristophanes and Euripides, of the historians and philosophers of Athens, and the style of their writings is still more elaborate and correct. The persons who, by their birth and offices, are attached to the Byzantine court, are those who maintain, with the least alloy, the ancient standard of elegance and purity, and the native graces of language most conspicuously shine among the noble matrons, who are excluded from all intercourse with foreigners. With foreigners, do I say? They live retired and sequestered from the eyes of their fellow citizens. Seldom are they seen in the streets, and when they leave their houses, it is in the dusk of evening, on visits to the churches and their nearest kindred. On these occasions they are on horseback, covered with a veil, and encompassed by their parents, their husbands, or their servants. Among the Greeks, a numerous and opulent clergy was dedicated to the service of religion. Their monks and bishops have ever been distinguished by their gravity and austerity of their manners, nor were they diverted, like the Latin priests, by the pursuits and pleasures of a secular and even military life. After a large deduction for the time and talent that were lost in devotion, the laziness and the discord of the church and cloister, the more inquisitive and ambitious minds would explore the sacred and profane erudition of their native language. The ecclesiastics presided over the education of youth, the schools of philosophy and eloquence were perpetuated till the fall of the empire, and it may be affirmed that more books and more knowledge were included within the walls of Constantinople than could be dispersed over the extensive countries of the West. But an important distinction has been already noticed. The Greeks were stationary or retrograde, while the Latins were advancing with a rapid and progressive motion. The nations were excited by the spirit of independence and emulation, and even the little world of the Italian states contained more people and industry than the decreasing circle of the Byzantine Empire. In Europe, the lower ranks of society were relieved from the yoke of feudal servitude, and freedom is the first step to curiosity and knowledge. The use, however rude and corrupt, of the Latin tongue had been preserved by superstition. The universities, from Bologna to Oxford, were peopled with thousands of scholars, and their misguided ardor might be directed to more liberal and manly studies. In the resurrection of science, Italy was the first that cast away her shroud, and the eloquent Petrarch, by his lessons and his example, may justly be applauded as the first harbinger of day. A purer style of composition, a more generous and rational strain of sentiment, flowed from the study and imitation of the writers of ancient Rome, and the disciples of Cicero and Virgil approached, with reverence and love, the sanctuary of their Grecian masters. In the sack of Constantinople, the French and even the Venetians had despised and destroyed the works of Lysippus and Homer. The monuments of art may be annihilated by a single blow, but the immortal mind is renewed and multiplied by the copies of the pen, and such copies it was the ambition of Petrarch and his friends to possess and understand. The arms of the Turks undoubtedly pressed the flight of the Muses, yet we may tremble at the thought that Greece might have been overwhelmed with her schools and libraries before Europe had emerged from the deluge of barbarism, that the seeds of science might have been scattered by the winds before the Italian soil was prepared for their cultivation. The most learned Italians of the fifteenth century have confessed and applauded the restoration of Greek literature, after a long oblivion of many hundred years. Yet in that country, and beyond the Alps, some names are quoted, some profound scholars, who in the darker ages were honorably distinguished by their knowledge of the Greek tongue, and national vanity has been loud in the praise of such rare examples of erudition. Without scrutinizing the merit of individuals, truth must observe that their science is without a cause, and without an effect, 
that it was easy for them to satisfy themselves and their more ignorant contemporaries, and that the idiom which they had so marvelously acquired was transcribed in a few manuscripts, and was not taught in any university of the West. In a corner of Italy it faintly existed as the popular, or at least as the ecclesiastical dialect. The first impression of the Doric and Ionic colonies has never been completely erased. The Calabrian churches were long attached to the throne of Constantinople, and the monks of St. Basil pursued their studies in Mount Athos and the schools of the East. Calabria was the native country of Barlam, who has already appeared as a sectary and an ambassador, and Barlam was the first who revived, beyond the Alps, the memory, or at least the writings, of Homer. He is described by Petrarch and Boccace as a man of diminutive stature, though truly great in the measure of learning and genius, of a piercing discernment, though of a slow and painful elocution. For many ages, as they affirm, Greece had not produced his equal in the knowledge of history, grammar, and philosophy, and his merit was celebrated in the attestations of the princes and doctors of Constantinople. One of these attestations is still extant, and the emperor Cantacuzene, the protector of his adversaries, is forced to allow that Euclid, Aristotle, and Plato were familiar to that profound and subtle logician. In the court of Avignon, he formed an intimate connection with Petrarch, the first of the Latin scholars, and the desire of mutual instruction was the principle of their literary commerce. The Tuscan applied himself with eager curiosity and assiduous diligence to the study of the Greek language, and in a laborious struggle with the dryness and difficulty of the first rudiments, he began to reach the sense and to feel the spirit of poets and philosophers, whose minds were congenial to his own. But he was soon deprived of the society and lessons of this useful assistant. Barlam relinquished his fruitless embassy, and on his return to Greece, he rashly provoked the swarms of fanatic monks, by attempting to substitute the light of reason to that of their navel. After a separation of three years, the two friends again met at the court of Naples, but the generous pupil renounced the fairest occasion of improvement, and by his recommendation Barlam was finally settled in a small bishopric of his native Calabria. The manifold avocations of Petrarch, love and friendship, his various correspondence and frequent journeys, the Roman laurel, and his elaborate compositions in prose and verse, in Latin and Italian, diverted him from a foreign idiom, and as he advanced in life, the attainment of the Greek language was the object of his wishes rather than of his hopes. When he was about fifty years of age, a Byzantine ambassador, his friend, and a master of both tongues, presented him with a copy of Homer, and the answer of Petrarch is at once expressive of his eloquence, gratitude, and regret. After celebrating the generosity of the donor, the value of a gift more precious in his estimation than gold or rubies, he thus proceeds, Your present of the genuine and original text of the divine poet, the fountain of all inventions, is worthy of yourself and of me. You have fulfilled your promise and satisfied my desires. Yet your liberality is still imperfect. With Homer you should have given me yourself, a guide, who could lead me into the fields of light, and disclose to my wondering eyes the spacious miracles of the Iliad and the Odyssey. But alas, Homer is dumb, or I am deaf, nor is it in my power to enjoy the beauty which I possess. I have seated him by the side of Plato, the prince of poets, near the prince of philosophers, and I glory in the sight of my illustrious guests. Of their immortal writings, whatever had been translated into the Latin idiom, I had already acquired. But if there be no profit, there is some pleasure, in beholding these venerable Greeks in their proper and national habit. I am delighted with the aspect of Homer, and as often as I embrace the silent volume, I exclaim with a sigh, Illustrious bard, with what pleasure should I listen to thy song, if my sense of hearing were not obstructed and lost by the dearth of one friend, and in the much-lamented absence of another? Nor do I yet despair, and the example of Cato suggests some comfort and hope, since it was in the last period of age that he attained the knowledge of the Greek letters. The prize which eluded the efforts of Petrarch was obtained by the fortune and industry of his friend Boccace, the father of the Tuscan prose. That popular writer, who derives his reputation from the Decameron, a hundred novels of pleasantry and love, may aspire to the more serious praise of restoring in Italy the study of the Greek language. In the year 1360, a disciple of Barlam, whose name was Leo, 
or Leontius Pilatus, was detained on his way to Avignon by the advice and hospitality of Boccace, who lodged the stranger in his house, prevailed on the Republic of Florence to allow him an annual stipend, and devoted his leisure to the first Greek professor who taught that language in the western countries of Europe. The appearance of Leo might disgust the most eager disciple. He was clothed in the mantle of a philosopher or a mendicant. His countenance was hideous. His face was overshadowed with black hair. His beard long and uncombed. His deportment rustic. His temper gloomy and inconstant. Nor could he grace his discourse with the ornaments or even the perspicuity of Latin elocution. But his mind was stored with a treasure of Greek learning, history and fable, philosophy and grammar, were alike at his command, and he read the poems of Homer in the schools of Florence. It was from his explanation that Boccace composed and transcribed a literal prose version of the Iliad and Odyssey, which satisfied the thirst of his friend Petrarch, and which, perhaps, in the succeeding century, was clandestinely used by Laurentius Valla, the Latin interpreter. It was from his narratives that the same Boccace collected the materials for his treatise on the genealogy of the heathen gods, a work, in that age, of stupendous erudition, and which he ostentatiously sprinkled with Greek characters and passages, to excite the wonder and applause of his more ignorant readers. The first steps of learning are slow and laborious. No more than ten votaries of Homer could be enumerated in all Italy, and neither Rome, nor Venice, nor Naples could add a single name to this studious catalogue. But their numbers would have multiplied, their progress would have been accelerated, if the inconstant Leo, at the end of three years, had not relinquished an honorable and beneficial station. In his passage, Petrarch entertained him at Padua a short time. He enjoyed the scholar, but was justly offended with the gloomy and unsocial temper of the man. Discontented with the world and with himself, Leo depreciated his present enjoyments, while absent persons and objects were dear to his imagination. In Italy he was a Thessalian, in Greece a native of Calabria, in the company of the Latins he disdained their language, religion, and manners. No sooner was he landed at Constantinople than he again sighed for the wealth of Venice and the elegance of Florence. His Italian friends were deaf to his importunity. He depended on their curiosity and indulgence, and embarked on a second voyage. But on his entrance into the Adriatic, the ship was assailed by a tempest, and the unfortunate teacher, who, like Ulysses, had fastened himself to the mast, was struck dead by a flash of lightning. The humane Petrarch dropped a tear on his disaster, but he was most anxious to learn whether some copy of Euripides or Sophocles might not be saved from the hands of the mariners. But the faint rudiments of Greek learning, which Petrarch had encouraged and Boccace had planted, soon withered and expired. The succeeding generation was content for a while with the improvement of Latin eloquence. Nor was it before the end of the fourteenth century that a new and perpetual flame was rekindled in Italy. Previous to his own journey, the Emperor Manuel dispatched his envoys and orators to implore the compassion of the Western princes. Of these envoys, the most conspicuous, or the most learned, was Manuel Chrysoloris, of noble birth, whose Roman ancestors are supposed to have migrated with the great Constantine. After visiting the courts of France and England, where he obtained some contributions and more promises, the envoy was invited to assume the office of a professor, and Florence had again the honor of this second invitation. By his knowledge, not only of the Greek, but of the Latin tongue, Chrysoloris deserved the stipend, and surpassed the expectation of the Republic. His school was frequented by a crowd of disciples of every rank and age, and one of these, in a general history, has described his motives and his success. At that time, says Leonard Ariton, I was a student of the civil law, but my soul was inflamed with the love of letters, and I bestowed some application on the sciences of logic and rhetoric. On the arrival of Manuel, I hesitated whether I should desert my legal studies or relinquish this golden opportunity, and thus, in the ardor of youth, I communed with my own mind. Wilt thou be wanting to thyself and thy fortune? Wilt thou refuse to be introduced to a familiar converse with Homer, Plato, and Demosthenes, with those poets, philosophers, and orators, of whom such wonders are related, and who are celebrated by every age as the great masters of human science? Of professors and scholars in civil law, a sufficient supply will always be found in our universities, 
but a teacher, and such a teacher, of the Greek language, if he once be suffered to escape, may never afterwards be retrieved. Convinced by these reasons, I gave myself to Chrysoloras, and so strong was my passion that the lessons which I had imbibed in the day were the constant object of my nightly dreams. At the same time and place, the Latin classics were explained by John of Ravenna, the domestic pupil of Petrarch. The Italians, who illustrated their age and country, were formed in this double school, and Florence became the fruitful seminary of Greek and Roman erudition. The presence of the emperor recalled Chrysoloras from the college to the court, but he afterwards taught at Pavia and Rome with equal industry and applause. The remainder of his life, about fifteen years, was divided between Italy and Constantinople, between embassies and lessons. In the noble office of enlightening a foreign nation, the grammarian was not unmindful of a more sacred duty to his prince and country, and Emmanuel Chrysoloras died at Constance on a public mission from the emperor to the council. After his example, the restoration of the Greek letters in Italy was prosecuted by a series of immigrants, who were destitute of fortune and endowed with learning, or at least with language. From the terror or oppression of the Turkish arms, the natives of Thessalonica and Constantinople escaped to a land of freedom, curiosity, and wealth. The Synod introduced into Florence the lights of the Greek Church, and the oracles of the Platonic philosophy, and the fugitives who adhered to the Union had the double merit of renouncing their country, not only for the Christian but for the Catholic cause. A patriot who sacrifices his party and conscience to the allurements of favor may be possessed, however, of the private and social virtues. He no longer hears the reproachful epithets of slave and apostate, and the consideration which he acquires among his new associates will restore in his own eyes the dignity of his character. The prudent conformity of Bessarion was rewarded with the Roman purple. He fixed his residence in Italy, and the Greek cardinal, the titular patriarch of Constantinople, was respected as the chief and protector of his nation. His abilities were exercised in the legations of Bologna, Venice, Germany, and France, and his election to the chair of St. Peter floated for a moment on the uncertain breath of a conclave. His ecclesiastical honors diffused a splendor and preeminence over his literary merit and service. His palace was a school. As often as the cardinal visited the Vatican, he was attended by a learned train of both nations, of men applauded by themselves and the public, and whose writings, now overspread with dust, were popular and useful in their own times. I shall not attempt to enumerate the restorers of Grecian literature in the fifteenth century, and it may be sufficient to mention with gratitude the names of Theodore Gaza, of George of Trebizond, of John Agropolis, and Demetrius Chalcocondyles, who taught their native language in the schools of Florence and Rome. Their labors were not inferior to those of Bessarion, whose purple they revered, and whose fortune was the secret object of their envy. But the lives of these grammarians were humble and obscure. They had declined the lucrative paths of the church, their dress and manners secluded them from the commerce of the world, and since they were confined to the merit, they might be content with the rewards of learning. From this character, Janus Lascaris will deserve an exception. His eloquence, politeness, and imperial descent recommended him to the French monarch, and in the same cities he was alternately employed to teach and to negotiate. Duty and interest prompted them to cultivate the study of the Latin language, and the most successful attained the faculty of writing and speaking with fluency and elegance in a foreign idiom. But they ever retained the inveterate vanity of their country. Their praise, or at least their esteem, was reserved for the national writers, to whom they owed their fame and subsistence, and they sometimes betrayed their contempt in licentious criticism or satire on Virgil's poetry and the oratory of Tully. The superiority of these masters arose from the familiar use of a living language, and their first disciples were incapable of discerning how far they had degenerated from the knowledge and even the practice of their ancestors. A vicious pronunciation, which they introduced, was banished from the schools by the reason of the succeeding age. Of the power of the Greek accents they were ignorant, and those musical notes, which from an Attic tongue and to an Attic ear must have been the secret soul of harmony, were to their eyes, as to our own, no more than minute and unmeaning marks, in prose superfluous and troublesome in verse. The art of grammar they truly possessed, 
the valuable fragments of Apollonius and Herodian were transfused onto their lessons, and their treatises of syntax and etymology, though devoid of philosophic spirit, are still useful to the Greek student. In the shipwreck of the Byzantine libraries, each fugitive seized a fragment of treasure, a copy of some author, who without his industry might have perished. The transcripts were multiplied by an assiduous, and sometimes an elegant pen, and the text was corrected and explained by their own comments, or those of the elder scholiasts. The sense, though not the spirit, of the Greek classics was interpreted to the Latin world. The beauties of style evaporate in aversion, but the judgment of Theodore Gaza selected the more solid works of Aristotle and Theophrastus, and their natural histories of animals and plants opened a rich fund of genuine and experimental science. Yet the fleeting shadows of metaphysics were pursued with more curiosity and ardor. After a long oblivion, Plato was revived in Italy by a venerable Greek, who taught in the house of Cosmo of Medicis. While the Senate of Florence was involved in theological debate, some beneficial consequences might flow from the study of his elegant philosophy. His style is the purest standard of the Attic dialect, and his sublime thoughts are sometimes adapted to familiar conversation, and sometimes adorned with the richest colors of poetry and eloquence. The dialogues of Plato are a dramatic picture of the life and death of a sage, and as often as he descends from the clouds, his moral system inculcates the love of truth, of our country, and of mankind. The precept and example of Socrates recommended a modest doubt and liberal inquiry, and if the Platonists, with blind devotion, adored the visions and errors of their divine master, their enthusiasm might correct the dry, dogmatic method of the peripatetic school. So equal, yet so opposite, are the merits of Plato and Aristotle, that they may be balanced in endless controversy, but some spark of freedom may be produced by the collision of adverse servitude. The modern Greeks were divided between the two sects. With more fury than skill they fought under the banner of their leaders, and the field of battle was removed in their flight from Constantinople to Rome. But this philosophical debate soon degenerated into an angry and personal quarrel of grammarians, and Bessarion, though an advocate for Plato, protected the national honor by interposing the advice and authority of a mediator. In the gardens of the Medici, the academical doctrine was enjoyed by the polite and learned, but their philosophic society was quickly dissolved, and if the writings of the Attic sage were perused in the closet, the more powerful Stagorite continued to reign, the oracle of the church and school. I have fairly represented the literary merits of the Greeks, yet it must be confessed that they were seconded and surpassed by the ardor of the Latins. Italy was divided into many independent states, and at that time it was the ambition of princes and republics to vie with each other in the encouragement and reward of literature. The fame of Nicholas V has not been adequate to his merits. From a plebeian origin he raised himself by his virtue and learning. The character of the man prevailed over the interest of the Pope, and he sharpened those weapons which were soon pointed against the Roman Church. He had been the friend of the most eminent scholars of the age. He became their patron, and such was the humility of his manners, that the change was scarcely discernible either to them or to himself. If he pressed the acceptance of a liberal gift, it was not as the measure of desert, but as the proof of benevolence, and when modest merit declined his bounty, accept it, he would say, with a consciousness of his own worth, you will not always have a Nicholas among you. The influence of the Holy See pervaded Christendom, and he exerted that influence in the search, not of benefices, but of books. From the ruins of the Byzantine libraries, from the darkest monasteries of Germany and Britain, he collected the dusty manuscripts of the writers of antiquity, and wherever the original could not be removed, a faithful copy was transcribed and transmitted for his use. The Vatican, the old repository for bulls and legends, for superstition and forgery, was daily replenished with more precious furniture, and such was the industry of Nicholas, that in a reign of eight years he formed a library of five thousand volumes. To his munificence the Latin world was indebted for the versions of Xenophon, Diodorus, Polybius, Thucydides, Herodotus, and Appian, of Strabo's geography, of the Iliad, of the most valuable works of Plato and Aristotle, of Ptolemy and Theophrastus, and of the fathers of the Greek church. The example of the Roman pontiff was preceded or imitated by a Florentine merchant, 
who governed the Republic without arms and without a title. Cosimo of Medicis was the father of a line of princes, whose name and age are almost synonymous with the restoration of learning. His credit was ennobled into fame, his riches were dedicated to the service of mankind, he corresponded at once with Cairo and London, and a cargo of Indian spices and Greek books was often imported in the same vessel. The genius and education of his grandson Lorenzo rendered him not only a patron, but a judge and candidate in the literary race. In his palace, distress was entitled to relief, and merit to reward. His leisure hours were delightfully spent in the Platonic Academy. He encouraged the emulation of Demetrius Calcocondales, and Angelo Politician, and his active missionary, Janus Lascaris, returned from the East with a treasure of two hundred manuscripts, fourscore of which were as yet unknown in the libraries of Europe. The rest of Italy was animated by a similar spirit, and the progress of the nation repaid the liberality of their princes. The Latins held the exclusive property of their own literature, and these disciples of Greece were soon capable of transmitting and improving the lessons which they had imbibed. After a short succession of foreign teachers, the tide of emigration subsided, but the language of Constantinople was spread beyond the Alps and the natives of France, Germany, and England, imparted to their country the sacred fire which they had kindled in the schools of Florence and Rome. In the productions of the mind, as in those of the soil, the gifts of nature are excelled by industry and skill. The Greek authors, forgotten on the banks of the Elysius, have been illustrated on those of the Elba and the Thames, and Vissarion or Gaza might have envied the superior science of the barbarians, the accuracy of Budaeus, the taste of Erasmus, the copiousness of Stevens, the erudition of Scaliger, the discernment of Resca or of Bentley. On the side of the Latins, the discovery of printing was a casual advantage, but this useful art has been applied by Aldus and his innumerable successors to perpetuate and multiply the works of antiquity. A single manuscript imported from Greece is revived in ten thousand copies, and each copy is fairer than the original. In this form, Homer and Plato would peruse with more satisfaction their own writings, and their scholiasts must resign the prize to the labors of our Western editors. Before the revival of classic literature, the barbarians in Europe were immersed in ignorance, and their vulgar tongues were marked with the rudeness and poverty of their manners. The students of the more perfect idioms of Roman Greece were introduced to a new world of light and science, to the society of the free and polished nations of antiquity, and to a familiar converse with those immortal men who spoke the sublime language of eloquence and reason. Such an intercourse must tend to refine the taste, and to elevate the genius, of the moderns, and yet from the first experiments it might appear that the study of the ancients had given fetters, rather than wings, to the human mind. However laudable, the spirit of imitation is of a servile caste, and the first disciples of the Greeks and Romans were a colony of strangers in the midst of their age and country. The minute and laborious diligence which explored the antiquities of remote times might have improved or adorned the present state of society. The critic and metaphysician were the slaves of Aristotle. The poets, historians, and orators were proud to repeat the thoughts and words of the Augustan age. The works of nature were observed with the eyes of Pliny and Theophrastus, and some pagan votaries professed a secret devotion to the gods of Homer and Plato. The Italians were oppressed by the strength and number of their ancient auxiliaries. The century after the deaths of Petrarch and Boccace was filled with the crowd of Latin imitators, who decently repose on our shelves, but in that era of learning it will not be easy to discern a real discovery of science, a work of invention or eloquence, in the popular language of the country. But as soon as it had been deeply saturated with the celestial dew, the soil was quickened into vegetation and life, the modern idioms were refined, the classics of Athens and Rome inspired a pure taste and a generous emulation, and in Italy, as afterwards in France and England, the pleasing reign of poetry and fiction was succeeded by the light of speculative and experimental philosophy. Genius may anticipate the season of maturity, but in the education of a people, as in that of an individual, memory must be exercised before the powers of reason and fancy can be expanded, nor may the artist hope to equal or surpass, till he has learned to imitate, the works of his predecessors. The respective merits of Rome and Constantinople are compared and celebrated by an eloquent Greek, the father of the Italian schools. 
the view of the ancient capital, the seat of his ancestors, surpassed the most sanguine expectations of Emmanuel Chrysoloras, and he no longer blamed the exclamation of an old sophist, that Rome was the habitation, not of men, but of gods. Those gods, and those men, had long since vanished, but to the eye of liberal enthusiasm, the majesty of ruin restored the image of her ancient prosperity. The monuments of the consuls and Caesars, of the martyrs and apostles, engaged on all sides the curiosity of the philosopher and the Christian, and he confessed that in every age the arms and religion of Rome were destined to reign over the earth. While Chrysoloras admired the venerable beauties of the mother, he was not forgetful of his native country, her first daughter, her imperial colony, and the Byzantine patriot expatiates with zeal and truth on the eternal advantages of nature and the more transitory glories of art and dominion, which adorned, or had adorned, the city of Constantine. Yet the perfection of the copy still redounds, as he modestly observes, to the honor of the original, and parents are delighted to be renewed, and even excelled, by the superior merit of their children. Constantinople, says the orator, is situated on a commanding point between Europe and Asia, between the archipelago and the Euxin. By her interposition, the two seas and the two continents are united for the common benefit of nations, and the gates of commerce may be shut and opened at her command. The harbour, encompassed on all sides by the sea and the continent, is the most secure and capacious in the world. The walls and gates of Constantinople may be compared with those of Babylon, the towers many, each tower is a solid and lofty structure, and a second wall, the outer fortification, would be sufficient for the defense and dignity of an ordinary capital. A broad and rapid stream may be introduced into the ditches and the artificial island may be encompassed, like Athens, by land or water. Two strong and natural causes are leagued for the perfection of the model of New Rome. The royal founder reigned over the most illustrious nations of the globe, and in the accomplishment of his designs, the power of the Romans was combined with the art and science of the Greeks. Other cities have been reared to maturity by accident and time. Their beauties are mingled with disorder and deformity, and the inhabitants, unwilling to remove from their natal spot, are incapable of correcting the errors of their ancestors and the original vices of situational climate. But the free idea of Constantinople was formed and executed by a single mind, and the primitive model was improved by the obedient zeal of the subjects and successors of the first monarch. The adjacent isles were stored with an inexhaustible supply of marble, but the various materials were transported from the most remote shores of Europe and Asia, and the public and private buildings, the palaces, churches, aqueducts, cisterns, porticos, columns, baths and hippodromes, were adapted to the greatness of the capital of the East. The superfluity of wealth was spread along the shores of Europe and Asia, and the Byzantine territory, as far as the Euxin, the Hellespont, and the Long Wall, might be considered as a populous suburb and a perpetual garden. In this flattering picture, the past and the present, the times of prosperity and decay, are artfully confounded, but as I and the confession escape from the orator, that his wretched country was the shadow and sepulchre of its former self. The works of ancient sculpture had been defaced by Christian zeal or barbaric violence, the fairest structures were demolished, and the marbles of Paros or Numidia were burnt for lime, or applied to the meanest uses. Of many a statue, the place was marked by an empty pedestal, of many a column, the size was determined by a broken capital, the tombs of the emperors were scattered on the ground, the stroke of time was accelerated by storms and earthquakes, and the vacant space was adorned by vulgar tradition, with fabulous monuments of gold and silver. From these wonders, which lived only in memory or belief, he distinguishes, however, the porphyry pillar, the column and colossus of Justinian, and the church, more especially the dome of St. Sophia, the best conclusion since it could not be described according to its merits, and after it no other object could deserve to be mentioned. But he forgets that, a century before, the trembling fabrics of the Colossus and the Church had been saved and supported by the timely care of Andronicus the Elder. 
thirty years after the emperor had fortified St. Sophia with two new buttresses or pyramids, the eastern hemisphere suddenly gave way, and the images, the altars, and the sanctuary were crushed by the falling ruin. The mischief indeed was speedily repaired, the rubbish was cleared by the incessant labor of every rank and age, and the poor remains of riches and industry were consecrated by the Greeks to the most stately and venerable temple of the East. The last hope of the falling city and empire was placed in the harmony of the mother and daughter, in the maternal tenderness of Rome, and the filial obedience of Constantinople. In the Synod of Florence, the Greeks and Latins had embraced, and subscribed, and promised, but these signs of friendship were perfidious or fruitless, and the baseless fabric of the union vanished like a dream. The emperor and his prelates returned home in the Venetian galleys, but as they touched at the Morea and the isles of Corfu and Lesbos, the subjects of the Latins complained that the pretended union would be an instrument of oppression. No sooner did they land on the Byzantine shore than they were saluted, or rather assailed, with a general murmur of zeal and discontent. During their absence of two years, the capital had been deprived of its civil and ecclesiastical rulers. Fanaticism fermented in anarchy, the most furious monks reigned over the conscience of women and bigots, and the hatred of the Latin name was the first principle of nature and religion. Before his departure for Italy, the emperor had flattered the city with the assurance of a prompt relief and a powerful succor, and the clergy, confident in their orthodoxy and science, had promised themselves and their flocks an easy victory over the blind shepherds of the West. The double disappointment exasperated the Greeks. The conscience of the subscribing prelates was awakened, the hour of temptation was past, and they had more to dread from the public resentment than they could hope from the favor of the emperor or the pope. Instead of justifying their conduct, they deplored their weakness, professed their contrition, and cast themselves on the mercy of God and their brethren. To the reproachful question, what had been the event or the use of the Italian synod, they answered with sighs and tears, Alas, we have made a new faith, we have exchanged piety for impiety, we have betrayed the immaculate sacrifice, and we are become Azimites. The Azimites were those who celebrated the communion with unleavened bread, and I must retract or qualify the praise which I have bestowed on the growing philosophy of the times. Alas, we have been seduced by distress, by fraud, and by the hopes and fears of transitory life. The hand that has signed the union should be cut off, and the tongue that has pronounced the Latin creed deserves to be torn from the root. The best proof of their repentance was an increase of zeal for the most trivial rites and the most incomprehensible doctrines, and an absolute separation from all without accepting their prince, who preserved some regard for honor and consistency. After the decease of the patriarch Joseph, the archbishops of Heraclea and Trebizond had courage to refuse the vacant office, and Cardinal Bessarion preferred the warm and comfortable shelter of the Vatican. The choice of the emperor and his clergy was confined to Metrophanes of Sycus. He was consecrated in St. Sophia, but the temple was vacant. The cross-bearers abdicated their service, the infection spread from the city to the villages, and Metrophanes discharged without effect some ecclesiastical thunders against the nation of schismatics. The eyes of the Greeks were directed to Mark of Ephesus, the champion of his country, and the sufferings of the holy confessor were repaid with a tribute of admiration and applause. His example and writings propagated the flame of religious discord. Age and infirmity soon removed him from the world, but the gospel of Mark was not a law of forgiveness, and he requested with his dying breath that none of the adherents of Rome might attend the obsequies or pray for his soul. The schism was not confined to the narrow limits of the Byzantine Empire. Secure under the Mameluk sceptre, the three patriarchs of Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem assembled numerous synod, disowned their representatives at Ferrara and Florence, condemned the creed and council of the Latins, and threatened the emperor of Constantinople with the censures of the Eastern Church. Of the sectaries of the Greek communion, the Russians were the most powerful, ignorant, and superstitious. Their primate, the Cardinal Isidore, hastened from Florence to Moscow to reduce the independent nation under the Roman yoke. 
but the Russian bishops had been educated at Mount Athos, and the prince and people embraced the theology of their priests. They were scandalized by the title, the pomp, the Latin cross of the legate, the friend of those impious men who shaved their beards and performed the divine office with gloves on their hands and rings on their fingers. Isidore was condemned by a synod, his person was imprisoned in a monastery, and it was with extreme difficulty that the cardinal could escape from the hands of a fierce and fanatic people. The Russians refused the passage to the missionaries of Rome who aspired to convert the pagans beyond the Tanais, and their refusal was justified by the maxim that the guilt of idolatry is less damnable than that of schism. The errors of the Bohemians were excused by their abhorrence for the Pope, and the deputation of the Greek clergy solicited the friendship of those sanguinary enthusiasts. While Eugenius triumphed in the union and orthodoxy of the Greeks, his party was contracted to the walls, or rather to the palace of Constantinople. The seal of Palaeologus had been excited by interest. It was soon cooled by opposition. An attempt to vitiate the national belief might endanger his life and crown. Not could the pious rebels be destitute of foreign and domestic aid. The sword of his brother Demetrius, who in Italy had maintained a prudent and popular silence, was half unsheathed in the cause of religion, and Amurat, Turkish sultan, was displeased and alarmed by the seeming friendship of the Greeks and Latins. Sultan Murad, or Amurat, lived forty-nine and reigned thirty years, six months, and eight days. He was a just and valiant prince, of a great soul, patient of labors, learned, merciful, religious, charitable, a lover and encourager of the studious, and of all who excelled in any art or science, a good emperor and a great general. No man obtained more or greater victories than Amurat. Belgrade alone withstood his attacks. On his reign, the soldier was ever victorious, the citizen rich and secure. If he subdued any country, his first care was to build mosques and caravanseras, hospitals and colleges. Every year he gave a thousand pieces of gold to the sons of the prophet, and sent two thousand five hundred to the religious persons of Mecca, Medina and Jerusalem. This portrait is transcribed from the historian of the Ottoman Empire, but the applause of a servile and superstitious people has been lavished on the worst of tyrants, and the virtues of a sultan are often the vices most useful to himself or most agreeable to his subjects. A nation ignorant of the equal benefits of liberty and law must be awed by the flashes of arbitrary power. The cruelty of a despot will assume the character of justice, his profusion of liberality, his obstinacy of firmness. If the most reasonable excuse be rejected, few acts of obedience will be found impossible, and guilt must tremble where innocence cannot always be secure. The tranquillity of the people and the discipline of his troops, were best maintained by perpetual action in the field. War was the trade of the Janissaries, and those who survived the peril and divided the spoil applauded the generous ambition of their sovereign. To propagate the true religion was the duty of the faithful Muslim. The unbelievers were his enemies, and those of the Prophet, and in the hands of the Turks, the scimitar was the only instrument of conversion. Under these circumstances, however, the justice and moderation of Amurat are attested by his conduct and acknowledged by the Christians themselves, who consider a prosperous reign and a peaceful death as the reward of his singular merits. In the vigor of his age and military power, he seldom engaged in war till he was justified by a previous and adequate provocation. The victorious sultan was disarmed by submission, and in the observance of treaties, his word was inviolate and sacred. The Hungarians were commonly the aggressors. He was provoked by the revolt of Skanderbeg, and the perfidious Karamanian was twice vanquished and twice pardoned by the Ottoman monarch. Before he invaded the Morea, Thebes had been surprised by the despot in the conquest of Thessalonica. The grandson of Bazajet might dispute the recent purchase of the Venetians, and after the first siege of Constantinople, the Sultan was never tempted by the distress the absence or the injuries of Palaeologus to extinguish the dying light of the Byzantine Empire. But the most striking feature in the life and character of Amurath is the double abdication of the Turkish throne, and, 
Were not his motives debased by an alloy of superstition, we must praise the royal philosopher, who at the age of forty could discern the vanity of human greatness. Resigning the sceptre to his son, he retired to the pleasant residence of Magnesia, but he retired to the society of saints and hermits. It was not till the fourth century of the Hegira that the religion of Mahomet had been corrupted by an institution so adverse to his genius, but in the age of the Crusades, the various orders of dervishes were multiplied by the example of the Christian, and even the Latin monks. The Lord of Nations submitted to fast and pray and turned round in endless rotation with the fanatics, who mistook the giddiness of the head for the illumination of the spirit. But he was soon awakened from his dreams of enthusiasm by the Hungarian invasion, and his obedient son was the foremost to urge the public danger and the wishes of the people. Under the banner of the veteran leader, the Janissaries fought and conquered, but he withdrew from the field of Varna, again to pray to fast and to turn round with his Magnesian brethren. These pious occupations were again interrupted by the danger of the state. A victorious army disdained the inexperience of their youthful ruler. The city of Adrianople was abandoned to rapine and slaughter, and the unanimous divan implored his presence to appease the tumult and prevent the rebellion of the Janissaries. At the well-known voice of their master, they trembled and obeyed, and the reluctant sultan was compelled to support his splendid servitude, till at the end of four years he was relieved by the angel of death. Age or disease, misfortune or caprice, have tempted several princes to descend from the throne, and they have had leisure to repent of their irretrievable step. But Amurat alone, in the full liberty of choice, after the trial of empire and solitude, has repeated his preference of private life. After the departure of his Greek brethren, Eugenius had not been unmindful of their temporal interests, and his tender regard for the Byzantine Empire was animated by just apprehension of the Turks, who approached and might soon invade the borders of Italy. But the spirit of the Crusades had expired, and the coldness of the Franks was not less unreasonable than their headlong passion. In the eleventh century, a fanatic monk could precipitate Europe on Asia for the recovery of the Holy Sepulchre, but in the 15th, the most pressing motives of religion and policy were insufficient to unite the Latins in the defense of Christendom. Germany was an inexhaustible storehouse of men and arms, but that complex and languid body required the impulse of a vigorous hand, and Frederick III was alike impotent in his personal character and his imperial dignity. A long war had impaired the strength, without satiating the animosity of France and England. But Philip, Duke of Burgundy, was a vain and magnificent prince, and he enjoyed, without danger or expense, the adventurous piety of his subjects, who sailed, in a gallant fleet, from the coast of Flanders to the Hellespont. The maritime republics of Venice and Genoa were less remote from the scene of action, and their hostile fleets were associated under the standard of St. Peter. The kingdoms of Hungary and Poland, which covered, as it were, the interior pale of the Latin Church, were the most nearly concerned to oppose the progress of the Turks. Arms were the patrimony of the Scythians and Sarmatians, and these nations might appear equal to the context, could they point, against the common foe, those swords that were so wantonly drawn in bloody and domestic quarrels. But the same spirit was adverse to concord and obedience, a poor country and a limited monarch are incapable of maintaining a standing force, and the loose bodies of Polish and Hungarian horse were not armed with the sentiments and weapons which, on some occasions, have given irresistible weight to the French chivalry. Yet on this side, the designs of the Roman pontiff and the eloquence of Cardinal Julian, his legate, were promoted by the circumstances of the times, by the union of the two crowns on the head of Ladislaus, a young and ambitious soldier, by the valor of a hero whose name, the name of John Huniades, was already popular among the Christians, and formidable to the Turks. An endless treasure of pardons and indulgences was scattered by the legate. Many private warriors of France and Germany enlisted under the holy banner, and the crusade derived some strength, or at least some reputation, from the new allies both of Europe and Asia. A fugitive despot of Serbia exaggerated the distress and ardor of the Christians beyond the Danube, who would unanimously rise to vindicate their religion and liberty. The Greek emperor, 
with a spirit unknown to his fathers, engaged to guard the Bosphorus, and to sally from Constantinople at the head of his national and mercenary troops. The Sultan of Karamania announced the retreat of Amurat, and a powerful diversion in the heart of Anatolia, and if the fleets of the West could occupy at the same moment the Straits of the Hellespont, the Ottoman monarchy would be dissevered and destroyed. Heaven and earth must rejoice in the perdition of the miscreants, and the legates, with prudent ambiguity, instilled the opinion of the invisible, perhaps the visible, aid of the Son of God and his Divine Mother. Of the Polish and Hungarian diets, a religious war was the unanimous cry, and Ladislaus, after passing the Danube, led an army of his confederate subjects as far as Sofia, the capital of the Bulgarian kingdom. In this expedition they obtained two signal victories, which were justly ascribed to the valor and conduct of Huniades. In the first, with a vanguard of ten thousand men, he surprised the Turkish camp. In the second, he vanquished and made prisoner the most renowned of their generals, who possessed the double advantage of ground and numbers. The approach of winter, and the natural and artificial obstacles of Mount Hamus, arrested the progress of the hero, who measured a narrow interval of six days' march from the foot of the mountains to the hostile towers of Adrianople, and the friendly capital of the Greek Empire. The retreat was undisturbed, and the entrance into Buddha was at once a military and religious triumph. An ecclesiastical procession was followed by the king and his warriors of foot. He nicely balanced the merits and rewards of the two nations, and the pride of conquest was blended with the humble temper of Christianity. Thirteen bashos, nine standards, and four thousand captives were unquestionable trophies, and as all were willing to believe, and none were present to contradict, the crusaders multiplied, with unblushing confidence, the myriads of Turks whom they had left on the fields of battle. The most solid proof, and the most salutary consequence of victory, was the deputation from the divan to solicit peace, to restore Serbia, to ransom the prisoners, and to evacuate the Hungarian frontier. By this treaty, the rational objects of the war were obtained, the king, the despot, and Huniades himself, in the Diet of Segedin, were satisfied with public and private emolument. A truce of ten years was concluded, and the followers of Jesus and Mohammed, who swore on the Gospel and the Quran, attested the word of God as the guardian of truth and the avenger of perfidy. In the place of the Gospel, the Turkish ministers had proposed to substitute the Eucharist, the real presence of the Catholic deity, but the Christians refused to profane their holy mysteries, and the superstitious conscience is less forcibly bound by the spiritual energy than by the outward and visible symbols of an oath. During the whole transaction, the cardinal legate had observed a sullen silence, unwilling to approve and unable to oppose the consent of the king and people. But the diet was not dissolved before Julian was fortified by the welcome intelligence that Anatolia was invaded by the Caramanian, and Thrace by the Greek emperor, that the fleets of Genoa, Venice, and Burgundy were masters of the Hellespont, and that the allies, informed of the victory and ignorant of the treaty of Ladislaus, impatiently waited for the return of his victorious army. And it is thus, explained the cardinal, that you will desert their expectations and your own fortune. It is to them, to your God and your fellow Christians, that you have pledged your faith, and that prior obligation annihilates a rash and sacrilegious oath to the enemies of Christ. His vicar on earth is the Roman pontiff, without whose sanction you can neither promise nor perform. In his name I absolve your perjury and sanctify your arms. I follow your footsteps in the path of glory and salvation, and if still ye have scruples, devolve on my head the punishment and the sin. This mischievous casuistry was seconded by his respectable character, and the levity of popular assemblies, war was resolved, on the same spot where peace had so lately been sworn, and in the execution of the treaty, the Turks were assaulted by the Christians, to whom, with some reason, they might apply the epithet of infidels. The falsehood of Ladislaus to his word and oath was palliated by the religion of the times. The most perfect, or at least most popular excuse, would have been the success of his arms and the deliverance of the Eastern Church. But the same treaty which should have bound his conscience had diminished his strength. On the proclamation of the peace, the French and German volunteers departed with indignant murmurs. The Poles were exhausted by distant warfare, 
and perhaps disgusted with foreign command, and their palatines accepted the first license and hastily retired to their provinces and castles. Even Hungary was divided by faction, or restrained by a laudable scruple, and the relics of the crusade that marched in the second expedition were reduced to an inadequate force of twenty thousand men. A Wallachian chief, who joined the royal standards with his vassals, presumed to remark that their numbers did not exceed the hunting retinue that sometimes attended the sultan, and the gift of two horses of matchless speed might admonish Ladislaus of his secret foresight of the event. But the despot of Serbia, after the restoration of his country and children, was tempted by the promise of new realms, and the inexperience of the king, the enthusiasm of the legate, and the martial presumption of Huniades himself, were persuaded that every obstacle must yield to the invincible virtue of the sword and the cross. After the passage of the Danube, two roads might lead to Constantinople and the Hellespont, the one direct, abrupt, and difficult through the mountains of Hemus, the other more tedious and secure over a level country and along the shores of the Euxine, in which their flanks, according to the Scythian discipline, might always be covered by a movable fortification of wagons. The latter was judiciously preferred, the Catholics marched through the plains of Bulgaria, burning with wanton cruelty the churches and villages of the Christian natives. And the last station was at Varna, near the seashore, on which the defeat and death of Ladislaus have bestowed a memorable name. It was on this fatal spot that, instead of finding a confederate fleet to second their operations, they were alarmed by the approach of Amurath himself, who had issued from his Magnesian solitude and transported the forces of Asia to the defense of Europe. According to some writers, the Greek emperor had been awed or seduced to grant the passage of the Bosphorus, and an indelible stain of corruption is fixed on the Genoese, or the Pope's nephew, the Catholic admiral, whose mercenary connivance betrayed the guard of the Hellespont. From Adrianople, the sultan advanced by hasty marches at the head of sixty thousand men, and when the cardinal and Huniades, had taken a nearer survey of the numbers and order of the Turks. These ardent warriors proposed the tardy and impracticable measures of a retreat. The king alone was resolved to conquer or die, and his resolution had almost been crowned with a glorious and salutary victory. The princes were opposite to each other in the centre, and the Beglerbegs, or generals of Anatolia and Romania, commanded on the right and left against the adverse divisions of the despot and Huniades. The Turkish wings were broken on the first onset, but the advantage was fatal, and the rash victors, in the heat of the pursuit, were carried away far from the annoyance of the enemy, or the support of their friends. When Amurath beheld the flight of his squadrons, he despaired of his fortune and that of the empire. A veteran Janissary seized his horse's bridle, and he had magnanimity to pardon and reward the soldier who dared to perceive the terror and arrest the flight of his sovereign. A copy of the treaty, the monument of Christian perfidy, had been displayed in front of the battle, and it is said that the sultan in his distress, lifting his eyes and his hands to heaven, implored the protection of the God of truth, and called on the prophet Jesus himself to avenge the impious mockery of his name and religion. With inferior numbers and disordered ranks, the king of Hungary rushed forward in the confidence of victory, till his career was stopped by the impenetrable phalanx of the Janissaries. If we may credit the Ottoman annuals, his horse was pierced by the javelin of Amurath. He fell among the spears of the infantry, and the Turkish soldier proclaimed with a loud voice, Hungarians, behold the head of your king. The death of Ladislaus was the signal of their defeat. On his return from an intemperate pursuit, when Yadis deplored his error and the public loss, he strove to rescue the royal body till he was overwhelmed by the tumultuous crowd of victors and vanquished and the last efforts of his courage and conduct was exerted to save the remnant of his Wallachian cavalry. Ten thousand Christians were slain in the disastrous battle of Varna. The loss of the Turks, more considerable in numbers, bore a smaller proportion to their total strength, yet the philosophic sultan was not ashamed to confess that his ruin must be the consequence of a second and similar victory. At his command, a column was erected on the spot where Ladislaus had fallen, but the modest inscription, instead of accusing the rashness, recorded the valor and bewailed the misfortune of the Hungarian youth. Before I lose sight of the field of Varna, I am tempted to pause on the character and story of two principal actors, Cardinal Julian 
and John Huniades. Julian Cesarini was born of a noble family in Rome. His studies had embraced both the Latin and Greek learning, both the sciences of divinity and law, and his versatile genius was equally adapted to the schools, the camp, and the court. No sooner had he been invested with the Roman purple that he was sent into Germany to arm the empire against the rebels and heretics of Bohemia. The spirit of persecution is unworthy of a Christian. The military profession ill becomes a priest, but the former is excused by the times, and the latter was ennobled by the courage of Julian, who stood dauntless and alone in the disgraceful flight of the German host. As the Pope's legate, he opened the Council of Basel, but the president soon appeared the most tenuous champion of ecclesiastical freedom, and an opposition of seven years was conducted by his ability and zeal. After promoting the strongest measures against the authority and person of Eugenius, some secret motive of interest or conscience engaged him to desert on a sudden the popular party. The cardinal withdrew himself from Basel to Ferrara, and, in the debates of the Greeks and Latins, the two nations admired the dexterity of his arguments and the depth of his theological erudition. In his Hungarian embassy, we have already seen the mischievous effects of his sophistry and eloquence, of which Julian himself was the first victim. The cardinal, who performed the duties of a priest and soldier, was lost in the defeat of Varna. The circumstances of his death are variously related, but it is believed that a weighty encumbrance of gold impeded his flight, and tempted the cruel avarice of some Christian fugitives. From a humble, or at least a doubtful origin, the merit of John Huniades promoted him to the command of the Hungarian armies. His father was a Wallachian, his mother a Greek, her unknown race might possibly ascend to the emperors of Constantinople, and the claims of the Wallachians, with the surname of Corvinus, from the place of his nativity, might suggest a thin pretense for mingling his blood with the patricians of ancient Rome. In his youth he served in the wars of Italy, and was retained with twelve horsemen by the bishop of Zagreb. The valor of the white knight was soon conspicuous. He increased his fortunes by a noble and wealthy marriage, and in defense of the Hungarian borders he won in the same year three battles against the Turks. By his influence, Ladislaus of Poland obtained the crown of Hungary, and the important service was rewarded by the title and office of Wywood of Transylvania. The first of Julian's crusades added two Turkish laurels to, on his brow, and in the public distress the fatal errors of Varna were forgotten. During the absence and minority of Ladislaus of Austria, the titular king, Huniades was elected supreme captain and governor of Hungary, and if envy at first was silenced by terror, a reign of twelve years supposes the arts of policy as well as of war. Yet the idea of a consummate general is not delineated in his campaigns. The white knight fought with the hand rather than the head, as the chief of the sultry barbarians who attack without fear and fly without shame and his military life is composed of a romantic alternative of victories and escapes. By the Turks, who employed his name to frighten their perverse children, he was corruptly denominated Jankus Lain, or the Wicked. Their hatred is the proof of their esteem. The kingdom which he guarded was inaccessible to their arms, and they felt him most daring and formidable, when they fondly believed the captain and his country irrecoverably lost. Instead of confining himself to a defensive war, Four years after the defeat of Varna, he again penetrated into the heart of Bulgaria, and in the plain of Kosova, sustained till the third day the shock of the Ottoman army, four times more numerous than his own. As he fled alone through the woods of Wallachia, the hero was surprised by two robbers, but while they disputed the gold chain that hung at his neck, he recovered his sword, slew the one, terrified the other, and after new perils of captivity or death, consoled by his presence and afflicted kingdom. But the last and most glorious action of his life was the defense of Belgrade against the powers of Mohammed II in person. After a siege of forty days, the Turks, who had already entered the town, were compelled to retreat, and the joyful nations celebrated Huniades and Belgrade as the bulwarks of Christendom. About a month after this great deliverance, the champion expired, and his most splendid epitaph, is the regret of the Ottoman prince, who sighed that he could no longer hope for revenge against the single antagonist who had triumphed over his arms. On the first vacancy of the throne, Matthias Corvinus, a youth of eighteen years of age, was elected and crowned by the grateful Hungarians. His reign was prosperous and long. Matthias aspired to the glory of a conqueror and a saint, 
but his purest merit is the encouragement of learning, and the Latin orators and historians, who were invited from Italy by the sun, have shed the luster of their eloquence on the father's character. In the list of heroes, John Huniades and Skanderbeg are commonly associated, and they are both entitled to our notice, since their occupation of the Ottoman army delayed the ruin of the Greek Empire. John Castriot, the father of Skanderbeg, was the hereditary prince of a small district of Epirus or Albania, between the mountains and the Adriatic Sea. Unable to contend with the sultan's power, Castriot submitted to the hard conditions of peace and tribute. He delivered his four sons as the pledges of his fidelity, and the Christian youths, after receiving the marks of circumcision, were instructed in the Mohammedan religion and trained in the arms and arts of Turkish policy. The three elder brothers were confounded in the crowd of slaves, and the poison to which their deaths are ascribed cannot be verified or disproved by any positive evidence. Yet the suspicion is in great measure removed by the kind and paternal treatment of George Castrio, the fourth brother, who, from his tender youth, displayed the strength and spirit of a soldier. The successive overthrow of a Tartar and two Persians, who carried a proud defiance to the Turkish court, recommended him to the favor of Amurat, and his Turkish appellation of Skanderbeg, Iskenderbeg, or the Lord of Alexander, is an indelible memorial of his glory and servitude. His father's principality was reduced into a province, but the loss was compensated by the rank and title of Sanjiak, a commander of five thousand horse, and the prospect of the first dignities of the empire. He served with honor in the wars of Europe and Asia, and we may smile at the art or credulity of the historian, who supposes that in every encounter he spared the Christians, while he fell with a thundering arm on his Mussulman foes. The glory of Huniades is without reproach. He fought in the defense of his religion and country, but the enemies who applaud the patriot have branded his rival with the name of traitor and apostate. In the eyes of the Christian, the rebellion of Skanderbeg is justified by his father's wrongs, the ambiguous death of his three brothers, his own degradation, and the slavery of his country. And they adore the generous, though tardy, zeal with which he asserted the faith and the dependence of his ancestors. But he had imbibed from his ninth year the doctrines of the Quran. He was ignorant of the gospel, the religion of a soldier is determined by authority and habit. Nor is it easy to conceive what new illumination at the age of forty could be poured into his soul. His motives would be less exposed to the suspicion of interest or revenge, had he broken his chain from the moment that he was sensible of its weight. But a long oblivion had surely impaired his original right, and every year of obedience and reward cemented the mutual bond of the sultan and his subject. If Skanderbeg had long harbored the belief of Christianity and the intentional revolt, a worthy mind must condemn the base dissimulation that could serve only to betray, that could promise only to be forsworn, that could actively join in the temporal and spiritual perdition of so many thousands of his unhappy brethren. Shall we praise a secret correspondence with Huniades, while he commanded the vanguard of the Turkish army? Shall we excuse the desertion of his standard, a treacherous desertion which abandoned the victory to the enemies of his benefactor? In the confusion of a defeat, the eye of Skanderbeg was fixed on the race effendi or principal secretary. With the dagger at his breast, he extorted a firman or patent, for the government of Albania, and the murder of the guileless scribe and his train prevented the consequences of an immediate discovery. With some bold companions, to whom he had revealed his design, he escaped in the night, by rapid marches, from the field of battle to his paternal mountains. The gates of Croia were opened to the royal mandate, and no sooner did he command the fortress than George Castriot dropped the mask of dissimulation abjured the prophet and the sultan, and proclaimed himself the avenger of his family and country. The names of religion and liberty provoked a general revolt. The Albanians, a martial race, were unanimous to live and die with their hereditary prince, and the Ottoman garrisons were indulged in the choice of martyrdom or baptism. In the assembly of the states of Epirus, Skanderbeg was elected general of the Turkish war, and each of the allies engaged to furnish his respective proportion of men and money. From these contributions, from his patrimonial estate, and from the valuable salt pits of Selina, he drew an annual revenue of 200,000 ducats, and the entire sum, exempt from demands of luxury, 
was strictly appropriate to the public use. His manners were popular, but his discipline was severe, and every superfluous vice was banished from his camp. His example strengthened his command, and under his conduct, the Albanians were invincible in their own opinion and that of their enemies. The bravest adversaries of France and Germany were allured by his fame and retained in his service. His standing militia consisted of 8,000 horse and 7,000 foot. The horses were small, the men were active, but he viewed with a discerning eye the difficulties and resources of the mountains. And, at the blaze of the beacons, the whole nation was distributed in the strongest posts. With such unequal arms, Skanderbeg resisted twenty-three years the powers of the Ottoman Empire, and two conquerors, Amurat II and his greater son, were repeatedly baffled by a rebel whom they pursued with seeming contempt and implacable resentment. At the head of sixty thousand horse and forty thousand janissaries, Amurat entered Albania. He might ravage the open country, occupy the defenseless towns, convert the churches into mosques, circumcise the Christian youths, and punish with death his adult and obstinate captives. But the conquests of the sultan were confined to the petty fortress of Svetigrad, and the garrison, invincible to his arms, were oppressed by a paltry artifice and a superstitious scruple. Amurata retired with shame and loss from the walls of Croya, the castle and residence of the Castriots. The march, the siege, the retreat, were harassed by a vexatious and almost invincible adversary and a disappointment might tend to embitter, perhaps to shorten, the last days of the sultan. In the fullness of conquest, Mahomet II still felt at his bosom this domestic thorn. His lieutenants were permitted to negotiate a truce, and the Albanian prince may justly be praised as a firm and able champion of his natural independence. The enthusiasm of chivalry and religion has ranked him with the names of Alexander and Pyrrhus, nor would they blush to acknowledge their intrepid countrymen. But his narrow dominion and slender powers must leave him at an humble distance below the heroes of antiquity who triumphed over the East and the Roman legions. His splendid achievements, the bashos whom he encountered, the armies that he discomfited, and the three thousand Turks who were slain by his single hand, must be weighted in the scales of suspicious criticism. Against an illiterate enemy, and in the dark solitude of Epirus, his partial biographers may safely indulge the latitude of romance, but their fictions are exposed by the light of Italian history, and they afford a strong presumption against their own truth by a fabulous tale of his exploits when he passed the Adriatic with eight hundred horse to the succor of the King of Naples. Without disparagement to his fame, they might have owned that he was finally oppressed by the Ottoman powers. In his extreme danger, he applied to Pope Pius II for a refuge in the ecclesiastical state, and his resources were almost exhausted, since Skanderbeg died a fugitive at Lissus on the Venetian territory. His sepulchre was soon violated by the Turkish conquerors, but the Janissaries, who wore his bones encased in a bracelet, declared by this superstitious amulet their involuntary reverence for his valor. The instant ruin of his country may redound to the hero's glory, yet, yet, had he balanced the consequences of submission and resistance, a patriot perhaps would have declined the unequal contest, which must depend on the life and genius of one man. Skanderbeg might indeed be supported by the rational, though fallacious hope that the Pope, the King of Naples, and the Venetian Republic would join in the defense of a free and Christian people, who guarded the seacoast of the Adriatic, and a narrow passage from Greece to Italy. His infant son was saved from the national shipwreck. The Castriots were invested with a Neapolitan dukedom, and their blood continues to flow in the noblest families of the realm. A colony of Albanian fugitives obtained a settlement in Calabria, and they preserve at this day the language and manners of their ancestors. In the long career of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, I have reached at last the last reign of the princes of Constantinople who so feebly sustained the name and majesty of the Caesars. On the decease of John Paleologus, who survived about four years the Hungarian crusade, the royal family, by the death of Andronicus and the monastic profession of Isidore, was reduced to three princes, Constantine, Demetrius, and Thomas, the surviving sons of the Emperor Manuel. Of these, the first and the last were far distant in the Morea, but Demetrius, who possessed the domain of Salubria, was in the suburbs, at the head of a party. His ambition was not chilled by the public distress, 
and his conspiracy with the Turks and the Schismatics had already disturbed the peace of his country. The funeral of the late emperor was accelerated with singular and even suspicious haste. The claim of Demetrius to the vacant throne was justified by a trite and flimsy sophism, that he was born in the purple, the eldest son of his father's reign. But the emperor's mother, the senate, and soldiers, the clergy and people, were unanimous in the cause of the lawful successor, and the despot Thomas, who, ignorant of the change, accidentally returned to the capital, asserted with becoming zeal the interest of his absent brother. An ambassador, the historian Franza, was immediately dispatched to the court of Adrianople. Amurat received him with honor and dismissed him with gifts, but the gracious approbation of the Turkish sultan announced his supremacy, and the approaching downfall of the Eastern Empire. By the hands of two illustrious deputies, the imperial crown was placed at Sparta on the head of Constantine. In the spring he sailed from the Morea, escaped the encounter of a Turkish squadron, enjoyed the acclamations of his subjects, celebrated the festival of a new reign, and exhausted by his donatives the treasure, or rather the indigence, of the state. The emperor immediately resigned to his brothers the possession of the Morea, and the brittle friendship of the two princes, Demetrius and Thomas, was confined in their mother's presence by a frail security of oaths and embraces. His next occupation was the choice of a concert. The daughter of the Doge of Venice had been proposed, but the Byzantine nobles objected the distance between a hereditary monarch and an elective magistrate, and in their subsequent distress, the chief of that powerful republic was not unmindful of the affront. Constantine afterwards hesitated between the royal families of Trebizond and Georgia, and the embassy of Franza represents in his public and private life the last days of the Byzantine Empire. The Provestiar, or Great Chamberlain, Franza sailed from Constantinople as the minister of a bridegroom, and the relics of wealth and luxury were applied to his pompous appearance. His numerous retinue consisted of nobles and guards, of physicians and monks. He was attended by a band of music, and the term of his costly embassy was protected above two years. On his arrival in Georgia or Iberia, the natives from the towns and villages flocked around the strangers, and such was their simplicity that they were delighted with the effects, without understanding the cause, of musical harmony. Among the crowd was an old man, above a hundred years of age, who had formerly been carried away a captive by the barbarians, and who amused his hearers with the tale of the wonders of India, from whence he had returned to Portugal by an unknown sea. From this hospitable land, Franza proceeded to the court of Trebizond, where he was informed by the Greek prince of the recent disease of Amarat. Instead of rejoicing in the deliverance, the experienced statesman expressed his apprehension that an ambitious youth would not long adhere to the sage and pacific system of his father. After the sultan's disease, his Christian wife, Maria, the daughter of the Serbian despot, had been honorably restored to her parents, on the fame of her royal beauty and merit, she was recommended by the ambassador as the most worthy object of the royal choice, and Franza recapulates and refutes the specious objections that might be raised against the proposal. The majesty of the purple, with a noble and unequal alliance, the bar of affinity might be removed by liberal alms and the dispensation of the church, the disgrace of Turkish nuptials had been repeatedly overlooked, and though the fair Maria was nearly fifty years of age, she might yet hope to give an heir to the empire. Constantine listened to the advice, which was transmitted in the first ship that sailed from Trebizond, but the factions of the court opposed his marriage, and it was finally prevented by the pious vow of the sultana, who ended her days in the monastic profession. Reduced to the first alternative, the choice of Franza was decided in favor of a Georgian princess, and the vanity of her father was dazzled by the glorious alliance. Instead of demanding, according to the primitive and national custom, a prize for his daughter, he offered a portion of fifty-six thousand, with an annual pension of five thousand ducats, and the services of the ambassador were repaid by an assurance that, as his son had been adopted in baptism by the emperor, the establishment of his daughter should be the peculiar care of the empress of Constantinople. On the return of Pransa, the treaty was ratified by the Greek monarch, who with his own hand impressed three vermilion crosses on the golden bull and assured the Georgian envoy that in the spring his galleys would conduct the bride to her imperial palace. But Constantine embraced his faithful servant, not with the cold approbation of a sovereign, but with the warm confidence of a friend, who, after a long absence, 
is impatient to pour his secrets into the bosom of his friend. Since the death of my mother and of Kantatsuini, who alone advised me without interest or passion, I am surrounded, said the emperor, by men whom I can neither love nor trust nor esteem. You are not a stranger to Lucas Notaras, the great admiral, obstinately attached to his own sentiments. He declares, both in private and public, that his sentiments are the absolute measure of my thoughts and actions. The rest of the courtiers are swayed by their personal or factitious views. And how can I consult the monks on the questions of policy in marriage? I have yet much employment for your diligence and fidelity. In the spring you shall engage one of my brothers to solicit the succor of the western powers. From the Morea you shall sail to Cyprus on a particular commission, and from thence proceed to Georgia to receive and conduct the future emperors. Your commands, replied Franza, are irresistible. But deign, great sir, he added, with a serious smile, to consider that if I am thus perpetually absent from my family, my wife may be tempted either to seek another husband, or throw herself into a monastery. After laughing at his apprehensions, the emperor more gravely consoled him by the pleasing assurances that this should be his last service abroad, and that he destined for his son a wealthy and noble heiress, for himself, the important office of great logotate or principal minister of state. The marriage was immediately stipulated, but the office, however incompatible with his own, had been usurped by the ambition of the admiral. Some delay was requisite to negotiate a consent and an equivalent, and the nomination of Franza was half declared and half suppressed, lest it might be displeasing to an insolent and powerful favourite. The winter was spent in the preparations of his embassy, and Franza had resolved that his young son should embrace this opportunity of foreign travel, and be left, on the appearance of danger, with his maternal kindred of the Maria. Such were the private and public designs, which were interrupted by a Turkish war, and finally buried in the ruins of the empire. The siege of Constantinople by the Turks attracts our first attention to the person and character of the great destroyer. Mohammed II was the son of the second Amurath, and though his mother has been decorated with the titles of Christian and Princess, she is more probably confounded with the numerous concubines who peopled from every climate the harem of the Sultan. His first education and sentiments were those of a devout Mussulman, and as often as he conversed with an infidel, he purified his hands and face by the legal rites of ablution. Age and empire appear to have relaxed this narrow bigotry. His aspiring genius disdained to acknowledge a power above his own, and in his looser hours he presumed, it is said, to brand the prophet of Mecca as a robber and impostor. Yet the sultan persevered in a decent reverence for the doctrine and discipline of the Koran. His private indiscretion must have been sacred from the vulgar ear, and we should suspect the credulity of strangers and sectaries so prone to believe that a mind which is hardened against truth must be armed with superior contempt for absurdity and error. Under the tuition of the most skillful masters, Mohammed advanced with an early and rapid progress in the paths of knowledge, and besides his native tongue, it is affirmed that he spoke or understood five languages, the Arabic, the Persian, the Chaldean or Hebrew, the Latin and the Greek. The Persian might indeed contribute to his amusement, and the Arabic to his edification, and such studies are familiar to the Oriental youth. In the intercourse of the Greeks and Turks, a conqueror might wish to converse with the people over whom he was ambitious to reign. His own praises in Latin poetry or prose might find a passage to the royal ear. But what use or merit could recommend to the statesman or the scholar the uncouth dialect of his Hebrew slaves? The history and geography of the world were familiar to his memory. The lives of the heroes of the East, perhaps of the West, excited his emulation. His skill in astrology is excused by the folly of the times, and supposes some rudiments of mathematical science, and a profane taste for the arts is betrayed in his liberal invitation and reward of the painters of Italy. But the influence of religion and learning were employed without effect on his savage and licentious nature. I will not transcribe, nor do I believe, the stories of his fourteen pages, whose bellies were ripped open in search of a stolen melon, or of the beauteous slave whose head he severed from her body, to convince the Janissaries that their master was not the votary of love. 
His sobriety is attested by the silence of the Turkish annals, which accuse three, and three only, of the Ottoman line of the vice of drunkenness. But it cannot be denied that his passions were at once furious and inexorable, that in the palace, as in the field, a torrent of blood was spilt on the slightest provocation, and that the noblest of the captive youth were often dishonored by his unnatural lust. In the Albanian war he studied the lessons, and soon surpassed the example of his father, and the conquests of two empires, twelve kingdoms, and two hundred cities, a vain and flattering account, is ascribed to his invincible sword. He was doubtless a soldier, and possibly a general. Constantinople has sealed his glory, but if we compare the means, the obstacles, and the achievements, Mohammed II must blush to sustain a parallel with Alexander or Timur. Under his command, the Ottoman forces were always more numerous than their enemies, yet their progress was bounded by the Euphrates and the Adriatic, and his arms were checked by Huniades and Skanderbeg, by the Rhodian knights, and by the Persian king. In the reign of Amurath, he twice tasted of royalty, and twice descended from the throne. His tender age was incapable of opposing his father's restoration, but never could he forgive the viziers who had recommended that salutary measure. His nuptials were celebrated with the daughter of a Turkman emir, and after a festival of two months, he departed from Adrianople with his bride to reside in the government of Magnesia. Before the end of six weeks, he was recalled by a sudden message from the divan which announced the decease of Amurath and the mutinous spirit of the Janissaries. His speed and vigor commanded their obedience. He passed the Hellespont with a chosen guard, and at a distance of a mile from Adrianople, the viziers and emirs, the imams and cadiz, the soldiers and the people, fell prostrate before the new sultan. They affected to weep, they affected to rejoice. He ascended the throne at the age of twenty-one years, and removed the cause of sedition by the death, the inevitable death, of his infant brothers. The ambassadors of Europe and Asia soon appeared to congratulate his accession and to solicit his friendship, and to all he spoke the language of moderation and peace. The confidence of the Greek emperor was revived by the solemn oaths and fair assurances which he sealed with the ratification of the treaty, and a rich domain on the banks of the Strymon was assigned for the annual payment of 300,000 aspers, the pension of an Ottoman prince, who was detained at his request in the Byzantine court. Yet the neighbors of Mohammed might tremble at the severity with which a youthful monarch reformed the pomp of his father's household. The expenses of luxury were applied to those of ambition, and a useless train of 7,000 falconers were either dismissed from his service or enlisted in his troops. In the first summer of his reign, he visited with an army the Asiatic provinces, but after humbling the pride, Muhammad accepted the submission of the Karamanian that he might not be diverted by the slightest obstacle from the execution of his great design. The Mohammedan, and more especially the Turkish Kausists, have pronounced that no promise can bind the faithful against the interest and duty of their religion, and that the sultan may abrogate his own treaties and those of his predecessors. The justice and magnanimity of Amurath had scorned this immortal privilege, but his son, though the proudest of men, could stoop from ambition to the basest arts of dissimulation and deceit. Peace was on his lips while war was in his heart. He incessantly sighed for the possession of Constantinople, and the Greeks, by their own indiscretion, afforded the first pretense of the fatal rupture. Instead of laboring to be forgotten, their ambassadors pursued his camp to demand the payment, and even the increase of their annual stipend. The divan was importuned by their complaints, and the vizier, a secret friend of the Christians, was constrained to deliver the sense of his brethren. Ye foolish and miserable Romans, said Khalil. We know your devices, and ye are ignorant of your own danger. The scrupulous Amaroth is no more. His throne is occupied by a young conqueror, whom no laws can bind, and no obstacles can resist. And if you escape from his hands, give praise to the divine clemency, which yet delays the chastisement of your sins. Why do ye seek to affright us by vain and indirect menaces? Release the fugitive Orkhan, crown him Sultan of Romania, Call the Hungarians from beyond the Danube, 
arm against us all the nations of the West, and be assured that you will only provoke and precipitate your ruin. But if the fears of the ambassadors were alarmed by the stern language of the vizier, they were soothed by the courteous audience and friendly speeches of the Ottoman prince, and Mohammed assured them that on his return to Adrianople he would redress the grievances and consult the true interests of the Greeks. No sooner had he repassed the Hellespont than he issued a mandate to suppress their pension and to expel their officers from the banks of the Strymon. In this measure he betrayed a hostile mind. The second order announced, and in some degree commenced, the siege of Constantinople. In the narrow pass of the Bosphorus, an Asiatic fortress had formerly been raised by his grandfather, and in the opposite situation, on the European side, he resolved to erect a more formidable castle, and a thousand masons were commanded to assemble, in the spring, on a spot named Asomaton, about five miles from the Greek metropolis. Persuasion is the resource of the feeble, and the feeble can seldom persuade. The ambassadors of the emperor attempted, without success, to divert Mohammed from the execution of his design. They represented that his grandfather had solicited the permission of Manuel to build a castle on his own territories, but that this double fortification, which would command the strait, could only tend to violate the alliance of the nations, to intercept the Latins who traded in the Black Sea, and perhaps to annihilate the subsistence of the city. I form no enterprise, replied the perfidious sultan, against the city, but the empire of Constantinople is measured by her walls. Have you forgot the distress to which my father was reduced when you formed a league with the Hungarians, when they invaded our country by land, and the Hellespont was occupied by the French galleys? Emeroth was compelled to force the passage of the Bosphorus, and your strength was not equal to your malevolence. I was then a child at Adrianople. The Muslims trembled, and for a while the Gabors insulted our disgrace. But when my father had triumphed in the field of Varna, he vowed to erect a fort on the western shore, and that vow it is my duty to accomplish. Have ye the right, have ye the power to control my actions on my ground? For that ground is my own. As far as the shores of the Bosphorus, Asia is inhabited by the Turks, and Europe is deserted by the Romans. Return, and inform your king that the present Ottoman is far different from his predecessors, that his resolutions surpass their wishes, and that he performs more than they could resolve. Return in safety, but the next who delivers a similar message may expect to be flayed alive. After this declaration, Constantine, the first of the Greeks in spirit as in rank, had determined to unsheath the sword and to resist the approach and establishment of the Turks on the Bosphorus. He was disarmed by the advice of his civil and ecclesiastical ministers, who recommended a system less generous and even less prudent than his own, to approve with their patience and long-suffering, to brand the Ottoman with the name and guilt of an aggressor, and to depend on chance and time for their own safety, and the destruction of a fort which could not long be maintained in the neighborhood of a great and populous city. Amidst hope and fear, the fears of the wise, and the hopes of the credulous, the winter rolled away. The proper business of each man and each hour was postponed, and the Greeks shut their eyes against the impending danger, till the arrival of the spring, and the sultan, decided the assurance of their ruin. Of a master who never forgives, the orders are seldom disobeyed. On the 26th of March, the appointed spot of Asomaten was covered with an active swarm of Turkish artificers, and the materials by sea and land were diligently transported from Europe and Asia. The lime had been burnt in Catafrigia, the timber was cut down in the woods of Heraclea and Nicomedia, and the stones were dug from the Anatolian quarries. Each of the thousand masons were assisted by two workmen, and a measure of two cubits was marked for their daily task. The fortress was built in a triangular form. Each angle was flanked by a strong and massy tower, one on the declivity of the hill, two along the seashore. A thickness of twenty-two feet was assigned for the walls, thirty for the towers, and the whole building was covered with a solid platform of lead. Mohammed himself pressed and directed the work with indefatigable ardor. His three viziers declaimed the honor of finishing their respective towers. 
The zeal of the Cadiz emulated that of the Janizaries. The meanest labor was ennobled by the service of God and the Sultan, and the diligence of the multitude was quickened by the eye of, of the despot, whose smile was the hope of fortune, and whose frown was the messenger of death. The Greek emperor beheld with terror the irresistible progress of the work, and vainly strove by flattery and gifts to assuage an implacable foe, who sought, and secretly fomented, the slightest occasion of a quarrel. Such occasions must soon and inevitably be found. The ruins of stately churches, and even the marble columns which had been consecrated to St. Michael the Archangel, were employed without scruple by the profane and rapacious Muslims, and some Christians who presumed to oppose their removal received from their hands the crown of martyrdom. Constantine had solicited a Turkish guard to protect the fields and harvest of his subjects. The guard was fixed, but their first order was to allow free pasture to the mules and horses of the camp, and to defend their brethren if they should be molested by the natives. The retinue of an Ottoman chief had left their horses to pass the night among the ripe corn. The damage was felt, the insult was resented, and several of both nations were slain in a tumultuous conflict. Mohammed listened with joy to the complaint, and a detachment was commanded to exterminate the guilty village. The guilty had fled, but forty innocent and unsuspecting reapers were massacred by the soldiers. Till this provocation, Constantine had been open to the visits of commerce and curiosity. On the first alarm, the gates were shut, but the emperor, still anxious for peace, released on the third day his Turkish captives, and expressed, in a last message, the firm resignation of a Christian and a soldier. Since neither oaths nor treaty nor submission can secure peace, pursue, said he to Mohammed, your impious warfare. My trust is in God alone. If it should please him to mollify your heart, I shall rejoice in the happy change. If he delivers the city into your hands, I submit without a murmur to his holy will. But until the judge of the earth shall pronounce between us, it is my duty to live and die in the defense of my people. The sultan's answer was hostile and decisive. His fortifications were completed, and before his departure for Adrianople, he stationed a vigilant aga and four hundred janizaries to levy a tribute on the ships of every nation that should pass within the reach of their cannon. A Venetian vessel, refusing obedience to the new lords of the Bosphorus, was sunk with a single bullet. The master and thirty sailors escaped in a boat, but they were dragged in chains to the port. The chief was impaled, his companions were beheaded, and the historian Ducas beheld, at Demotica, their bodies exposed to the wild beasts. The siege of Constantinople was deferred to the ensuing spring, but an Ottoman army marched into the Moria to divert the force of the brothers of Constantine. At this era of calamity, one of these princes, the despot Thomas, was blessed or afflicted with the birth of a son. The last heir, says the plaintive Franza, of the last spark of the Roman Empire. The Greeks and Turks passed an anxious and sleepless winter. The former were kept awake by their fears, the latter by their hopes, both by the preparations of defense and attack. And the two emperors, who had the most to lose or to gain, were the most deeply affected by the national sentiment. In Mohammed that sentiment was inflamed by the ardor of his youth and temper. He amused his leisure with building at Adrianople the lofty palace of Jehan Numa, the watchtower of the world. But his serious thought was irrevocably bent on the conquest of the city of Caesar. At the dead of night, about the second watch, he started from his bed and commanded the instant attendance of his prime vizier. The message, the hour, the prince, and his own situation alarmed the guilty conscience of Khalil Basha, who had possessed the confidence and advised the restoration of Amurath. On the accession of the son, the vizier was confirmed in his office and the appearances of favor, but the veteran statesman was not insensible that he trod on a thin and slippery ice, which he might break under his footsteps and plunge him in the abyss. His friendship for the Christians, which might be innocent under the late reign, had stigmatized with the name of Gabor or Taki, or foster brother of the infidels, and his avarice entertained a venal and treasonable correspondence, which was detected and punished after the conclusion of the war. On receiving the royal mandate, he embraced, 
perhaps for the last time his wife and children, filled a cup with pieces of gold, hastened to the palace, adored the sultan, and offered, according to the oriental custom, the slight tribute of his duty and gratitude. It is not my wish, said Mohammed, to resume my gifts, but rather to heap and multiply them on thy head. In my turn, I ask a present far more valuable and important, Constantinople. As soon as the vizier had recovered from his surprise, The same God, said he, who has already given thee so large a portion of the Roman Empire, will not deny thee the remnant and the capital. His providence and thy power assure thy success, and myself, with the rest of thy faithful slaves, will sacrifice our lives and our fortunes. Lala, or preceptor, continued the sultan, do you see this pillow? All the night, in my agitation, I have pulled it on one side and the other. I have risen from my bed. Again I have laid down. Yet sleep has not visited these weary eyes. Beware of the gold and silver of the Romans. In arms we are superior, and with the aid of God and the prayers of the prophet we shall speedily become masters of Constantinople. To sound the disposition of his soldiers, he often wandered through the streets alone and in disguise, and it was fatal to discover the sultan when he wished to escape from the vulgar eye. His hours were spent in delineating the plan of the hostile city, in debating with his generals and engineers on what spot he should erect his batteries, on which side he should assault the walls, where he should spring his mines, to what place he should apply his scaling ladders, and the exercises of the day repeated and proved the lucubrations of the night. Among the implements of destruction, he studied with peculiar care the recent and tremendous discovery of the Latins, and his artillery surpassed whatever had yet appeared in the world. A founder of cannon, a Dane or Hungarian, who had been almost starved in the Greek service, deserted to the Muslims, and was liberally entertained by the Turkish sultan. Mohammed was satisfied with the answer to his first question, which he eagerly pressed on the artist. Am I able to cast a cannon capable of throwing a ball or stone of sufficient size to batter the walls of Constantinople? I am not ignorant of their strength, but were they more solid than those of Babylon, I could oppose an engine of superior power. The position and management of that engine must be left to your engineers. On this assurance a foundry was established at Adrianople, the metal was prepared, and at the end of three months Urban produced a piece of brass ordinance of stupendous and almost incredible magnitude. A measure of twelve palms is assigned to the bore and the stone bullet weighed almost six hundred pounds. A vacant place before the new palace was chosen for the first experiment, but to prevent the sudden and mischievous effects of astonishment and fear, a proclamation was issued that the cannon would be discharged the ensuing day. The explosion was felt, or heard, in a circuit of a hundred furlongs. The ball, by the force of gunpowder, was driven about a mile, and on the spot where it fell, it buried itself a fathom deep in the ground. For the conveyance of this destructive engine, a frame or carriage of thirty wagons was linked together, and drawn by a train of sixty oxen. Two hundred men on both sides were stationed to poise and support the rolling weight. Two hundred and fifty workmen marched before, to smooth the way and repair the bridges, and near two months were employed in a laborious journey of one hundred and fifty miles. A lively philosopher derides on this occasion the credulity of the Greeks, and observes, with much reason, that we should always distrust the exaggerations of a vanquished people. He calculates that a ball, even of two hundred pounds, would require a charge of one hundred and fifty pounds of powder, and that the stroke would be feeble and impotent, since not a fifteenth part of the mass could be inflamed at the same moment. A stranger as I am, to the art of destruction, I can discern that the modern improvements of artillery prefer the number of pieces to the weight of metal, the quickness of the fire to the sound, or even the consequences of a single explosion. Yet I dare not reject the positive and unanimous evidence of contemporary writers, nor can it seem improbable that the first artists, in their rude and ambitious efforts, should have transgressed the standard of moderation. A Turkish cannon, more enormous than that of Mohammed, still guards the entrance to the Dardanelles, 
and if the use be inconvenient, it has been found on a late trial that the effect was far from contemptible. A stone bullet of 1,100 pounds weight was once discharged with 330 pounds of powder. At the distance of 600 yards, it shivered into three rocky fragments, traversed the strait, and, leaving the waters in a foam, rose again and bounded against the opposite hill. While Muhammad threatened the capital of the east, the Greek emperor employed with fervent prayers the assistance of earth and heaven. But the invisible powers were deaf to his supplications, and Christendom beheld with indifference the fall of Constantinople, while she derived at least some promise of supply from the jealous and temporal policy of the Sultan of Egypt. Some states were too weak, others too remote. By some the danger was considered as imaginary, by others as inevitable. The western princes were involved in their endless and domestic quarrels, and the Roman pontiff was exasperated by the falsehood or obstinacy of the Greeks. Instead of employing in their favor the arms and treasures of Italy, Nicholas V had foretold their approaching ruin, and his honor was engaged in the accomplishment of his prophecy. Perhaps he was softened by the last extremity of their distress, but his compassion was tardy, his efforts were faint and unavailing, and Constantinople had fallen before the squadrons of Genoa and Venice could sail from their harbors. Even the princes of the Moria and of the Greek islands affected a cold neutrality. The Genoese colony of Galata negotiated a private treaty, and the sultan indulged them in the delusive hope that by his clemency they might survive the ruin of the empire. A plebeian crowd and some Byzantine nobles basely withdrew from the danger of their country, and the avarice of the rich denied the emperor, and reserved for the Turks, the secret treasures which might have raised in their defense whole armies of mercenaries. The indigent and solitary prince prepared, however, to sustain his formidable adversary. But if his courage was equal to the peril, his strength was inadequate to the contest. In the beginning of the spring, the Turkish vanguard swept the towns and villages as far as the gates of Constantinople. Submission was spared and protected. Whatever presumed to resist was exterminated with fire and sword. The Greek places on the Black Sea, Mesambria, Achaeolium, and Bizon, surrendered on the first summons. Salimbria alone deserved the honors of a siege or blockade, and the bold inhabitants, while they were invested by land, launched their boats, pillaged the opposite coast of Cyzicus, and sold their captives in the public market. But on the approach of Muhammad himself, all was silent and prostrate. He first halted at the distance of five miles, and from thence, advancing in battle array, planted before the gate of St. Romanus, the imperial standard, and on the sixth day of April, formed the memorable siege of Constantinople. The troops of Asia and Europe extended on the right and left from the Propontis to the harbor. The Janissaries in the front were stationed before the Sultan's tent. The Ottoman line was covered by a deep entrenchment, and a subordinate army enclosed the suburb of Galata, and watched the doubtful faith of the Genoese. The inquisitive Philelphus, who resided in Greece about thirty years before the siege, is confident that all the Turkish forces of any name or value could not exceed the number of 60,000 horse and 20,000 foot, and he abrades the pusillanimity of the nations who had tamely yielded to a handful of barbarians. Such indeed might have been the regular establishment of the Capaculi, the troops of the port, who marched with the prince and were paid from his royal treasury. But the Bashaws and their respective governments maintained or levied a provincial militia, Many lands were held by a military tenure, many volunteers were attracted by the hope of spoil, and the sound of the holy trumpet invited a swarm of hungry and fearless fanatics, who might contribute at least to multiply the terrors, and in a first attack to blunt the swords of the Christians. The whole mass of the Turkish powers is magnified by Ducas, Chalcocondiles, and Leonard of Chios, to the amount of three or four hundred thousand men. But Franza was a less remote and more accurate judge, and his precise definition of 258,000 does not exceed the measure of experience and probability. The navy of the besiegers was less formidable. The Propontis was overspread with 320 sail, but of these no more than 18 could be rated as galleys of war, and the far greater part must be degraded to the condition of storeships and transports, 
which poured into the camp fresh supplies of men, ammunition, and provisions. In her last decay, Constantinople was still peopled with more than a hundred thousand inhabitants. But these numbers are found in the accounts, not of war, but of captivity, and they mostly consisted of mechanics, of priests, of women, and of men devoid of that spirit which even women have sometimes exerted for the common safety. I can suppose, I could almost excuse, the reluctance of subjects to serve on a distant frontier, at the will of a tyrant. But the man who dares not expose his life in the defense of his children and his property has lost in society the first and most active energies of nature. By the emperor's command, a particular inquiry had been made through the streets and houses, how many of the citizens, or even of the monks, were able and willing to bear arms for their country. The lists were entrusted to Franza, and after a diligent addition, he informed his master, with grief and surprise, that the national defense was reduced to 4,970 Romans. Between Constantine and his faithful minister, this comfortless secret was preserved, and a sufficient proportion of shields, crossbows, and muskets were distributed from the arsenal to the city bands. They derived some accession from a body of 2,000 strangers under the command of John Justiniani, a noble Genoese. A liberal donative was advanced to these auxiliaries, and a princely recompense, the Isle of Lemnos, was promised to the valor and victory of their chief. A strong chain was drawn across the mouth of the harbor. It was supported by some Greek and Italian vessels of war and merchandise, and the ships of every Christian nation that successively arrived from Candia and the Black Sea were detained for the public service. Against the powers of the Ottoman Empire, a city of the extent of thirteen, perhaps of sixteen miles, was defended by a scanty garrison of seven or eight thousand soldiers. Europe and Asia were open to the besiegers, but the strength and provisions of the Greeks must sustain a daily decrease, nor could they indulge the expectations of any foreign succor or supply. The primitive Romans would have drawn their swords in the resolution of death or conquest. The primitive Christians might have embraced each other and awaited in patience and charity the stroke of martyrdom. But the Greeks of Constantinople were animated only by the spirit of religion, and that spirit was productive only of animosity and discord. Before his death, the emperor John Paleologus had renounced the unpopular measure of a union with the Latins, nor was the idea revived till the distress of his brother Constantine imposed a last trial of flattery and dissimulation. With the demand of temporal aid, his ambassadors were instructed to mingle the assurance of spiritual obedience. His neglect of the church was excused by the urgent cares of the state, and his orthodox wishes solicited the presence of a Roman legate. The Vatican had been too often deluded, yet the signs of repentance could not be decently overlooked. A legate was more easily granted than an army, and about six months before the final destruction, the Cardinal Isidore of Russia appeared in that character with a retinue of priests and soldiers. The Emperor saluted him as a friend and father, respectfully listened to his public and private sermons, and with the most obsequious of the clergy and laymen subscribed the Act of Union, as it had been ratified in the Council of Florence. On the 12th of December, the two nations, in the Church of St. Sophia, joined in the communion of sacrifice and prayer, and the names of the two pontiffs were solemnly commemorated, the names of Nicholas V, the Vicar of Christ, and of the Patriarch Gregory, who had been driven into exile by a rebellious people. But the dress and language of the Latin priest who officiated at the altar were an object of scandal. It was observed with horror that he consecrated a cake or a wafer of unleavened bread, and poured cold water into a cup of the sacrament. A national historian acknowledges with a blush that none of his countrymen, nor the emperor himself, were sincere in this occasional conformity. Their hasty and unconditional submission was palliated by a promise of future revisal. But the best, or the worst of their excuses, was the confession of their own perjury. When they were pressed by the reproaches of their honest brethren, have patience, they whispered, have patience till God, 
shall have delivered the city from the great dragon who seeks to devour us. You shall then perceive whether we are truly reconciled with the Azimites. But patience is not the attribute of zeal, nor can the arts of a court be adapted to the freedom and violence of popular enthusiasm. From the dome of St. Sophia, the inhabitants of either sex, and of every degree, rushed in crowds to the cell of the monk Gennadius, to consult the oracle of the church. The holy man was invisible, entranced, as it should seem, in deep meditation, or divine rapture, but he had exposed on the door of his cell a speaking tablet, and they successively withdrew after reading these tremendous words. O oh, miserable Romans! Why will ye abandon the truth? And why, instead of confiding in God, will ye put your trust in the Italians? In losing your faith, you will lose your city. Have mercy on me, O Lord! I protest in thy presence that I am innocent of the crime. O oh, miserable Romans, consider, pause, and repent. At the same moment that you renounce the religion of your fathers by embracing impiety, you submit to a foreign servitude. According to the advice of Gennadius, the religious virgins, as pure as angels and as proud as demons, rejected the active union and abjured all communion with the present and future associates of the Latins and their example was applauded and imitated by the greatest part of the clergy and people. From the monastery, the devout Greeks dispersed themselves in the taverns, drank confusion to the slaves of the Pope, emptied their glasses in honor of the image of the Holy Virgin, and besought her to defend against Mohammed the city, which she had formerly saved from Kosaris and the Chagan. In the double intoxication of zeal and wine, they valiantly exclaimed, what occasion have we for succor, or union, or Latins? Far from us be the worship of the Azimites. During the winter there preceded the Turkish conquest, the nation was distracted by this epidemical frenzy, and the season of Lent, the approach of Easter, instead of breathing charity and love, served only to fortify the obstinacy and influence of the zealots. The confessors scrutinized and alarmed the conscience of their votaries and a rigorous penance was imposed on those who had received a communion from a priest who had given an express or tacit consent to the union. His service at the altar propagated the infection to the mute and simple spectators of the ceremony. They forfeited, by the impure spectacle, the virtue of the sacerdotal character, nor was it lawful, even in danger of sudden death, to invoke the insistence of their prayers or absolution. No sooner had the church of St. Sophia been polluted by the Latin sacrifice than it was deserted as a Jewish synagogue or a heathen temple by the clergy and people, and a vast and gloomy silence prevailed in that venerable dome, which had so often smoked with a cloud of incense, blazed with innumerable lights, and resounded with the voice of prayer and thanksgiving. The Latins were the most odious of heretics and infidels, and the first minister of the empire, the great duke, was heard to declare that he would rather behold in Constantinople the turban of Mohammed than the Pope's tiara or a cardinal's hat. A sentiment so unworthy of Christians and patriots was familiar and fatal to the Greeks. The emperor was deprived of the affection and support of his subjects, and their native cowardice was sanctified by resignation to the divine decree or the visionary hope of a miraculous deliverance. Of the triangle which composes the figure of Constantinople, the two sides along the sea were made inaccessible to an enemy, the Propontis by nature and the harbor by art. Between the two waters, the basis of the triangle, the land side, was protected by a double wall and a deep ditch of the depth of one hundred feet. Against this line of fortification, which Franza, an eyewitness, prolongs to the measure of six miles, the Ottomans directed their principal attack and the emperor, after distributing the service and command of the most perilous stations, undertook the defense of the external wall. In the first days of the siege, the Greek soldiers descended into the ditch, or sallied into the field, but they soon discovered that, in the proportion of their numbers, one Christian was of more value than twenty Turks, and after these bold preludes, they were prudently content to maintain the rampart with their missile weapons. Nor should this prudence be accused of pusillanimity. The nation was indeed pusillanimous and base, 
but the last Constantine deserves the name of a hero. His noble band of volunteers was inspired with Roman virtue, and the foreign auxiliaries supported the honor of the western chivalry. The incessant volleys of lances and arrows were accompanied with the smoke, the sound, and the fire of their musketry and cannon. Their small arms discharged at the same time either five or even ten balls of lead, of the size of a walnut, and according to the closeness of the ranks and the force of the powder, several breastplates and bodies were transpierced by the same shot. But the Turkish approaches were soon sunk in trenches or covered with ruins. Each day added to the science of the Christians, but their inadequate stock of gunpowder was wasted in the operations of each day. Their ordnance was not powerful either in size or number, and if they possessed some heavy cannon, they feared to plant them on the walls, lest the aged structure should be shaken and overthrown by the explosion. The same destructive secret had been revealed to the Muslims, by whom it was employed with the superior energy of zeal, riches, and despotism. The great canon of Mohammed has been separately noticed, an important and visible object in the history of the times. But that enormous engine was flanked by two fellows almost of equal magnitude. The long order of the Turkish artillery was pointed against the walls. Fourteen batteries thundered at once on the most accessible places, and of one of these it is ambiguously expressed that it was mounted with 130 guns, or that it discharged 130 bullets. Yet, in the power and activity of the Sultan, we may discern the infancy of the new science. Under a master who counted the moments, the great cannon could be loaded and fired no more than seven times in one day. The heated metal unfortunately burst, several workmen were destroyed, and the skill of an artist was admired who bethought himself of preventing the danger and the accident by pouring oil after each explosion into the mouth of the cannon. The first random shots were productive of more sound than effect and it was by the advice of a Christian that the engineers were taught to level their aim against the two opposite sides of the salient angles of a bastion. However imperfect, the weight and repetition of the fire made some impression on the walls, and the Turks, pushing their approaches to the edge of the ditch, attempted to fill the enormous chasm and to build a road to the assault. Innumerable fascines and hogsheads and trunks of trees were heaped on each other, and such was the impetuosity of the throng that the foremost and the weakest were pushed headlong into the precipice and instantly buried under the accumulated mass. To fill the ditch was the toil of the besiegers, to clear away the rubbish was the safety of the besieged, and, after a long and bloody conflict, the web that had been woven in the day was still unraveled in the night. The next resource of Mohammed was the practice of mines, but the soil was rocky, in every attempt he was stopped and undermined by the Christian engineers, nor had the art been yet invented of replenishing those subterraneous passages with gunpowder and blowing whole towers and cities into the air. A circumstance that distinguishes the siege of Constantinople is the reunion of the ancient and modern artillery. The cannons were intermingled with the mechanical engines of forecasting stones and darts. The bullet and the battering ram were directed against the same walls, nor had the discovery of gunpowder superseded the use of the liquid and unextinguishable fire. A wooden turret of the largest size was advanced on rollers. This portable magazine of ammunition and fascines was protected by a threefold covering of bull's hides. Incessant volleys were securely discharged from the loopholes. In the front, Three doors were contrived for the alternate sally and retreat of the soldiers and workmen. They ascended by a staircase to the upper platform, and as high as the level of that platform, a scaling ladder could be raised by pulleys to form a bridge and grapple with the adverse rampart. By these various arts of annoyance, some as new as they were pernicious to the Greeks, the tower of St. Romanus was at length overturned. After a severe struggle, the Turks were repulsed from the breach and interrupted by darkness. But they trusted that with the return of light they should renew the attack with fresh vigor and decisive success. Of this pause of action, this interval of hope, each moment was improved by the activity of the emperor and Justiniani, who passed the night on the spot and urged the labors which involved the safety of the church and city. 
at the dawn of day, the impatient sultan perceived, with astonishment and grief, that his wooden turret had been reduced to ashes, the ditch was cleared and restored, and the tower of St. Romanus was again strong and entire. He deplored the failure of his design, and uttered a profane exclamation, that the word of the thirty-seven thousand prophets should not have compelled him to believe that such a work, in so short a time, could have been accomplished by the infidels. The generosity of the Christian princes was cold and tardy, but in the first apprehension of a siege, Constantine had negotiated, in the isles of the archipelago, the Moria, and Sicily, the most indispensable supplies. As early as the beginning of April, five great ships, equipped for merchandise and war, would have sailed from the harbor of Chios, had not the wind blown obstinately from the north. One of these ships bore the imperial flag, the remaining four belonging to the Genoese, and they were laden with wheat and barley, with wine, oil, and vegetables, and above all with soldiers and mariners, for the service of the capital. After a tedious delay, a gentle breeze, and on the second day a strong gale from the south, carried them through the Hellespont and the Propontis, but the city was already invested by sea and land, and the Turkish fleet, at the entrance of the Bosphorus, was stretched from shore to shore, in the form of a crescent, to intercept, or at least to repel, these bold auxiliaries. The reader, who has present to his mind the geographical picture of Constantinople, will conceive and admire the greatness of the spectacle. The five Christian ships continued to advance with joyful shouts, and a full press both of sails and oars, against a hostile fleet of three hundred vessels, and the rampart, the camp, the coasts of Europe and Asia, were lined with innumerable spectators, who anxiously awaited the event of this momentous succor. At the first view, that event could not appear doubtful. The superiority of the Moslems was beyond all measure or account, and, in a calm, their numbers and valor must inevitably have prevailed. But their hasty and imperfect navy had been created, not by the genius of the people, but by the will of the sultan. In the height of their prosperity, the Turks have acknowledged that, if God had given them the earth, he had left the sea to the infidels. And a series of defeats, a rapid progress of decay, has established the truth of their modest confession. Except eighteen galleys of some force, the rest of their fleet consisted of open boats, rudely constructed and awkwardly managed, crowded with troops and destitute of cannon, and since courage arises in a great measure from the consciousness of strength, the bravest of the Janissaries might tremble on a new element. In the Christian squadron five stout and lofty ships were guided by skillful pilots, and manned with the veterans of Italy and Greece, long practiced in the arts and perils of the sea. Their weight was directed to sink, or scatter the weak obstacles that impeded their passage. Their artillery swept the waters. Their liquid fire was poured on the heads of the adversaries, who, with the design of boarding, presumed to approach them, and the winds and waves were always on the side of the ablest navigators. In this conflict the imperial vessel, which had almost been overpowered, was rescued by the Genoese, but the Turks, in a distant and closer attack, were twice repulsed with considerable loss. Mohammed himself sat on horseback on the beach to encourage their valor by his voice and presence, by the promise of reward, and by fear more potent than fear of the enemy. The passions of his soul, and even the gestures of his body, seemed to intimate the actions of the combatants, and, as if he had been the lord of nature, he spurred his horse with a fearless and impotent effort into the sea. His loud reproaches and the clamors of the camp urged the Ottomans to a third attack, more fatal and bloody than the two former, and I must repeat, though I cannot credit the evidence of Franza, who affirms, from their own mouth, that they lost above twelve thousand men in the slaughter of the day. They fled in disorder to the shores of Europe and Asia, while the Christian squadron, triumphant and unhurt, steered along the Bosphorus, and securely anchored within the chain of the harbor. In the confidence of victory, they boasted that the whole Turkish power must have yielded to their arms, but the admiral, or Captain Bashal, found some consolation from a painful wound in his eye by representing that accident as the cause of his defeat. Baltha Ogli was a renegade of the race of the Bulgarian princes. His military character was tainted with the unpopular vice of avarice, and under the despotism of the prince or people, misfortune is a sufficient evidence of guilt. 
his rank and services were annihilated by the displeasure of Mohammed. In the royal presence, the Captain Bashal was extended on the ground by four slaves, and received one hundred strokes with a golden rod. His death had been pronounced, and he adorned the clemency of the sultan, who was satisfied with the milder punishment of confiscation and exile. The introduction of this supply revived the hopes of the Greeks, and accused the supineness of their western allies. Amidst the deserts of Anatolia and the rocks of Palestine, the millions of the crusaders had buried themselves in a voluntary and inevitable grave. But the situation of the imperial city was strong against her enemies, and accessible to her friends, and a rational and moderate armament of the maritime states might have saved the relics of the Roman name, and maintained a Christian fortress in the heart of the Ottoman Empire. Yet this was the sole and feeble attempt for the deliverance of Constantinople. The more distant powers were insensible to its danger, and the ambassador of Hungary, or at least of Huniades, resided in the Turkish camp, to remove the fears and to direct the operations of the sultan. It was difficult for the Greeks to penetrate the secret of the divan, yet the Greeks are persuaded that a resistance so obstinate and surpassing had fatigued the perseverance of Mohammed. He began to mediate a retreat, and the siege would have been speedily raised if the ambition and jealousy of the second vizier had not opposed the perfidious advice of Khalil Basha, who still maintained a secret correspondence with the Byzantine court. The reduction of the city appeared to be hopeless, unless a double attack could be made from the harbor as well as from the land. But the harbor was inaccessible, and impenetrable chain was now defended with eight large ships, more than twenty of a smaller size, and several galleys and sloops, and instead of forcing this barrier, the Turks might apprehend a naval sally and a second encounter in the open sea. In this perplexity, the genius of Mohammed conceived and executed a plan of a bold and marvelous cast, of transporting by land his lighter vessels and military stores from the Bosphorus into the higher part of the harbor. The distance is about ten miles, the ground is uneven, and was overspread with thickets, and as the road must be opened behind the suburb of Galata, their free passage or total destruction must depend on the option of the Genoese. But these selfish merchants were ambitious of the favor of being the last devoured, and the deficiency of art was supplied by the strength of obedient myriads. A level way was covered with a broad platform of strong and solid planks, and to render them more slippery and smooth, they were anointed with the fat of sheep and oxen. Fourscore light galleys and brigantines of fifty and thirty oars were disembarked on the Bosphorus shore, arranged successively on rollers, and drawn forth by the power of men and pulleys. Two guides or pilots were stationed at the helm and the prow of each vessel. The sails were unfurled to the winds, and the labor was cheered by song and acclamation. In the course of a single night, this Turkish fleet painfully climbed the hill, steered over the plain, and was launched from the declivity into the shallow waters of the harbor, far above the molestation of the deeper vessels of the Greeks. The real importance of this operation was magnified by the consternation and confidence which it inspired. But the notorious, unquestionable fact was displayed before the eyes and is recorded by the pens of the two nations. A similar stratagem had been repeatedly practiced by the ancients. The Ottoman galleys, I must again repeat, should be considered as large boats, and if we compare the magnitude and the distance, the obstacles and the means, the boasted miracle has perhaps been equaled by the industry of our own times. As soon as Mohammed had occupied the upper harbor with the fleet and army, he constructed in the narrowest part a bridge, or rather mole, of fifty cubits in breadth and one hundred in length. It was formed of casks and hogsheads, joined with rafters, linked with iron, and covered with a solid floor. On this floating battery he planted one of his largest cannon, while the fourscore galleys with troops and scaling ladders approached the most accessible side, which had formerly been stormed by the Latin conquerors. The indolence of the Christians has been accused for not destroying these unfinished works, but their fire, by a superior fire, was controlled and silenced, nor were they wanting in a nocturnal attempt to burn the vessels as well as the bridge of the sultan. His vigilance prevented their approach, their foremost galleots were sunk or taken. Forty youths, 
the bravest of Italy and Greece, were inhumanly massacred at his command. Nor could the emperor's grief be assuaged by the just, though cruel, retaliation of exposing from the walls the heads of two hundred and sixty Mussulman captives. After a siege of forty days, the fate of Constantinople could no longer be averted. The diminutive garrison was exhausted by a double attack. The fortifications, which had stood for ages against hostile violence, were dismantled on all sides by the Ottoman cannon. Many breaches were opened, and near the gate of St. Romanus four towers had been leveled with the ground. For the payment of his feeble and mutinous troops, Constantine was compelled to despoil the churches with the promise of a fourfold restitution, and his sacrilege offered a new reproach to the enemies of the Union. A spirit of discord impaired the remnant of the Christian strength. The Genoese and Venetian auxiliaries asserted the preeminence of their respective service, and Justiniani and the great duke, whose ambition was not extinguished by the common danger, accused each other of treachery and cowardice. During the siege of Constantinople, the words of peace and capitulation had been sometimes pronounced, and several embassies had passed between the camp and the city. The Greek emperor was humbled by adversity, and would have yielded to any terms compatible with religion and royalty. The Turkish sultan was desirous of sparing the blood of his soldiers, still more desirous of securing for his own use the Byzantine treasures, and he accomplished a sacred duty in presenting to the Gabors the choice of circumcision, of tribute, or of death. The avarice of Mohammed might have been satisfied with an annual sum of 100,000 ducats, but his ambition grasped to the capital of the East. To the prince he offered a rich equivalent, to the people a free toleration, or a safe departure. But after some fruitless treaty, he declared his resolution of finding either a throne or a grave under the walls of Constantinople. A sense of honor, and the fear of universal reproach, forbade Palaeologus to resign the city into the hands of the Ottomans, and he determined to abide the last extremities of war. Several days were employed by the sultan in the preparations of the assault, and a respite was granted by his favorite science of astrology, which had fixed on the 29th of May as the fortunate and fatal hour. On the evening of the 27th, he issued his final orders, assembled in his presence the military chiefs, and dispersed his heralds through the camp to proclaim the duty and the motives of the perilous enterprise. Fear is the first principle of a despotic government, and his menaces were expressed in the oriental style, that the fugitives and deserters, had they the wings of a bird, should not escape from his inexorable justice. The greater part of his bashaws and janizaries were the offspring of Christian parents, but the glories of the Turkish name were perpetuated by successive adoption, and in the gradual change of individuals, the spirit of a legion, a regiment, or of an oda, is kept alive by imitation and discipline. In this holy warfare, the Muslims were exhorted to purify their minds with prayer, their bodies with seven ablutions, and to abstain from food till the close of the ensuing day. A crowd of dervishes visited the tents to instill the desire of martyrdom, and the assurance of spending an immortal youth amidst the rivers and gardens of paradise, and in the embraces of the black-eyed virgins. Yet Mohammed principally trusted to the efficacy of temporal and visible rewards. A double pay was promised to the victorious troops. The city and the buildings, said Mohammed, are mine, but I resign to your valor the captives and the spoil, the treasures of gold and beauty. Be rich and be happy. Many are the provinces in my empire. The intrepid soldier who first ascends the walls of Constantinople shall be rewarded with the government of the fairest and most wealthy, and my gratitude shall accumulate his honors and fortunes above the measure of his own hopes. Such various and potent motives diffused among the Turks a general ardor, regardless of life, and impatient for action. The camp re-echoed with the Muslim shouts of, God is God, there is but one God, and Mohammed is the Apostle of God. And the sea and land, from Galata to the Seven Towers, were illuminated by the blaze of their nocturnal fires. Far different was the state of the Christians, who, with loud and impotent complaints, deplored the guilt or the punishment of their sins. The celestial image of the Virgin had been exposed in solemn procession, but their divine patroness was deaf to their entreaties. They accused the obstinacy of the emperor for refusing a timely surrender, 
anticipated the horrors of their fate, and sighed for the repose and security of Turkish servitude. The noblest of the Greeks and the bravest of the allies were summoned to the palace to prepare them on the evening of the 28th for the duties and dangers of the general assault. The last speech of Paleologus was the funeral oration of the Roman Empire. He promised, he conjured, he vainly attempted to infuse the hope which was extinguished in his own mind. In this world all was comfortless and gloomy, and neither the gospel nor the church have proposed any conspicuous recompense to the heroes who fall in the service of their country. But the example of their prince and the confinement of a siege had armed these warriors with the courage of despair, and the pathetic scene is described by the feelings of the historian Franza, who was himself present at this mournful assembly. They wept, they embraced, regardless of their families and fortunes, they devoted their lives, and each commander, departing to his station, maintained all night a vigilant and anxious watch on the rampart. The emperor and some faithful companions entered the dome of St. Sophia, which in a few hours was to be converted into a mosque, and devoutly received with tears and prayers the sacrament of the Holy Communion. He reposed some moments in the palace, which resounded with cries and lamentation, solicited the pardon of all whom he might have injured, and mounted on horseback to visit the guards, to explore the motions of the enemy. The distress and fall of the last Constantine was more glorious than the long prosperity of the Byzantine Caesars. In the confusion of darkness, an assailant may sometimes succeed, but in this great and general attack, the military judgment and astrological knowledge of Mohammed advised him to expect the morning, the memorable 29th of May, in the 1453rd year of the Christian era. The preceding night had been strenuously employed. The troops, the cannon, and the fascines were advanced to the edge of the ditch, which in many parts presented a smooth and level passage to the breach, and his fourscore galleys almost touched with the prows and their scaling ladders the less defensible walls of the harbor. Under pain of death, silence was enjoined, but the physical laws of motion and sound are not obedient to discipline or fear. Each individual might suppress his voice and measure his footsteps but the march and labor of thousands must inevitably produce a strange confusion of dissonant clamors which reached the ears of the watchmen of the towers. At daybreak, without the customary signal of the morning gun, the Turks assaulted the city by sea and land, and the similitude of a twined or twisted thread has been applied to the closeness and continuity of their line of attack. The foremost ranks consisted of the refuse of the host, a voluntary crowd who fought without order or command. Of the feebleness of age or childhood, of peasants and vagrants, and of all who had joined the camp in the blind hope of plunder and martyrdom, the common impulse drove them onwards to the wall. The most audacious to climb were instantly precipitated, and not a dart nor a bullet of the Christians was idly wasted on the accumulated throng. But their strength and ammunition were exhausted in this laborious defense. The ditch was filled with the bodies of the slain, and they supported the footsteps of their companions, and of this devoted vanguard the death was more serviceable than the life. Under the respective Beshaws and Sanjaks, the troops of Anatolia and Romania were successively led to the charge. Their progress was various and doubtful, but after a conflict of two hours the Greeks still maintained and improved their advantage, and the voice of the emperor was heard encouraging his soldiers to achieve, by a last effort, the deliverance of their country. At that fatal moment, the Janissaries arose, fresh, vigorous, and invincible. The sultan himself on horseback, with an iron mace in his hand, was the spectator and judge of their valor. He was surrounded by ten thousand of his domestic troops, whom he reserved for the decisive occasion, and the tide of battle was directed and impelled by his voice and eye. His numerous ministers of justice were posted behind the line to urge, to restrain, and to punish, and if danger was in the front, shame and inevitable death were in the rear of the fugitives. The cries of fear and of pain were drowned in the martial music of drums, trumpets, and atabals, and experience has proved that the mechanical operations of sounds, by quickening the circulation of the blood and spirits, will act on the human machine more forcibly than the eloquence of reason and honor. 
From the lines, the galleys, and the bridge, the Ottoman artillery thundered on all sides, and the camp and city, the Greeks and the Turks, were involved in a cloud of smoke, which could only be dispelled by the final deliverance or destruction of the Roman Empire. The single combats of the heroes of history or fable amuse our fancy and engage our affections. The skilled evolutions of war may inform the mind and improve a necessary though pernicious science. But in the uniform and odious pictures of a general assault, all is blood and horror and confusion. Nor shall I strive, at the distance of three centuries and a thousand miles, to delineate a scene of which there could be no spectators, and of which the actors themselves were incapable of forming any just or adequate idea. The immediate loss of Constantinople may be ascribed to the bullet or arrow which pierced the gauntlet of John Justiniani. The sight of his blood and the exquisite pain appalled the courage of the chief, whose arms and counsels were the firmest rampart of the city. As he withdrew from his station in quest of a surgeon, his flight was perceived and stopped by the indefatigable emperor. "'Your wound,' exclaimed Paleologus, "'is slight. The danger is pressing. Your presence is necessary. And whither will you retire?' "'I will retire,' said the trembling Genoese, "'by the same road which God has opened to the Turks.' And at these words he hastily passed through one of the breaches of the inner wall. By this pusillanimous act he stained the honors of a military life, and the few days which he survived in Galata or the Isle of Chios were embittered by his own and the public reproach. His example was imitated by the greatest part of the Latin auxiliaries, and the defense began to slacken when the attack was pressed with redoubled vigor. The number of the Ottomans was fifty, perhaps a hundred times superior to that of the Christians. The double walls were reduced by the cannon to a heap of ruins. In a circuit of several miles, some places must be found more easy of access or more feebly guarded, and if the besiegers could penetrate in a single point, the whole city was irrecoverably lost. The first who deserved the Sultan's reward was Hassan the Janizary, of gigantic stature and strength. With his scimitar in one hand, and his buckler in the other, he ascended the outward fortifications. Of the thirty Janizaries who were emulous of his valor, eighteen perished in the bold adventure. Hassan and his twelve companions had reached the summit. The giant was precipitated from the rampart. He rose on one knee, and was again oppressed by a shower of darts and stones. But his success had proved that the achievement was possible. The walls and towers were instantly covered with a swarm of Turks and the Greeks, now driven from the vantage ground, were overwhelmed by the increasing multitudes. Amidst these multitudes, the emperor, who accomplished all the duties of a general and a soldier, was long seen and finally lost. The nobles who fought round his person sustained, till their last breath, the honorable names of Paleologus and Cantacuzene. His mournful exclamation was heard, Cannot there be found a Christian to cut off my head? and his last fear was that of falling alive into the hands of the infidels. The prudent despair of Constantine cast away the purple. Amidst the tumult he fell by an unknown hand, and his body was buried under a mountain of the slain. After his death, resistance and order were no more. The Greeks fled towards the city, and many were pressed and stifled in the narrow pass of the gate of St. Romanus. The victorious Turks rushed through the breaches of the inner wall, and as they advanced into the streets, they were soon joined by their brethren, who had forced the gate Fenar on the side of the harbor. In the first heat of the pursuit, about two thousand Christians were put to the sword, but avarice soon prevailed over cruelty, and the victors acknowledged that they should immediately have given quarter, if the valor of the emperor and his chosen band had not prepared them for a similar opposition in every part of the capital. It was thus, after a siege of fifty-three days, that Constantinople, which had defied the power of Chosures, of the Chagan, and the Caliphs, was irretrievably subdued by the arms of Mohammed II. Her empire only had been subverted by the Latins. Her religion was trampled in the dust by the Muslim conquerors. The tidings of misfortune fly with a rapid wing, yet such was the extent of Constantinople that the more distant quarters might prolong some moments the happy ignorance of their ruin. But in the general consternation, in the feelings of selfish or social anxiety, 
in the tumult and thunder of the assault, a sleepless night and morning must have elapsed. Nor can I believe that many Grecian ladies were awakened by the Janissaries from a sound and tranquil slumber. On the assurance of the public calamity, the houses and convents were instantly deserted, and the trembling inhabitants flocked together in the streets, like a herd of timid animals, as if accumulated weakness could be productive of strength, or in the vain hope that amid the crowd each individual might be safe and invisible. From every part of the capital they flowed into the church of St. Sophia. In the space of an hour, the sanctuary, the choir, the nave, the upper and lower galleries, were filled with the multitudes of fathers and husbands, of women and children, of priests, monks, and religious virgins. The doors were barred on the inside, and they sought protection from the sacred dome which they had so lately abhorred as a profane and polluted edifice. Their confidence was founded on the prophecy of an enthusiast or impostor, that one day the Turks would enter Constantinople and pursue the Romans as far as the column of Constantine, on the square before St. Sophia, but that this would be the term of their calamities, that an angel would descend from heaven with a sword in his hand, and would deliver the empire with that celestial weapon to a poor man seated at the foot of the column. Take this sword, would he say, and avenge the people of the Lord. At these animating words, the Turks would instantly fly, and the victorious Romans would drive them from the west, and from all Anatolia as far as the frontiers of Persia. It was on this occasion that Ducas, with some fancy and much truth, upbraids the discord and obstinacy of the Greeks. Had that angel appeared, exclaims the historian, had he offered to exterminate your foes if you would consent to the union of the church, even then, in that fatal moment, you would have rejected your safety, or have deceived your God. While they expected the descent of the tardy angel, the doors were broken with axes, and as soon as the Turks encountered no resistance, their bloodless hands were employed in selecting and securing the multitude of their prisoners. Youth, beauty, and the appearance of wealth attracted their choice, and the right of property was decided among themselves by a prior seizure, by personal strength, and by the authority of command. In this space of an hour, the male captives were bound with cords, the females with their veils and girdles, the senators were linked with their slaves, the prelates with the porters of the church, and the young men of a plebeian class with the noble maids whose faces had been invisible to the sun and their nearest kindred. In this common captivity, the ranks of society were confounded, the ties of nature were cut asunder, and the inexorable soldier was careless of the father's groans, the tears of the mother, the lamentations of the children. The loudest in their wailings were the nuns, who were torn from the altar with naked bosoms, outstretched hands, and disheveled hair, and we should piously believe that few could be tempted to prefer the vigils of the harem to those of the monastery. Of these unfortunate Greeks, of these domestic animals, whole strings were rudely driven through the streets, and as the conquerors were eager to return for more prey, their trembling pace was quickened with menaces and blows. At the same hour, a similar rapine was exercised in all the churches and monasteries, in all the palaces and habitations of the capital, nor could any place, however sacred or sequestered, protect the persons or the property of the Greeks. Above sixty thousand of this devoted people were transported from the city to the camp and fleet, exchanged or sold according to the caprice or interest of their masters, and dispersed in remote servitude through the provinces of the Ottoman Empire. Among these we may notice some remarkable characters. The historian Franza, first chamberlain and principal secretary, was involved with his family in the common lot. After suffering four months the hardships of slavery, he recovered his freedom. In the ensuing winter, he ventured to Adrianople and ransomed his wife from the Mir Bashi, or master of the horse, but his two children, in the flower of youth and beauty, had been seized for the use of Mohammed himself. The daughter of Franza died in the Seraglio, perhaps a virgin. His son, in the fifteenth year of his age, preferred death to infamy, and was stabbed by the hand of the royal lover. A deed thus unhuman, a deed thus inhuman cannot surely be expiated by the taste and liberality with which he released a Grecian matron and her two daughters, on receiving a Latin ode from Philelphius, who had chosen a wife in that noble family. 
The pride or cruelty of Mohammed would have been most sensibly gratified by the capture of a Roman legate. But the dexterity of Cardinal Isidore eluded the search, and he escaped from Galata in a plebeian habit. The chain and entrance of the outward harbor was still occupied by the Italian ships of merchandise and war. They had signalized their valor in the siege. They embraced the moment of retreat, while the Turkish mariners were dissipated in the pillage of the city. When they hoisted sail, the beach was covered with a suppliant and lamentable crowd. But the means of transportation were scanty. The Venetians and Genoese selected their countrymen, and notwithstanding the fairest promises of the sultan, the inhabitants of Galata evacuated their houses and embarked with their most precious effects. In the fall and sack of great cities, an historian is condemned to repeat the tale of uniform calamity. The same effects must be produced by the same passions, and when these passions may be indulged without control, small, alas, is the difference between civilized and savage man. Amidst the vague exclamations of bigotry and hatred, the Turks are not accused of a wanton or immoderate effusion of Christian blood. But according to their maxims, the maxims of antiquity, the lives of the vanquished were forfeited, and the legitimate reward of the conqueror was derived from the service, the sale, or the ransom of his captives of both sexes. The wealth of Constantinople had been granted by the sultan to his victorious troops, and the rapine of an hour is more productive than the industry of years. But as no regular division was attempted of the spoil, the respective shares were not determined by merit, and the rewards of valor were stolen away by the followers of the camp, who had declined the toil and danger of the battle. The narrative of their depredations could not afford either amusement or instructions. The total amount, in the last poverty of the empire, has been valued at four millions of ducats, and of this sum a small part was the property of the Venetians, the Genoese, the Florentines, and the merchants of Ancona. Of these foreigners, the stock was improved in quick and perpetual circulation. But the riches of the Greeks were displayed in the idle ostentation of palaces and wardrobes, or deeply buried in treasuries and ingots and old coin, lest it should be demanded at their hands for the defense of their country. The profanation and plunder of the monasteries and churches excited the most tragic complaints. The dome of St. Sophia itself, the earthly heaven, the second firmament, the vehicle of the cherubim, the throne of the glory of God, was despoiled of the oblations of ages, and the gold and silver, the pearls and jewels, the vases and sacerdotal ornaments, were most wickedly converted to the service of mankind. After the divine images had been stripped of all that could be valuable to a profane eye, the canvas or the wood was torn or broken or burnt or trod under foot or applied in the stables or the kitchen to the vilest uses. The example of sacrilege was imitated, however, from the Latin conquerors of Constantinople, and the treatment which Christ, the Virgin, and the saints had sustained from the guilty Catholic might be inflicted by the zealous Mussulman on the monuments of idolatry. Perhaps, instead of enjoining the public clamor, a philosopher will observe that in the decline of the arts, the workmanship cannot be more valuable than the work, and that a fresh supply of visions and miracles would speedily be renewed by the craft of the priest and the credulity of the people. He will more seriously deplore the loss of the Byzantine libraries, which were destroyed or scattered in the general confusion. One hundred and twenty thousand manuscripts are said to have disappeared. Ten volumes might be purchased for a single ducat and the same ignominious price, too high perhaps for a shelf of theology, included the whole works of Aristotle and Homer, the noblest productions of the science and literature of ancient Greece. We may reflect with pleasure that an inestimable portion of our classic treasures were safely deposited in Italy, and that the mechanics of a German town had invented an art which derides the havoc of time and barbarism. From the first hour of the memorable 29th of May, disorder and rapine prevailed in Constantinople till the eighth hour of the same day, when the sultan himself passed in triumph through the gate of St. Romanus. He was attended by his viziers, bishaws, and guards, each of whom, says a Byzantine historian, was robust as Hercules, dexterous as Apollo, and equal in battle to any ten of the race of ordinary mortals. 
The conqueror gazed with satisfaction and wonder on the strange, though splendid, appearance of the domes and palaces, so dissimilar from the style of oriental architecture. In the Hippodrome, or Antimedon, his eye was attracted by the twisted column of three serpents, and as a trial of strength he shattered with his iron mace or battle-axe the underjaw of one of these monsters, which in the eyes of the Turks were the idols or talismans of the city. At the principal dome of St. Sophia, he alighted from his horse and entered the dome, and such was his jealous regard for that monument of his glory, that, on observing a zealous Mussulman in the act of breaking the marble pavement, he admonished him with his scimitar that, if the spoil and captives were granted to the soldiers, the public and private buildings had been reserved for the prince. By his command, the metropolis of the Eastern Church was transformed into a mosque, the rich and portable instruments of superstition had been removed, the crosses were thrown down, and the walls, which were covered with images and mosaics, were washed and purified, and restored to a state of naked simplicity. On the same day, or on the ensuing Friday, the muezzin, or crier, ascended to the most lofty turret, and proclaimed the ezan, or public invitation, in the name of God and his prophet. The iman preached, and Mohammed II performed the namaz of prayer and thanksgiving on the great altar, where the Christian mysteries had so lately been celebrated before the last of the Caesars. From St. Sophia he proceeded to the august but desolate mansion of a hundred successors of the great Constantine, but which in a few hours had been stripped of the pomp of royalty. A melancholy reflection on the vicissitudes of human greatness forced itself on his mind, and he repeated an elegant distich of Persian poetry. The spider has wove his web in the imperial palace, and the owl hath sung her watch-song on the towers of Ephrasiab. Yet his mind was not satisfied, nor did the victory seem complete, till he was informed of the fate of Constantine, whether he had escaped, or been made prisoner, or had fallen in the battle. Two Janissaries claimed the honor and reward of his death, the body, under a heap of slain, was discovered by the golden eagles embroidered on his shoes. The Greeks acknowledged with tears the head of their late emperor, and, after exposing the bloody trophy, Mohammed bestowed on his rival the honors of a decent funeral. After his decease, Lucas Notaras, great duke and first minister of the empire, was the most important prisoner. When he offered his person and his treasures at the feet of the throne, and why said the indignant sultan, did you not employ these treasures in the defense of your prince and country? They were yours, answered the slave. God had reserved them for your hands. If he reserved them for me, replied the despot, how have you presumed to withhold them so long by a fruitless and fatal resistance? The great duke alleged the obstinacy of the strangers, and some secret encouragement from the Turkish vizier, and from this perilous interview, he was at length dismissed with the assurance of pardon and protection. Mohammed condescended to visit his wife, a venerable princess, oppressed with sickness and grief, and his consolation for her misfortunes was in the most tender strain of humanity and filial reverence. A similar clemency was extended to the principal officers of state, of whom several were ransomed at his expense, and during some days he declared himself the friend and father of the vanquished people. But the scene was soon changed, and before his departure, the Hippodrome streamed with the blood of his noblest captives. His perfidious cruelty is execrated by the Christians. They adorn with the colors of heroic martyrdom the execution of the great duke and his two sons, and his death is ascribed to the generous refusal of delivering his children to the tyrant's lust. Yet a Byzantine historian has dropped an unguarded word of conspiracy, deliverance, and Italian succor. Such treason may be glorious, but the rebel who bravely ventures has justly forfeited his life. Nor should we blame a conqueror for destroying the enemies whom he could no longer trust. On the 18th of June, the victorious sultan returned to Adrianople, and smiled at the base and hollow embassies of the Christian princes, who viewed their approaching ruin and the fall of the Eastern Empire. Constantinople had been left naked and desolate, without a prince or a people. But she could not be despoiled of the incomparable situation which marks her 
for the metropolis of a great empire, and the genius of the place will ever triumph over the accidents of time and fortune. Borsra and Adrianople, the ancient seats of the Ottomans, sunk into provincial towns, and Mohammed II established his own residence, and that of his successors, on the same commanding spot which had been chosen by Constantine. The fortifications of Galata, which might afford a shelter to the Latins, were prudently destroyed, but the damage of the Turkish cannon was soon repaired, and before the month of August great quantities of lime had been burnt for the restoration of the walls of the capital. As the entire property of the soil and the buildings, whether public or private, or profane or sacred, was now transferred to the conqueror, he first separated a space of eight furlongs from the point of the triangle for the establishment of his seraglio, or palace. It is here, in the bosom of luxury, that the Grand Signor, as he has been emphatically named by the Italians, appears to reign over Europe and Asia. But his persons on the shore of the Bosphorus may not always be secure from the insults of a hostile navy. In the new character of a mosque, the cathedral of St. Sophia was endowed with an ample revenue, crowned with lofty minarets, and surrounded with groves and fountains for the devotion and refreshment of the Muslims. The same model was imitated by the Jani, or royal mosques, and the first of these was built by Muhammad himself, on the ruins of the Church of the Holy Apostles and the tombs of the Greek emperors. On the third day after the conquest, the grave of Abu Ayyub, or Job, who had fallen in the first siege of the Arabs, was revealed in a vision, and it is before the sepulchre of the martyr that the new sultans are girded with the sword of empire. Constantinople no longer appertains to the Roman historian, nor shall I enumerate the civil and religious edifices which were profaned or erected by its Turkish masters. The population was speedily renewed, and before the end of September, five thousand families of Anatolia and Romania had obeyed the royal mandate which enjoined them, under pain of death, to occupy their new habitations in the capital. The throne of Mohammed was guarded by the numbers and fidelity of his Muslim subjects, but his rational policy expired to collect the remnant of the Greeks, and they returned in crowds as soon as they were assured of their lives, their liberties, and a free exercise of their religion. In the election and investiture of a patriarch, the ceremonial of the Byzantine court was revived and imitated. With a mixture of satisfaction and horror, they beheld the sultan on his throne, who delivered into the hands of Gennadius the crozier, or pastoral staff, the symbol of his ecclesiastical office, who conducted the patriarch to the gate of the seraglio, presented him with a horse richly caparisoned, and directed the viziers and bishaws to lead him to the palace which had been allotted for his residence. The churches of Constantinople were shared between the two religions. Their limits were marked, and, till it was infringed by Selim, the grandson of Mohammed, the Greeks enjoyed above sixty years the benefit of this equal partition. Encouraged by the ministers of the Divan, who wished to elude the fanaticism of the Sultan, the Christian advocates presumed to allege that this division had been an act not of generosity, but of justice, not a concession, but a compact, and that, if one half of the city had been taken by storm, the other moiety had surrendered on the faith of a sacred capitulation. The original grant had indeed been consumed by fire, but the loss was supplied by the testimony of three aged Janissaries, who remembered the transaction, and their venal oaths are of more weight in the opinion of Cantemir than the positive and unanimous consent of the history of the times. The remaining fragments of the Greek kingdom in Europe and Asia I shall abandon to the Turkish arms, but the final extinction of the last two dynasties which have reigned in Constantinople should terminate the decline and fall of the Roman Empire in the east. The despots of the Moria, Demetrius and Thomas, the last two brothers of the name of Palaeologus, were astonished by the death of the emperor Constantine and the ruin of the monarchy. Hopeless of defense, they prepared, with the noble Greeks who adhered to their fortune, to seek a refuge in Italy, beyond the reach of the Ottoman thunder. Their first apprehensions were dispelled by the victorious sultan, who contented himself with the tribute of twelve thousand ducats, and while his ambition explored the continent and islands in search of prey, he indulged the Moria 
in a respite of seven years. But this respite was a period of grief, discord, and misery. The hexamillion, or rampart of the isthmus, so often raised and so often subverted, could not long be defended by three hundred Italian archers. The keys of Corinth were seized by the Turks. They returned from their summer excursions with a train of captives and spoil, and the complaints of the injured Greeks were heard with indifference and disdain. The Albanians, a vagrant tribe of shepherds and robbers, filled the peninsula with rapine and murder. The two despots implored the dangerous and humiliating aid of a neighboring bashaw, and when he had quelled the revolt, his lessons inculcated the rule of their future conduct. Neither the ties of blood, nor the oaths which they repeatedly pledged in the communion and before the altar, nor the stronger pressure of necessity, could reconcile or suspend their domestic quarrels. They ravaged each other's patrimony with fire and sword. The alms and succors of the West were consumed in civil hostility, and their power was only exerted in savage and arbitrary executions. The success and revenge of the weaker rival invoked their supreme lord, and, in the season of maturity and revenge, Mohammed declared himself the friend of Demetrius, and marched into the Moria with an irresistible force. When he had taken possession of Sparta, You are too weak, said the sultan, to control this turbulent province. I will take your daughter to my bed, and you will pass the remainder of your life in security and honor. Demetrius sighed and obeyed, surrendered his daughter and his castles, followed Adrianople his sovereign and son, and received for his own maintenance and those of his followers a city in Thrace, and the adjacent isles of Imbros, Lemnos, and Samothrace. He was joined the next year by a companion of misfortune, the last of the Comnenian race, who, after the taking of Constantinople by the Latins, had founded a new empire on the coast of the Black Sea. In the progress of his Anatolian conquests, Mohammed invested with a fleet and army the capital of David, who presumed to style himself Emperor of Trezebond, and the negotiation was comprised in a short and peremptory question. Will you secure your life and treasures by resigning your kingdom? Or had you rather forfeit your kingdom, your treasures, and your life? The feeble Komnenus was subdued by his own fears, and the example of a Mussulman neighbor, the prince of Sinope, who, on a similar summons, had yielded a fortified city with four hundred cannon and ten or twelve thousand soldiers. The capitulation of Trezabond was faithfully performed, and the emperor, with his family, was transported to a castle in Romania. But, on a slight suspicion of corresponding with the Persian king, David and the whole Comnenian race were sacrificed to the jealousy or avarice of the conqueror. Nor could the name of father long protect the unfortunate Demetrius from exile and confiscation. His abject submission moved the pity and contempt of the sultan. His followers were transplanted to Constantinople, and his poverty was alleviated by a pension of 50,000 aspers, till a monastic habit and a tardy death released Paleologus from an earthly master. It is not easy to pronounce whether the servitude of Demetrius or the exile of his brother Thomas be the most inglorious. On the conquest of the Moria, the despot escaped to Corfu, and from thence to Italy, with some naked adherents. His name, his sufferings, and the head of the apostle St. Andrew, entitled him to the hospitality of the Vatican, and his misery was prolonged by a pension of six thousand ducats from the Pope and Cardinals. His two sons, Andrew and Manuel, were educated in Italy, but the eldest, contemptible to his enemies and burdensome to his friends, was degraded by the baseness of his life and marriage. A title was his sole inheritance, and that inheritance he successively sold to the kings of France and Aragon. During his transient prosperity, Charles the Eighth was ambitious of joining the Empire of the East with the Kingdom of Naples. In a public festival, he assumed the appellation in purple of Augustus. The Greeks rejoiced, and the Ottoman already trembled at the approach of the French chivalry. Manuel Paleologus, the second son, was tempted to revisit his native country. His return might be grateful and could not be dangerous to the port. He was maintained at Constantinople in safety and ease and an honorable train of Christians and Muslims attended him to the grave. 
If there be some animals of so generous a nature that they refuse to propagate in a domestic state, the last of the imperial race must be ascribed to an inferior kind. He accepted from the sultan's liberality two beautiful females, and his surviving son was lost in the habit and religion of a Turkish slave. The importance of Constantinople was felt and magnified in its loss. The pontificate of Nicholas V, the pontificate of Nicholas V, however peaceful and prosperous, was dishonored by the fall of the Eastern Empire, and the grief and terror of the Latins revived, or seemed to revive, the old enthusiasm of the Crusades. In one of the most distant countries of the West, Philip, Duke of Burgundy, entertained at Lille in Flanders an assembly of his nobles, and the pompous pageants of the feast were skillfully adapted to their fancy and feelings. In the midst of the banquet, a giant Saracen entered the hall, leading a fictitious elephant with a castle on his back. A matron in a mourning robe, the symbol of religion, was seen to issue from the castle. She deplored her oppression and accused the slowness of her champions. The principal herald of the Golden Fleece advanced, bearing on his fist a live pheasant, which, according to the rites of chivalry, he presented to the duke. At this extraordinary summons, Philip, a wise and aged prince, engaged his person and powers in the holy war against the Turks. His example was imitated by the barons and knights of the assembly. They swore to God, the virgin, the ladies, and the pheasant. And their particular vows were not less extravagant than the general sanction of their oath. But the performance was made to depend on some future and foreign contingency, and during twelve years, till the last hour of his life, the Duke of Burgundy might be scrupulously, and perhaps sincerely, on the eve of his departure. Had every breast glowed with the same ardor, had the union of the Christians corresponded with their bravery, had every country from Sweden to Naples supplied a just proportion of cavalry and infantry, of men and money, it is indeed probable that Constantinople would have been delivered, and that the Turks might have been chased beyond the Hellespont or the Euphrates. But the secretary of the emperor, who composed every epistle and attended every meeting, Aeneas Silvius, a statesman and orator, describes from his own experience the repugnant state and spirit of Christendom. It is a body, says he, without a head, a republic without laws or magistrates, the Pope and the Emperor may shine as lofty titles, as splendid images, but they are unable to command, and none are willing to obey. Every state has a separate prince, and every prince has a separate interest. What eloquence could unite so many discordant and hostile powers under the same standard? Could they be assembled in arms, who would dare to assume the office of general? What order could be maintained? What military discipline? Who would undertake to feed such an enormous multitude? Who would understand their various languages, or direct their stranger and incompatible manners? What mortal could reconcile the English with the French, Genoa with Aragon, the Germans with the natives of Hungary and Bohemia? If a small number enlisted in the holy war, they must be overthrown by the infidels, if many by their own weight and confusion. Yet, the same Aeneas, when he was raised to the papal throne, under the name of Pius II, devoted his life to the prosecution of the Turkish war. In the council of Mantua, he excited some sparks of a false or feeble enthusiasm. But when the pontiff appeared at Ancona to embark in person with the troops, engagements vanished in excuses. A precise day was adjourned to an indefinite term, and his effective army consisted of some German pilgrims, whom he was obliged to disband with indulgences and alms. Regardless of futurity, his successors and the powers of Italy were involved in the schemes of present and domestic ambition, and the distance or proximity of each object determined in their eyes its apparent magnitude. A more enlarged view of their interest would have taught them to maintain a defensive and naval war against the common enemy, and the support of Skanderbeg and his brave Albanians might have prevented the subsequent invasion of the kingdom of Naples. The siege and sack of Varanto by the Turks diffused a general consternation, and Pope Sixtus was preparing to fly beyond the Alps, when the storm was instantly dispelled by the death of Mohammed II, 
in the fifty-first year of his age. His lofty genius aspired to the conquest of Italy. He was possessed of a strong city and a capacious harbor, and the same reign might have been decorated with the trophies of the new and the ancient Rome. In the first ages of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, our eye is invariably fixed on the royal city, which had given laws to the fairest portion of the globe. We contemplate her fortunes, at first with admiration, at length with pity, always with attention, and when that attention is diverted from the capital to the provinces, they are considered as so many branches which have been successively severed from the imperial trunk. The foundation of a second Rome, on the shores of the Bosphorus, has compelled the historian to follow the successors of Constantine, and our curiosity has been tempted to visit the most remote countries of Europe and Asia, to explore the causes and the authors of the long decay of the Byzantine monarchy. By the conquest of Justinian, we have been recalled to the banks of the Tiber, to the deliverance of the ancient metropolis, but that deliverance was a change, or perhaps an aggravation of servitude. Rome had been already stripped of her trophies, her gods, and her Caesars, nor was the Gothic dominion more inglorious and oppressive than the tyranny of the Greeks. In this eighth century of the Christian era, a religious quarrel, the worship of images, provoked the Romans to assert their independence. Their bishop became the temporal, as well as the spiritual, father of a free people. And of the Western Empire, which was restored by Charlemagne, the title and image still decorate the singular constitution of modern Germany. The name of Rome must yet command our involuntary respect. The climate, whatsoever may be its influence, was no longer the same. The purity of blood had been contaminated through a thousand channels. But the venerable aspect of her ruins and the memory of past greatness rekindled a spark of the national character. The darkness of the Middle Ages exhibits some scenes not unworthy of our notice. Nor shall I dismiss the present work till I have reviewed the state and revolutions of the Roman city, which acquiesced under the absolute dominion of the popes, about the same time that Constantinople was enslaved by the Turkish arms. In the beginning of the twelfth century, the era of the First Crusade, Rome was revered by the Latins as the metropolis of the world, as the throne of the pope and the emperor, who, from the eternal city derived their title, their honors, and the right or exercise of temporal dominion. After so long an interruption, it may not be useless to repeat that the successors of Charlemagne and the Ossos were chosen beyond the Rhine in a national deed, but that these princes were content with the humble names of kings of Germany and Italy, till they had passed the Alps and the Apennine, to seek their imperial crown on the banks of the Tiber. At some distance from the city, their approach was saluted by a long procession of the clergy and people with palms and crosses, and the terrific emblems of wolves and lions, of dragons and eagles, that floated in the military banners that represented the departed legions and cohorts of the Republic. The royal path to maintain the liberties of Rome was thrice reiterated, at the bridge, the gate, and on the stairs of the Vatican, and the distribution of a customary donative feebly imitated the magnificence of the first Caesars. In the church of St. Peter, the coronation was performed by his successor. The voice of God was confounded with that of the people, and the public consent was declared in the acclamations of Long life and victory to our Lord the Pope, long life and victory to our Lord the Emperor, long life and victory to the Roman and Teutonic armies. The names of Caesar and Augustus, the laws of Constantine and Justinian, the example of Charlemagne and Otho, established the supreme dominion of the emperors. Their title and image was engraved on the papal coins, and their jurisdiction was marked by the sword of justice, which they delivered to the prefect of the city. But every Roman prejudice was awakened by the name, the language, and the manners of a barbarian lord. The Caesars of Saxony or Franconia were the chiefs of a feudal aristocracy. 
nor could they exercise the discipline of civil and military power, which alone secures the obedience of a distant people, impatient of servitude, though perhaps incapable of freedom. Once, and once only, in his life, each emperor, with an army of Teutonic vassals, descended from the Alps. I have described the peaceful order of his entry and coronation, but that order was commonly disturbed by the clamor and sedition of the Romans, who encountered their sovereign as a foreign invader. His departure was always speedy, and often shameful, and in the absence of a long reign, his authority was insulted, and his name was forgotten. The progress of independence in Germany and Italy undermined the foundations of the imperial sovereignty, and the triumph of the popes was the deliverance of Rome. Of her two sovereigns, the emperor had precariously reigned by the right of conquest, but the authority of the pope was founded on the soft, though more solid basis of opinion and habit. The removal of a foreign influence restored and endeared the shepherd to his flock. Instead of the arbitrary or venal nomination of a German court, the vicar of Christ was freely chosen by the college of cardinals, most of whom were either natives or inhabitants of the city. The applause of the magistrates and people confirmed his election, and the ecclesiastical power that was obeyed in Sweden and Britain had been ultimately derived from the suffrage of the Romans. The same suffrage gave a prince, as well as a pontiff, to the capital. It was universally believed that Constantine had invested the popes with the temporal dominion of Rome, and the boldest civilians, the most profane skeptics, were satisfied with disputing the right of the emperor and the validity of his gift. The truth of the fact, the authenticity of his donation, was deeply rooted in the ignorance and tradition of four centuries, and the fabulous origin was lost in the real and permanent effects. The name of Dominus, or Lord, was inscribed on the coin of the bishops. Their title was acknowledged by acclamations and oaths of allegiance, and with the free or reluctant consent of the German Caesars, they had long exercised a supreme or subordinate jurisdiction over the city and patrimony of St. Peter. The reign of the popes, which gratified their prejudices, was not incompatible with the liberties of Rome, and a more critical inquiry would have revealed a still nobler source of their power, the gratitude of a nation, whom they had rescued from the heresy and oppression of the Greek tyrant. In an age of superstition, it should seem that the union of the royal and sacerdotal characters would mutually fortify each other would be the surest pledge of earthly obedience. The sanctity of the office might indeed be degraded by the personal vices of the man, but the scandals of the tenth century were obliterated by the austere and more dangerous virtues of Gregory the Seventh and his successors, and in the ambitious contests which they maintained for the rights of the Church, their sufferings or their success must equally tend to increase the popular veneration. They sometimes wandered in poverty and exile, the victims of persecution, and the apostolic zeal with which they offered themselves to martyrdom must engage the favor and sympathy of every Catholic breast. And sometimes, sundering from the Vatican, they created, judged, and deposed the kings of the world, nor could the proudest Roman be disgraced by submitting to a priest whose feet were kissed and whose stirrup was held by the successors of Charlemagne. Even the temporal interest of the city should have protected in peace and honor the residence of the popes, from whence a vain and lazy people derived the greatest part of their subsistence and riches. The fixed revenue of the popes was probably impaired. Many of the old patrimonial estates, both in Italy and the provinces, had been invaded by sacrilegious hands, nor could the loss be compensated by the claim, rather than the possession of the more ample gifts of Pepin and his descendants. But the Vatican and capital were nourished by the incessant and increasing swarms of pilgrims and suppliants. The pale of Christianity was enlarged, and the Pope and cardinals were overwhelmed by the judgment of ecclesiastical and secular causes. 
a new jurisprudence had established in the Latin Church the right and practice of appeals, and from the north and west the bishops and abbots were invited or summoned to solicit, to complain, to accuse or to justify before the threshold of the apostles. A rare prodigy is once recorded. The two horses belonging to the archbishops of Mentz and Cologne repassed the Alps, yet laden with gold and silver. But it was soon understood that the success, both of the pilgrims and clients, depended much less on the justice of their cause than on the value of their offering. The wealth and piety of these strangers were ostentatiously displayed, and their expenses, sacred or profane, circulated in various channels from the emolument of the Romans. Such powerful motives should have firmly attached the voluntary and pious obedience of the Roman people to their spiritual and temporal father. But the operation of prejudice and interest is often disturbed by the sallies of ungovernable passion. The Indian who fells the tree that he may gather the fruit, and the Arab who plunders the caravans of commerce, are actuated by the same impulse of savage nature, which overlooks the future in the present, and relinquishes for momentary repine the long and secure possession of the most important blessings. And it was thus that the shrine of St. Peter was profaned by the thoughtless Romans, who pillaged the offerings and wounded the pilgrims, without computing the number and value of similar visits, which they prevented by their inhospitable sacrilege. Even the influence of superstition is fluctuating and precarious, and the slave, whose reason is subdued, will often be delivered by his avarice or pride. A credulous devotion for the fables and oracles of the priesthood most powerful acts on the mind of a barbarian. Yet such a mind is the least capable of preferring imagination to sense, or sacrificing to a distant motive, to an invisible, perhaps an ideal, object, the appetites and interests of the present world. In the vigor of health and youth, his practice will perpetually contradict his belief, till the pressure of age or sickness or calamity awakens his terrors, and compels him to satisfy the double depth of piety and remorse. I have already observed that the modern times of religious indifference are the most favorable to the peace and security of the clergy. And as the reign of superstition, they had much to hope from the ignorance and much to fear from the violence of mankind. The wealth, whose constant increase must have rendered them the sole proprietors of the earth, was alternately bestowed by the repentant father and plundered by the rapacious son. Their persons were adored or violated, and the same idol, by the hands of the same votaries, was placed on the altar or trampled in the dust. In the feudal system of Europe, arms were the title of distinction and the measure of allegiance, and amidst their tumult the still voice of law and reason was seldom heard or obeyed. The turbulent Romans disdained the yoke and insulted the impotence of their bishop nor would his education or character allow him to exercise, with decency or effect, the power of the sword. The motives of his election and the frailties of his life were exposed to their familiar observation, and proximity must diminish the reverence which his name and his decrees impressed on a barbarous world. This difference was not escaped the notice of our philosophic historian, Though the name and authority of the court of Rome were so terrible in the remote countries of Europe, which were sunk in profound ignorance, and were entirely unacquainted with its character and conduct, the Pope was so little revered at home that his inveterate enemies surrounded the gates of Rome itself, and even controlled his government in that city, and the ambassadors who, from a distant extremity of Europe, carried to him the humble or rather abject submissions of the greatest potentate of the age, found the utmost difficulty to make their way to him, and to throw themselves at his feet. Since the primitive times, the wealth of the popes was exposed to envy, their powers to opposition, and their persons to violence. But the long hostility of the mitre and the crown increased the numbers, and inflamed the passions of their enemies. The deadly factions of the Guelphs and Ghibellines, so fatal to Italy, 
could never be embraced with truth or constancy by the Romans, the subjects and adversaries both of the bishop and emperor, but their support was solicited by both parties, and they alternately displayed in their banners the keys of St. Peter and the German eagle. Gregory the Seventh, who may be adored or detested as the founder of the papal monarchy, was driven from Rome, and died in exile at Salerno. Six and thirty of his successors, till their retreat to Avignon, maintained an unequal contest with the Romans. Their age and dignity were often violated, and the churches and the solemn rites of religion were polluted with sedition and murder. A repetition of such capricious brutality, without connection or design, would be tedious and disgusting, and I shall content myself with some events of the twelfth century, which represent the state of the popes and the city. On Holy Thursday, while Pascal officiated before the altar, he was interrupted by the clamors of the multitude, who imperiously demanded the confirmation of a favorite magistrate. His silence exasperated their fury. His pious refusal to mingle the affairs of earth and heaven was encountered with menaces and oath, and he should be the cause and the witness of a public ruin. During the festival of Easter, while the bishop and the clergy, barefooted and in procession, visited the tombs of the martyrs, they were twice assaulted, at the bridge of St. Angelo, and before the capital, with volleys of stones and darts. The houses of his adherents were leveled with the ground. Pascal escaped with difficulty and danger. He levied an army in the patrimony of St. Peter, and his last days were embittered by suffering and inflicting the calamities of civil war. The scenes that followed the election of his successor Gelasius II were still more scandalous to the church and city. Cencio Frangipani, a potent and factious baron, burst into the assembly furious and in arms. The cardinals were stripped, beaten, and trampled underfoot, and he seized, without pity or respect, the vicar of Christ by the throat. Gelasius was dragged by the hair along the ground. Buffeted with blows, mounted with spores, and bound with an iron chain in the house of his brutal tyrant. An insurrection of the people delivered their bishop. The rival families opposed the violence of the Prangipani, and Cencio, who sued for pardon, repented of the failure, rather than of the guilt of his enterprise. Not many days had elapsed, when the Pope was again assaulted at the altar. While his friends and enemies were engaged in a bloody contest, he escaped in his sacerdotal garments. In this unworthy flight, which excited the compassion of the Roman matrons, his attendants were scattered or unhorsed, and in the fields behind the church of St. Peter, his successor was found alone and half dead with fear and fatigue. Shaking the dust from his feet, the apostle withdrew from a city in which his dignity was insulted and his person was endangered, and the vanity of sacerdotal ambition is revealed in the involuntary confession that one emperor was more tolerable than twenty. These examples might suffice, but I cannot forget the sufferings of two pontiffs of the same age, the second and third of the name of Lucius. The former, as he ascended in battle array to assault the capital, was struck on the temple by a stone, and expired in a few days. The latter was severely wounded in their person of his servants. In a civil commotion several of his priests had been made prisoners, and the inhuman Romans, reserving one as a guide for his brethren, put out their eyes, crowned them with ludicrous mitres, mounted them on asses with their faces towards the tail, and extorted an oath that, in this wretched condition, they should offer themselves as a lesson to the head of the church. Hope or fear, lassitude or remorse, the characters of the men and the circumstances of the times, might sometimes obtain an interval of peace and obedience, and the Pope was restored with joyful acclamations to the Lateran or Vatican, from whence he had been driven with threats and violence. But the root of mischief was deep and perennial and the momentary calm was preceded and followed by such tempests as had almost sunk the bark of St. Peter. Rome continually presented the aspect of war and discord. The churches and palaces were fortified and assaulted 
for his affections and families. And, after giving peace to Europe, Callistus II alone had resolution and power to prohibit the use of private arms in the metropolis. Among the nations who revered the apostolic throne, the tumults of Rome provoked a general indignation, and in a letter to his disciple Eugenius III, St. Bernard, with the sharpness of his wit and zeal, has stigmatized the vices of the rebellious people. Who is ignorant, says the monk of Clairvaux, of the vanity and arrogance of the Romans? A nation nursed in sedition, and tractable, and scorning to obey, unless they are too feeble to resist. When they promise to serve, they aspire to reign. If they swear allegiance, they watch the opportunity of revolt, yet they vent their discontent in loud clamors, if your doors or your counsels are shut against them. Dexterous in mischief, they have never learned the science of doing good. Odious to earth and heaven, impious to God, seditious among themselves, jealous of their neighbors, inhuman to strangers, they love no one, by no one are they beloved, and while they wish to inspire fear, they live in base and continual apprehension. They will not submit, they know not how to govern faithless to their superiors. Intolerable to their equals, ungrateful to their benefactors, and alike impudent in their demands and their refusals. Lofty in promise, poor in execution, adulation and calumny, perfidy and treason, are the familiar arts of their policy. Surely this dark portrait is not colored by the pencil of Christian charity. Yet the features, however harsh or ugly, express a lively resemblance of the Roman of the twelfth century. The Jews had rejected the Christ when he appeared among them in a plebeian character, and the Romans might plead their ignorance of his vicar when he assumed the pomp and pride of a temporal sovereign. In the busy age of the Crusades, some sparks of curiosity and reason were rekindled in the Western world. The heresy of Bulgaria, the Paulician sect, was successful transplanted into the soil of Italy and France. The Gnostic visions were mingled with the simplicity of the gospel, and the enemies of the clergy reconciled their passions with their conscience, the desire of freedom with the profession of piety. The trumpet of Roman liberty was first sounded by Arnold of Brescia, whose promotion in the church was confined to the lowest rank, and who wore the monastic habit rather as a garb of poverty than as a uniform of obedience. His adversaries could not deny the wit and eloquence which they severely felt. They confessed with reluctance the specious purity of his morals, and his errors were recommended to the public by a mixture of important and beneficial truths. In his theological studies he had been the disciple of the famous and unfortunate Abelard, who was likewise involved in the suspicion of heresy, but the lover of Eloisa was of a soft and flexible nature, and his ecclesiastical judges were edified and disarmed by the humility of his repentance. Arnold most probably imbibed some metaphysical definitions of the Trinity, repugnant to the taste of the times. His ideas of baptism and the Eucharist are loosely censored, but a political heresy was the source of his fame and misfortunes. He presumed to quote the declarations of Christ, that his kingdom is not of this world. He boldly maintained that the sword and the scepter were entrusted to the civil magistrate, that temporal honors and possessions were lawfully vested in secular persons, that the abbots, the bishops, and the pope himself must renounce either their state or their salvation, and that after the loss of their revenues, the voluntary tithes and oblations of the faithful would suffice, not indeed for luxury and avarice, but for a frugal life in the exercise of spiritual labors. During a short time the preacher was revered as a patriot, and the discontent or revolt of Brescia against her bishop was the first fruits of his dangerous lessons. But the favor of the people is less permanent than the resentment of the priest, and after the heresy of Arnold had been condemned by Innocent II, in the general council of the Lateran, 
the magistrates themselves were urged by prejudice and fear to execute the sentence of the church. Italy could no longer afford a refuge, and the disciple of Abelard escaped beyond the Alps, till he found a safe and hospitable shelter in Zürich, now the first of the Swiss cantons. From a Roman station, a royal villa, a chapter of noble virgins, Zurich had gradually increased to a free and flourishing city, where the appeals of the Milanese were sometimes tried by the imperial commissaries. In an age less ripe for reformation, the precursor of Zwinglius was heard with applause. A brave and simple people imbibed, and long retained the color of his opinions, and his art or merit seduced the bishop of Constance, and even the pope's legate, who forgot, for his sake, the interest of their master and their order. Their tardy zeal was quickened by the fierce exhortations of St. Bernard, and the enemy of the church was driven by persecution to the desperate measures of erecting his standard in Rome itself, in the face of the successor of St. Peter. Yet the courage of Arnold was not devoid of discretion. He was protected, and had perhaps been invited by the nobles and people, and in the service of freedom his eloquence thundered o'er the seven hills. Blending in the same discourse the texts of Levi and St. Paul, uniting the motives of gospel and of classic, enthusiasm, he admonished the Romans, how strangely their patience and the vices of the clergy had degenerated from the primitive times of the church and the city. He exhorted them to assert the inalienable rights of men and Christians, to restore the laws and magistrates of the Republic, to respect the name of the Emperor, but to confine their shepherd to the spiritual government of his flock. Nor could his spiritual government escape the censure and control of the Reformer, and the inferior clergy were taught by his lessons to resist the cardinals, who had usurped a despotic command over the twenty-eight regions or parishes of Rome. The revolution was not accomplished without rapine and violence. The diffusion of blood and the demolition of houses, the victorious faction was enriched with the spoils of the clergy and the adverse nobles. Arnold of Brescia enjoyed, or deplored, the effects of his mission. His reign continued above ten years, while two popes, Innocent II and Anastasius IV, either trembled in the Vatican or wandered as exiles in the adjacent cities. They were succeeded by a more vigorous and fortunate pontiff, Adrian IV, the only Englishman who has ascended the throne of St. Peter, and whose merit emerged from the mean condition of a monk, and almost a beggar, in the monastery of St. Albans. On the first provocation of a cardinal killed or wounded in the streets, he cast an interdict on the guilty people, and from Christmas to Easter, Rome was deprived of the real or imaginary comforts of religious worship. The Romans had despised their temporal prince. They submitted with grief and terror to the censures of their spiritual father. Their guilt was expiated by penance, and the banishment of the seditious preacher was the price of their absolution. But the revenge of Adrian was yet unsatisfied, and the approaching coronation of Frederick Barbarossa was fatal to the bold reformer, who had offended, though not in an equal degree, the heads of the church and state. In their interview at Viterbo, the Pope represented to the Emperor the furious, ungovernable spirit of the Romans, the insults, the injuries, the fears, to which his person and his clergy were continually exposed, and the pernicious tendency of the heresy of Arnold, which must subvert the principles of civil as well as ecclesiastical subordination. Frederick was convinced by these arguments, or tempted by the desire of the imperial crown, in the balance of ambition, the innocence of or life of an individual is of small account, and their common enemy was sacrificed to a moment of political concord. After his retreat from Rome, Arnold had been protected by the Viscounts of Campania, from whom he was extorted by the power of Caesar. The prefect of the city pronounced his sentence, the martyr of freedom was burned alive in the presence of a careless and ungrateful people, and his ashes were cast into the Tiber, lest the heretics should collect and worship the relics of their master. 
the clergy triumphed in his death. With his ashes his sect was dispersed. His memory still lived in the minds of the Romans. From his school they had probably derived a new article of faith, that the metropolis of the Catholic Church is exempt from the penalties of excommunication and interdict. Their bishops might argue that the supreme jurisdiction, which they exercised over kings and nations, more especially embraced the city and diocese of the prince of the apostles. But they preach to the winds, and the same principle that weakens the effect must temper the abuse of the thunders of the Vatican. The love of ancient freedom has encouraged a belief that as early as the tenth century, in their first struggles against the Saxon Ottos, the commonwealth was vindicated and restored by the Senate and people of Rome, that two consuls were annually elected among the nobles, and that ten or twelve plebeian magistrates revived the name and office of the tribunes of the commons. But this venerable structure disappears before the light of criticism. In the darkness of the Middle Ages, the appellations of senators, of consuls, of the sons of consuls, may sometimes be discovered. They were bestowed by the emperors or assumed by the most powerful citizens to denote their rank, their honors, and perhaps the claim of a pure and patrician descent. But they float on the surface, without a series or a substance, the titles of men, not the orders of government. And it is only from the year of Christ 1144, that the establishment of the Senate is dated, as a glorious era in the acts of the city. A new constitution was hastily framed by private ambition or popular enthusiasm. Nor could Rome, in the twelfth century, produce an antiquary to explain, or a legislator to restore, the harmony and proportions of the ancient model. The assembly of a free, of an armed people, will ever speak in loud and weighty acclamations, but the regular distribution of the fifty-five tribes, the nice balance of the wealth and numbers of the centuries, the debits of the adverse orators, and the slow operations of votes and ballots, could not easily be adapted by a blind multitude, ignorant of the arts, and insensible of the benefits of legal government. It was proposed by Arnold to revive and discriminate the equestrian order, but what could be the motive or measure of such distinction? The pecuniary qualification of the knights must have been reduced to the poverty of the times. Those times no longer required their civil functions of judges and farmers of the revenue, and their primitive duty, their military service on horseback, was more nobly supplied by feudal tenures and the spirit of chivalry. The jurisprudence of the Republic was useless and unknown, the nations and families of Italy, who lived under the Roman and barbaric laws, were insensibly mingled in a common mass, and some faint tradition, some imperfect fragments, preserved the memory of the Code and Pandects of Justinian. With their liberty the Romans might doubtless have restored the appellation and office of consuls. Had they not disdained a title so promiscuously adopted in the Italian cities, that it has finally settled on the humble station of the agents of commerce in a foreign land. But the rights of the tribunes, the formidable word that arrested the public councils, suppose or must produce a legitimate democracy. The old patricians were the subjects, the modern barons the tyrants of the state, nor would the enemies of peace and order, who insulted the vicar of Christ, have long respected the unarmed sanctity of a plebeian magistrate. In the revolution of the twelfth century, which gave a new existence and era to Rome, we may observe the real and important events that marked or confirmed her political independence. First, the Capitolian Hill, one of her seven eminences, is about four hundred yards in length and two hundred in breadth. A flight of hundred steps led to the summit of the Tarpeian Rock, and far steeper was the ascent before the declivities had been smoothed and the precipices pilled by the ruins of fallen edifices. From the earliest ages the capital had been used as a temple in peace, a fortress in war. After the loss of the city it maintained a siege against the victorious Gauls, 
and the sanctuary of the empire was occupied, assaulted and burned, in the civil wars of Vitellus and Vespasian. The temples of Jupiter and his kindred deities had crumbled into dust. Their place was supplied by monasteries and houses, and the solid walls, the long and shelving porticos, were decayed or ruined by the lapse of time. It was the first act of the Romans, an act of freedom, to restore the strength, though not the beauty, of the capital, to fortify the seat of their arms and councils, and as often as they ascended the hill, the coldest minds must have glowed with the remembrance of their ancestors. Second, the first Caesars had been invested with the exclusive coinage of the gold and silver. To the Senate they abandoned the baser metal of bronze or copper. The emblems and legions were inscribed on a more ample field by the genius of flattery, and the prince was relieved from the care of celebrating his own virtues. The successors of Diocletian, despised even the flattery of the Senate, their royal officers at Rome, and in the provinces, assumed the sole direction of the mint, and the same prerogative was inherited by the Gothic kings of Italy, and the long series of the Greek, the French, and the German dynasties. After an abdication of eight hundred years, the Roman Senate asserted this honorable and lucrative privilege, which was tacitly renounced by the popes, from Pascal II to the establishment of the residence beyond the Alps. Some of these republican coins of the 12th and 13th centuries are shown in the cabinets of the curious. On one of these, a gold medal, Christ is depictured holding in his left hand a book with this inscription, The Vow of the Roman Senate and People, Rome the Capital of the World. On the reverse, St. Peter, delivering a banner to a kneeling senator in his cap and gown, with the name and arms of his family impressed on a shield. Third, with the empire, the prefect of the city had declined to a municipal officer, yet he still exercised in the last appeal the civil and criminal jurisdiction, and a drawn sword, which he received from the successors of Otho, was the mode of his investiture and the emblem of his functions. The dignity was confined to the noble families of Rome. The choice of the people was ratified by the Pope. But a triple oath of fidelity must have often embarrassed the prefect in the conflict of adverse duties. A servant in whom they possessed but a third share was dismissed by the independent Romans. In his place they elected a patrician, but this title, which Charlemagne had not disdained, was too lofty for a citizen or a subject, and, after the first fervor or rebellion, they consented without reluctance to the restoration of the prefect. About fifty years after this event, Innocent the Third, the most ambitious, or at least the most fortunate, of the pontiffs, delivered the Romans and himself from this badge of foreign dominion. He invested the prefect with a banner instead of a sword and absolved him from all dependence of oath or service to the German emperors. In his place an ecclesiastical, a present or future cardinal, was named by the Pope to the civil government of Rome, but his jurisdiction has been reduced to a narrow compass, and in the days of freedom the right or exercise was derived from the Senate and people. 4. After the revival of the Senate, the conscript fathers, if I may use the expression, were invested with the legislative and executive power, but their views seldom reached beyond the present day, and that day was most frequently disturbed by violence and tumult. In its utmost plenitude, the order or assembly consisted of fifty-six senators, the most eminent of whom were distinguished by the title of councillors. They were nominated, perhaps annually, by the people, and the previous choice of their electors ten persons in each region, or parish, might afford a basis for a free and permanent constitution. The popes, who in this tempest submitted rather to bend than to break, confirmed by treaty the establishment and privileges of the Senate, and expected from time, peace and religion, the restoration of their government. The motives of public and private interest might sometimes draw from the Romans 
an occasional and temporary sacrifice of their claims, and they renewed their oath of allegiance to the successor of St. Peter and Constantine, the lawful head of the Church and the Republic. The union and vigor of a public council was dissolved in a lawless city, and the Romans soon adopted a more strong and simple mode of administration. They condensed the name and authority of the Senate in a single magistrate, or two colleagues, and as they were changed at the end of a year, or of six months, the greatness of the trust was compensated by the shortness of the term. But in this transient reign, the senators of Rome indulged their avarice and ambition. Their justice was perverted by the interest of their family and faction, and as they punished only their enemies, they were obeyed only by their adherents. Anarchy, no longer tempered by the pastoral care of their bishop, admonished the Romans that they were incapable of governing themselves, and they sought abroad those blessings which they were hopeless of finding at home. In the same age and from the same motives, most of the Italian republics were prompted to embrace a measure which, however strange it may seem, was adapted to their situation and productive of the most salutary effects. They choose, in some foreign but friendly city, an impartial magistrate of noble birth and unblemished character, a soldier and a statesman, recommended by the voice of fame and his country, to whom they delegated for a time the supreme administration of peace and war. The compact between the governor and the governed was sealed with oaths and subscriptions, and the duration of his power, the measure of his stipend, the nature of their mutual obligations, were defined with scrupulous precision. They swore to obey him as their lawful superior. He pledged his faith to unite the indifference of a stranger with the zeal of a patriot. At his choice, four or six knights and civilians, his assessors in arms and justice, attended the Podesta, who maintained at his own expense a decent retinue of servants and horses, his wife, his son, his brother, who might be as the affections of the judge, were left behind. During the exercise of his office he was not permitted to purchase land, to contract an alliance, or even to accept an invitation in the house of a citizen. Nor could he honorably depart till he had satisfied the complaints that might be urged against his government. It was thus, about the middle of the thirteenth century, that the Romans called from Bologna the senator Brancia Leone whose fame and merit have been rescued from oblivion by the pen of an English historian. A just anxiety for his reputation, a clear foresight of the difficulties of the task, had engaged him to refuse the honor of their choice. The statutes of Rome were suspended, and his office prolonged to the term of three years. By the guilty and licentious he was accused as cruel, by the clergy he was suspected as partial, but the friends of peace and order applauded the firm and upright magistrate by whom those blessings were restored. No criminals were so powerful as to brave, so obscure as to elude the justice of the senator. By his sentence two nobles of the Anibaldi family were executed on a gibbet, and he inexorably demolished, in the city and neighborhood, one hundred and forty towers, the strong shelters of rapine and mischief. The bishop, as a simple bishop, was compelled to reside in his diocese, and the standard of Brancia Leone was displayed in the field with terror and effect. His services were repaid by the ingratitude of the people and worthy of the happiness which they enjoyed. By the public robbers, whom he had provoked for their sake, the Romans were excited to depose and imprison their benefactor. Nor would his life have been spared, if Bologna had not possessed a pledge for his safety. Before his departure, the prudent senator had required the exchange of thirty hostages of the noblest families of Rome. On the news of his danger, and at the prayer of his wife, they were more strictly guarded, and Bologna, in the cause of honor, sustained the thunders of a papal interdict. This generous resistance allowed the Romans to compare the present with the past, and Brancialione was conducted from the prison to the capital, amidst the acclamations of a repentant people. The reminder of his government was firm and fortunate, and as soon as envy was appeased by death, 
his head, enclosed in a precious vase, was deposited on a lofty column of marble. The impotence of reason and virtue recommended in Italy a more effectual choice, instead of a private citizen, to whom they yielded a voluntary and precarious obedience, the Romans elected for their senator some prince of independent power, who could defend them from their enemies and themselves. Charles of Anjou and Provence, the most ambitious and warlike monarch of the age, accepted at the same time the kingdom of Naples from the Pope, and the office of senator from the Roman people. As he passed through the city in his road to victory, he received their oath of allegiance, lodged in the Lateran palace, and smoothed in a short visit the harsh features of his despotic character. Yet even Charles was exposed to the inconstancy of the people, who saluted with the same acclamations the passage of his rival, the unfortunate Conradin, and a powerful avenger who reigned in the capital, alarmed the fears and jealousy of the popes. The absolute term of his life was superseded by a renewal every third year, and the enmity of Nicholas the Third obliged the Sicilian king to abdicate the government of Rome. In his bull, a perpetual law, the imperious pontiff asserts the truth, validity, and use of the donation of Constantine, not less essential to the peace of the city than to the independence of the church, establishes the annual election of the senator, and formally disqualifies all emperors, kings, princes, and persons of an eminent and conspicuous rank. This prohibitory clause was repealed in his own behalf by Martin the Fourth, who humbly solicited the suffrage of the Romans. In the presence, and by the authority of the people, two electors conferred, not on the Pope, but on the noble and faithful Martin, the dignity of senator, and the supreme administration of the Republic to hold during his natural life, and to exercise at pleasure by himself or his deputies. About fifty years afterwards, the same title was granted to the Emperor Levis of Bavaria, and the liberty of Rome was acknowledged by her two sovereigns, who accepted a municipal office in the government of their own metropolis. In the first moments of rebellion, when Arnold of Brescia had inflamed their minds against the church, the Romans artfully labored to conciliate the favor of the empire, and to recommend their merit and services in the cause of Caesar. The style of their ambassadors to Conrad III and Frederick I is a mixture of flattery and pride, the tradition and the ignorance of their own history. After some complaint of his silence and neglect, they exhort the former of these princes to pass the Alps, and assume from their hands the imperial crown. We beseech your majesty not to disdain the humility of your sons and vessels, not to listen to the accusations of our common enemies, who calumniate the senate as hostile to your throne, who sow the seeds of discord, that they may reap the harvest of destruction. The Pope and the Sicilian are united in an impious league to oppose our liberty and your coronation. With the blessing of God, our zeal and courage has hitherto defeated their attempt. Of their powerful and factious adherents, more especially the Frangipani, we have taken by assault the houses and turrets. Some of these are occupied by our troops, and some are leveled with the ground. The Milvian Bridge, which they had broken, is restored and fortified for your safe passage, and your army may enter the city without being annoyed from the castle of St. Angelo. All that we have done, and all that we design, is for your honor and service, in the loyal hope that you will speedily appear in person to vindicate these rights which have been invaded by the clergy, to revive the dignity of the empire, and to surpass the fame and glory of your predecessors. May you fix your residence in Rome, the capital of the world, give laws to Italy and the Teutonic kingdom, and imitate the example of Constantine and Justinian, who by the vigor of the senate and people obtained the scepter of the earth. But these splendid and fallacious wishes were not cherished by Conrad the Franconian, whose eyes were fixed on the Holy Land, and who died without visiting Rome soon after his return from the Holy Land. His nephew and successor, Frederick Barbarossa, was more ambitious of the imperial crown. 
nor had any of the successors of Otho acquired such absolute sway over the kingdom of Italy. Surrounded by his ecclesiastical and secular princes, he gave audience in his camp at Sutri to the ambassadors of Rome, who thus addressed him in a free and florid oration. Incline your ear to the queen of cities. Approach with a peaceful and friendly mind the precincts of Rome, which has cast away the yoke of the clergy, and is impatient to crown her legitimate emperor. Under your auspicious influence may the primitive times be restored. Assert the prerogatives of the eternal city, and reduce under her monarchy the insolence of the world. You are not ignorant that, in a former age, by the wisdom of the senate, by the valor and discipline of the equestrian order, she extended her victorious arms to the east and west, beyond the Alps, and over the islands of the ocean. By our sins, in the absence of our princes, the noble institution of the Senate has sunk in oblivion, and with our prudence our strength has likewise decreased. We have revived the Senate and the equestrian order, the counsels of the one, the arms of the other, will be devoted to your person and the service of the empire. Do you not hear the language of the Roman matron? You were guest. I have adopted you as a citizen, a transalpine stranger. I have elected you for my sovereign, and given you myself and all that is mine. Your first and most sacred duty is to swear and subscribe, that you will shed your blood for the Republic, that you will maintain in peace and justice the laws of the city, and the charters of your predecessors, and that you will reward with five thousand pounds of silver the faithful senators who shall proclaim your titles in the capital. With the name, assume the character of Augustus. The flowers of Latin rhetoric were not yet exhausted, but Frederick, impatient of their vanity, interrupted the orators in the high tone of royalty and conquest. Famous indeed have been the fortitude and wisdom of the ancient Romans. But your speech is not seasoned with wisdom, and I could wish that fortitude were conspicuous in your actions. Like all sublunary things, Rome has felt the vicissitudes of time and fortune. Your noblest families were translated to the east, to the royal city of Constantine, and the remains of your strength and freedom have long since been exhausted by the Greeks and Franks. Are you desirous of beholding the ancient glory of Rome, the gravity of the Senate, the spirit of the knights, the discipline of the camp, the valor of the legions? You will find them in the German Republic. It is not empire naked and alone. The ornaments and virtues of empire have likewise migrated beyond the Alps to a more deserving people. They will be employed in your defense, but they claim your obedience. You pretend that myself or my predecessors have been invited by the Romans. You mistake the word. They were not invited, they were implored. From its foreign and domestic tyrants, the city was rescued by Charlemagne and Otho, whose ashes repose in our country, and their dominion was the price of your deliverance. Under that dominion your ancestors lived and died. I claim by the right of inheritance and possession. And who shall dare to extort you from my hands? Is the hand of the Franks and Germans enfeebled by age? Am I vanquished? Am I a captive? Am I not encompassed with the banners of a potent and invincible army? You impose conditions on your master. You require oaths. If the conditions are just, an oath is superfluous. If unjust, it is criminal. Can you doubt my equity? It is extended to the meanest of my subjects. Will not my sword be unsheathed in the defense of the capital? By that sword, the northern kingdom of Denmark has been restored to the Roman Empire. You prescribe the measure and the objects of my bounty, which flows in a copious but a voluntary stream. All will be given to patient merit. All will be denied to rude importunity. Neither the emperor nor the senate could maintain these lofty pretensions of dominion and liberty. United with the pope and suspicious of the Romans, Frederick continued his march to the Vatican. His coronation was disturbed by a sally from the capital, and if the numbers and valor of the Germans prevailed in the bloody conflict, he could not safely encamp in the presence of a city of which he styled himself the sovereign. 
About twelve years afterwards, he besieged Rome, to seat an antipope in the chair of St. Peter, and twelve pisan galleys were introduced into the Tiber. But the senate and people were saved by the arts of negotiation, and the progress of disease. Nor did Frederick or his successors reiterate the hostile attempt. Their laborious reigns were exercised by the popes, the crusades, and the independence of Lombardy and Germany. They courted the alliance of the Romans and Frederick II offered in the capital the great standard, the Caraccio of Milan. After the extinction of the House of Swabia, they were banished beyond the Alps, and their last coronations betrayed the impotence and poverty of the Teutonic Caesars. Under the reign of Adrian, when the empire extended from the Euphrates to the ocean, from Mount Atlas to the Grampian Hills, a fanciful historian amused the Romans with the picture of their ancient wars. There was a time, says Florus, when Tibur and Praeneste, our summer retreats, were the objects of hostile woes in the capital, when we dreaded the shades of the Arician groves, when we could triumph without a blush over the nameless villages of the Sabines and Latins, and even Corioli could afford a title not unworthy of a victorious general. The pride of his contemporaries was gratified by the contrast of the past and the present. They would have been humbled by the prospect of futurity, by the prediction that after a thousand years, Rome, despoiled of empire and contracted to her primeval limits, would renew the same hostilities, on the same ground which was then decorated with her villas and gardens. The adjacent territory on either side of the Tiber was always claimed, and sometimes possessed, as the patrimony of St. Peter. But the barons assumed a lawless independence, and the cities too faithfully copied the revolt and discord of the metropolis. In the twelfth and thirteenth centuries, the Romans incessantly labored to reduce or destroy the contumacious vassals of the church and senate, and if their headstrong and selfish ambition was moderated by the pope, he often encouraged their zeal by the alliance of his spiritual arms. Their warfare was that of the first consuls and dictators, who were taken from the plough. They assembled in arms at the foot of the capital, sallied from the gates, plundered or burned the harvests of their neighbors, engaged in tumultuary conflict, and returned home after an expedition of fifteen or twenty days. Their sieges were tedious and unskillful. In the use of victory, they indulged the meaner passions of jealousy and revenge, and instead of adopting the valor, they trampled on the misfortunes of their adversaries. The captives in their shirts, with a rope around their necks, solicited their pardon. The fortifications, and even the buildings of the rival cities, were demolished, and the inhabitants were scattered in the adjacent villages. It was thus that the seats of the cardinal bishops, Porto, Ostia, Albanum, Tusculum, Praeneste, and Tibur or Tivoli, were successively overthrown by the ferocious hostility of the Romans. Of these, Porto and Ostia, the two keys of the Tiber, are still vacant and desolate. The marshy and unwholesome banks are peopled with herds of buffaloes, and the river is lost to every purpose of navigation and trade. The hills, which afford a shady retirement from the autumnal heat, have again smiled with the blessings of peace. Frescati has arisen near the ruins of Tusculum, Tibur or Tivoli has resumed the honors of a city, and the meaner towns of Albano and Palestrina are decorated with the villas of the cardinals and princes of Rome. In the work of destruction, the ambition of the Romans was often checked and repulsed by the neighboring cities and their allies. In the first siege of Tibur, they were driven from their camp, and the battles of Tusculum and Viterbo might be compared in their relative state to the memorable fields of Trasimene and Cannae. In the first of these pity wars, thirty thousand Romans were overthrown by a thousand German horse, whom Frederick Barbarossa had detached to the relief of Tusculum. And if we number the slain at three, the prisoners at two thousand, we shall embrace the most authentic and moderate account. Sixty-eight years afterwards they marched against Viterbo in the ecclesiastical state with the whole force of the city, 
By a rare coalition the Teutonic Eagle was blended, in the adverse banners, with the keys of St. Peter, and the Pope's auxiliaries were commanded by a count of Toulouse and a bishop of Winchester. The Romans were discomfited with shame and slaughter, but the English prelate must have indulged the vanity of a pilgrim if he multiplied their numbers to one hundred and their loss in the field to thirty thousand men. Had the policy of the Senate and the discipline of the legions been restored with the capital, the divided condition of Italy would have offered the fairest opportunity of a second conquest. But in arms the modern Romans were not above, and in arts they were far below the common level of the neighboring republics. Nor was their warlike spirit of any long continuance. After some irregular sallies, they subsided in the national apathy, in the neglect of military institutions, and in the disgraceful and dangerous use of foreign mercenaries. Ambition is a weed of quick and early vegetation in the vineyard of Christ. Under the first Christian princes, the chair of St. Peter was disputed by the votes, the venality, the violence, of a popular election. The sanctuaries of Rome were polluted with blood, and, from the third to the twelfth century, the church was distracted by the mischief of frequent schisms. As long as the final appeal was determined by the civil magistrate, these mischiefs were transient and local. The merits were tried by equity or favor, nor could the unsuccessful competitor long disturb the triumph of his rival. But after the emperors had been divested of their prerogatives, after a maxim had been established that the vicar of Christ is amenable to no earthly tribunal, each vacancy of the holy seat might involve Christendom in controversy and war. The claims of the cardinals and inferior clergy, of the nobles and people, were vague and litigious. The freedom of choice was overruled by the tumults of a city that no longer owned or obeyed a superior. On the decease of a pope, two factions proceeded in different churches to a double election. The number and weight of votes, the priority of time, the merit of the candidates, might balance each other. The most respectable of the clergy were divided and the distant princes who bowed before the spiritual throne could not distinguish the spurious from the legitimate idol. The emperors were often the authors of the schism. From the political motive of opposing a friendly to a hostile pontiff, and each of the competitors was reduced to suffer the insults of his enemies, who were not aved by conscience, and to purchase the support of his adherents, who were instigated by avarice or ambition, a peaceful and perpetual succession was ascertained by Alexander the Third, who finally abolished the tumultuary votes of the clergy and people, and defined the right of election in the sole college of cardinals. The three orders of bishops, priests, and deacons were assimilated to each other by this important privilege. The parochial clergy of Rome obtained the first rank in the hierarchy, they were indifferently chosen among the nations of Christendom, and the possession of the richest benefices of the most important bishoprics was not incompatible with their title and office. The senators of the Catholic Church, the coadjutors and legates of the Supreme Pontiff, were robed in purple, the symbol of martyrdom or royalty. They claimed a proud equality with kings, and their dignity was enhanced by the smallest of their number, which, till the reign of Leo X, seldom exceeded twenty or twenty-five persons. By this wise regulation all doubt and scandal were removed, and the root of schism was so effectually destroyed, that in the period of six hundred years a double choice has only once divided the unity of the sacred college. But as the concurrence of two-thirds of the votes had been made necessary, the election was often delayed by the private interest and passions of the cardinals. And while they prolonged their independent reign, the Christian world was left destitute of a head. A vacancy of almost three years had preceded the elevation of George X, who resolved to prevent the future abuse, and his bull, after some opposition, has been consecrated in the code of the canon law. Nine days are allowed for the obsequies of the deceased Pope, and the arrival of the absent cardinals. On the tenth, they are imprisoned, each with one domestic, in a common apartment or conclave, 
without any separation of walls or curtains. A small window is reserved for the introduction of necessaries. But the door is locked on both sides and guarded by the magistrates of the city to seclude them from all correspondence with the world. If the election be not consummated in three days, the luxury of their table is contracted to a single dish at dinner and supper, and after the eighth day they are reduced to a scanty allowance of bread, water, and wine. During the vacancy of the holy seat, the cardinals are prohibited from touching the revenues, or assuming, unless in some rare emergency, gets the government of the church. All agreements and promises among the electors are formally annulled, and their integrity is fortified by their solemn oaths and the prayers of the Catholics. Some articles of inconvenient or superfluous rigor have been gradually relaxed, but the principle of confinement is vigorous and entire. They are still urged, by the personal motives of health and freedom, to accelerate the moment of their deliverance, and the improvement of ballot or secret votes, has wrapped the struggles of the conclave in the silky veil of charity and politeness. By these institutions the Romans were excluded from the election of their prince and bishop, and in the fever of wild and precarious liberty they seemed insensible of the loss of this inestimable privilege. The Emperor Louis of Bavaria revived the example of his great Otho. After some negotiation with the magistrates, the Roman people were assembled in the square before St. Peter's. The Pope of Avignon, John the Twenty Second, was deposed. The choice of his successor was ratified by their consent and applause. They freely voted for a new law, that their bishop should never be absent more than three months in the year, and two days' journey from the city, and that if he neglected to return on the third summons, the public servant should be degraded and dismissed. But Louis forgot his own debility and the prejudices of the time. Beyond the precincts of a German camp, his useless phantom was rejected. The Romans despised their own workmanship. The antipope implored the mercy of his lawful sovereign, and the exclusive right of the cardinals was more firmly established by this unseasonable attack. Had the election been always held in the Vatican, the rights of the Senate and people would not have been violated with impunity. But the Romans forgot, and were forgotten, in the absence of the successors of Gregory the Seventh, who did not keep as a divine precept their ordinary residence in the city and diocese. The care of the diocese was less important than the government of the universal church, nor could the popes delight in a city in which their authority was always opposed, and their person was often endangered. From the persecution of the emperors and the wars of Italy, they escaped beyond the Alps into the hospitable bosom of France. From the tumults of Rome they prudently withdrew to live and die in the more tranquil stations of Anagni, Perugia, Viterbo, and the adjacent cities. When the flock was offended or impoverished by the absence of the shepherd, they were recalled by a stern admonition that St. Peter had fixed his chair, not in an obscure village, but in the capital of the world by a ferocious menace, that the Romans would march in arms to destroy the place and people that should dare to afford them a retreat. They returned with timorous obedience, and were saluted with the account of a heavy debt, of all the losses which their desertion had occasioned, the hire of lodgings, the sale of provisions, and the various expenses of servants and strangers who attended the court. After a short interval of peace, and perhaps of authority, they were again banished by new tumults, and again summoned by the imperious or respectful invitation of the Senate. In these occasional retreats, the exiles and fugitives of the Vatican were seldom long or far distant from the metropolis, but in the beginning of the fourteenth century the apostolic throne was transported, as it might seem forever, from the Tiber to the Rhone, and the cause of the transmigration may be deduced from the furious contest between Boniface the Eighth and the King of France. The spiritual arms of excommunication and interdict were repulsed by the union of the three estates and the privileges of the Gallican Church, but the Pope was not prepared against the carnal weapons which Philip the Fair had courage to employ. As the Pope resided at Anagni, 
without the suspicion of danger, his palace and person were assaulted by three hundred horse, who had been secretly levied by William of Nogaret, a French minister, and Scarra Colonna, of a noble but hostile family of Rome. The cardinals fled. The inhabitants of Anagni were seduced from their allegiance and gratitude. But the dauntless Boniface, unarmed and alone, seated himself in his chair and awaited, like the conscript fathers of old, the swords of the Gauls. Nogaret, a foreign adversary, was content to execute the orders of his master. By the domestic enmity of Colonna, he was insulted with words and blows, and during a confinement of three days his life was threatened by the hardships which they inflicted on the obstinacy which they provoked. Their strange delay gave time and courage to the adherents of the church, who rescued him from sacrilegious violence. But his imperious soul was wounded in the vital part, and Boniface expired at Rome in a frenzy of rage and revenge. His memory is stained with the glaring vices of avarice and pride, nor has the courage of a martyr promoted this ecclesiastical champion to the honors of a saint. A magnanimous sinner, say the chronicles of the times, who entered like a fox, reigned like a lion, and died like a dog. He was succeeded by Benedict the Eleventh, the mildest of mankind. Yet he excommunicated the impious emissaries of Philip, and devoted the city and people of Arnagni by a tremendous course whose effects are still visible to the eyes of superstition. After his decease, the tedious and equal suspense of the conclave was fixed by the dexterity of the French faction. A special offer was made and accepted, that in the term of forty days they would elect one of the three candidates, who should be named by their opponents. The Archbishop of Bordeaux, a furious enemy of his king and country, was the first on the list, but his ambition was known, and his conscience obeyed the calls of fortune and the commands of a benefactor, who had been informed by a swift messenger that the choice of a pope was now in his hands. The terms were regulated in a private interview, and with such speed and secrecy was the business transacted that the unanimous conclave applauded the election of Clement V. The cardinals of both parties were soon astonished by a summons to attend him beyond the Alps, from whence as they soon discovered they must never hope to return. He was engaged by promise and affection to prefer the residence of France, and after dragging his court through Poitou and Gascony, and devouring by his expense the cities and contents on the road, he finally reposed at Avignon, which flourished above seventy years, the seat of the Roman pontiff and the metropolis of Christendom. By land, by sea, by the Rhone, the position of Avignon was on all sides accessible. The southern provinces of France do not yield to Italy itself. New palaces arose from the accommodation of the Pope and Cardinals, and the arts of luxury were soon attracted by the treasures of the Church. They were already possessed of the adjacent territory, the Venaissin County, a populous and fertile spot, and the sovereignty of Avignon was afterwards purchased from the youth and distress of Jane the first queen of Naples and countess of Provence, for the inadequate price of fourscore thousand florins. Under the shadow of a French monarchy, amidst an obedient people, the popes enjoyed an honorable and tranquil state, to which they long had been strangers. But Italy deplored their absence, and Rome, in solitude and poverty, might repent of the ungovernable freedom which had driven from the Vatican the successor of St. Peter. Her repentance was tardy and fruitless. After the death of the old members, the sacred college was filled with French cardinals, who beheld Rome and Italy with abhorrence and contempt, and perpetuated a series of national and even provincial popes, attached by the most indissoluble ties to their native country. The progress of industry had produced and enriched the Italian republics, the era of their liberty is the most flourishing period of population and agriculture, of manufactures and commerce, and their mechanic labors were gradually refined into the arts of elegance and genius. But the position of Rome was less favorable, the territory less fruitful, the character of the inhabitants was debased by indolence and elated by pride, and they fondly conceived that the tribute of subjects must forever nourish the metropolis of the church and empire. 
This prejudice was encouraged in some degree by the resort of pilgrims to the shrines of the apostles. And the last legacy of the popes, the institution of the holy year, was not less beneficial to the people than to the clergy. Since the loss of Palestine, the gift of plenary indulgences, which had been applied to the crusades, remained without an object, and the most valuable treasure of the church was sequestered above eight years from public circulation. A new channel was opened by the diligence of Boniface the Eighth, who reconciled the vices of ambition and avarice, and the Pope had sufficient learning to recollect and revive the secular games which were celebrated in Rome at the conclusion of every century. To sound without danger the depths of popular credulity, a sermon was seasonably pronounced, a report was artfully scattered, some aged witnesses were produced, and on the 1st of January of the year 1300, the Church of St. Peter was crowded with the faithful, who demanded the customary indulgence of the holy time. The pontiff, who watched and irritated their devout impatience, was soon persuaded by ancient testimony of the justice of their claim, and he proclaimed a plenary absolution to all Catholics, who, in the course of that year and at every similar period, should respectfully visit the apostolic churches of St. Peter and St. Paul. The welcome sound was propagated through Christendom, and at first from the nearest provinces of Italy, and at length from the remote kingdoms of Hungary and Britain, the highways were thronged with a swarm of pilgrims who sought to expiate their sins in a journey, however costly or laborious, which was exempt from the perils of military service. All exceptions of rank or sex, of age or or infirmity, were forgotten in the common transport, and in the streets and churches many persons were trampled to death by the eagerness of devotion. The calculation of their numbers could not be easy nor accurate, and they have probably been magnified by the sterous clergy, well apprised of the contagion of example. Yet we are assured by a judicious historian, who assisted at the ceremony, that Rome was never replenished with less than two hundred thousand strangers and another spectator has fixed at two millions the total concourse of the year. A trifling oblation from each individual would accumulate a royal treasure, and two priests stood night and day, with rags in their hands, to collect without counting the heaps of gold and silver that were poured on the altar of St. Paul. It was fortunately a season of peace and plenty, and if forage was scarce, if inns and lodgings were extravagantly dear, an exhaustible supply of bread and wine, of meat and fish, was provided by the policy of Boniface and the venal hospitality of the Romans. From a city without trade or industry, all casual riches will speedily evaporate, but the avarice and envy of the next generation solicited Clement the Sixth to anticipate the distant period of the century. The gracious pontiff complied with their wishes, afforded Rome this poor consolation for his loss, and justified the change by the name and practice of the Mosaic Jubilee. His summons was obeyed, and the number, zeal, and liberality of the pilgrims did not yield to the primitive festival, but they encountered the triple scourge of war, pestilence, and famine. Many wives and virgins were violated in the castles of Italy, and many strangers were pillaged or murdered by the savage Romans, no longer moderated by the presence of their bishops. To the impatience of the popes we may ascribe the successive reduction to fifty, thirty-three, and twenty-five years, although the second of these terms is commensurate with the life of Christ. The profusion of indulgences, the revolt of the Protestants, and the decline of superstition have much diminished the value of the jubilee. Yet even the nineteenth and last festival was a year of pleasure and profit to the Romans and the philosophic smile will not disturb the triumph of the priest or the happiness of the people. In the beginning of the eleventh century, Italy was exposed to the feudal tyranny, alike oppressive to the sovereign and to the people. The rights of human nature were vindicated by her numerous republics, who soon extended their liberty and dominion from the city to the adjacent country. The sword of the nobles was broken, their slaves were enfranchised. Their castles were demolished, they assumed the habits of society and obedience, their ambition was confined to municipal honors, and in the proudest aristocracy of Venice or Genoa, each patrician was subject to the laws. But the feeble and disorderly government of Rome 
was unequal to the task of curbing her rebellious sons, who scorned the authority of the magistrate within and without the walls. It was no longer a civil contention between the nobles and plebeians from the government of the state. The barons asserted in arms their personal independence, their palaces and castles were fortified against the siege, and their private quarrels were maintained by the numbers of their vassals and retainers. In origin and affection, they were aliens to the country, and a genuine Roman, could such have been produced, might have renounced these haughty strangers, who disdained the appellation of citizens, and proudly styled themselves the princes of Rome. After a dark series of revolutions, all records of pedigree were lost, the distinction of surnames were abolished, the blood of the nations was mingled with a thousand channels, and the Goths and Lombards, the Greeks and Franks, the Germans and Normans had obtained the fairest possessions by royal bounty, or the prerogative of valor. These examples might be readily presumed, but the elevation of a Hebrew race to the rank of senators and consuls is an event without a parallel in the long captivity of these miserable exiles. In the time of Leo the Ninth, a wealthy and learned Jew was converted to Christianity and honored at his baptism with the name of his godfather, the reigning pope. The zeal and courage of Peter, the son of Leo, were signalized in the cause of Gregory the Seventh, who entrusted his faithful adherent with the government of Adrian's Mole, the Tower of Crescentius, or, as it is now called, the Castle of St. Angelo. Both the father and the son were the parents of a numerous progeny, their riches, the fruits of usury, were shared with the noblest families of the city, and so extensive was their alliance that the grandson of the proselyte was exalted by the weight of his kindred to the throne of St. Peter. A majority of the clergy and people supported his cause. He reigned several years in the Vatican, and it is only the eloquence of St. Benrad and the final triumph of Innocent II that has branded Anacletus with the epithet of Antipope. After his defeat and death, the posterity of Leo is no longer conspicuous, and none will be found of the modern nobles ambitious of descending from a Jewish stock. It is not my design to enumerate the Roman families which have failed at different periods, or those which are continuing in different degrees of splendor to the present time. The old consular line of the Frangipani discovers their name in the generous act of breaking or dividing bread in a time of famine, and such benevolence is more truly glorious than to have enclosed with their allies the Corsi, a spacious quarter of the city in the chains of their fortifications. The Savelli, as it should seem a Sabine race, have maintained their original dignity. The obsolete surname of the Capizucci is inscribed on the coins of the first senators. The Conti preserve the honor without the estate, of the Counts of Signia, and the Annibaldi must have been very ignorant or very modest if they had not descended from the Carthaginian hero. But among, perhaps above, the peers and princes of the city, I distinguish the rival houses of Colonna and Ursini, whose private story is an essential part of the annals of modern Rome. The name and arms of Colonna have been the theme of much doubtful etymology, nor have the orators and antiquarians overlooked either Trajan's pillar, or the columns of Hercules, or the pillar of Christ's flagellation, or the luminous column that guided the Israelites into the desert. Their first historical appearance in the year 1104 attests the power and antiquity, while it explains the simple meaning of the name. By the usurpation of Cavae, the Colonna provoked the arms of Pascal II, but they lawfully held in the Campania of Rome the hereditary fiefs of Zagarola and Colonna, and the latter of these towns was probably adorned with some lofty pillar, the relic of a villa or temple. They likewise possessed one moiety of the neighboring city of Tusculum, a strong presumption of their descent from the counts of Tusculum, who in the 10th century were the tyrants of the Apostolic See. According to their own and the public opinion, the primitive and remote source was derived from the banks of the Rhine, and the sovereigns of Germany were not ashamed of a real or fabulous affinity with the noble race, which in the revolutions of seven hundred years has been often illustrated by merit and always by fortune. About the end of the thirteenth century, 
the most powerful branch was composed of an uncle and six brothers, all conspicuous in arms, or in the honors of the church. Of these, Peter was elected senator of Rome, introduced to the capital in a triumphal car, and hailed in some vain acclamations with the title of Caesar, while John and Stephen were declared Marquis of Hancona and Count of Romagna, by Nicholas IV, a patron so partial to their family, that he has been delineated in satirical portraits, imprisoned as it were in a hollow pillar. After his decease, their haughty behavior provoked the displeasure of the most implacable of mankind. The two cardinals, the uncle and the nephew, denied the election of Boniface VIII, and the Colonna were oppressed by, for a moment by his temporal and spiritual arms. He proclaimed a crusade against his personal enemies. Their estates were confiscated. Their fortresses on either side of the Tiber were besieged by the troops of St. Peter and those of the rival nobles. And after the ruin of Palestrina or Praeneste, their principal seat, the ground was marked with a plugshare, the emblem of perpetual desolation. Degraded, banished, proscribed, the six brothers, in disguise and danger, wandered over Europe without renouncing the hope of deliverance and revenge. In this double hope, the French court was their surest asylum. They prompted and directed the enterprise of Philip, and I should praise their magnanimity had they respected the misfortune and courage of the captive tyrant. His civil acts were annulled by the Roman people, who restored the honors and possessions of the Colonna, and some estimate may be formed of their wealth by their losses, of their losses by the damages of one hundred thousand gold florins, which were granted them against the accomplices and heirs of the deceased Pope. All the spiritual censures and disqualifications were abolished by his prudent successors, and the fortune of the house was more firmly established by this transient hurricane. The boldness of Schiara Colonna was signalized in the captivity of Boniface, and long afterwards in the coronation of Louis of Bavaria, and by the gratitude of the emperor, the pillar in their arms was encircled with a royal crown. But the first of the family in fame and merit was the elder Stephen, whom Petrarch loved and esteemed as a hero, superior to his own times, and not unworthy of ancient Rome. Persecution and exile displayed to the nations his abilities in peace and war. In his distress he was an object, not of pity, but of reverence. The aspect of danger provoked him to avow his name and country, and when he was asked, Where is now your fortress? He laid his hand on his heart, and answered, Here. He supported with the same virtue the return of prosperity, and, till the ruin of his declining age, the ancestors, the character, and the children of Stephen Colonna exalted his dignity in the Roman Republic and at the court of Avignon. The Ursini migrated from Spoleto, the sons of Ursus, as they are styled in the twelfth century, from some eminent person, who is only known as the father of their race. But they were soon distinguished among the nobles of Rome, by the number and bravery of their kinsmen, the strength of their towers, the honors of the senate and sacred college, and the elevation of two popes, Celestine III and Nicholas III of their name and lineage. Their riches may be accused as an early abuse of nepotism. The estates of St. Peter were alienated in the favor by the liberal Celestine, and Nicholas was ambitious for their sake to solicit the alliance of monarchs, to found new kingdoms in Lombardy and Tuscany, and to invest them with the perpetual office of senators of Rome. All that has been observed of the greatness of the Colonna will likewise redeem to the glory of the Ursini, their constant and equal antagonists in the long hereditary void, which distracted above two hundred and fifty years the ecclesiastical state. The jealousy of preeminence and power was the true ground of their quarrel, but as a specious badge of distinction, the Colonna embraced the name of Ghibellines and the party of the empire. The Ursini espoused the title of Guelphs, and the cause of the church. The eagle and the keys are displayed in their adverse banners, and the two factions of Italy most furiously raged, when the origin and nature of the dispute were long since forgotten. After the retreat of the popes to Avignon, they disputed in arms the vacant republic, 
and the mischiefs of discord were perpetuated by the wretched compromise of electing each year two rival senators. By their private hostilities the city and country were desolated, and the fluctuating balance inclined with their alternate success. But none of either family had fallen by the sword, till the most renowned champion of the Ursini was surprised and slain by the younger Stephen Colonna. His triumph was stained with the reproach of violating the truce. Their defeat was basely avenged by the assassination, before the church door, of an innocent boy and his two servants. Yet the victorious Colonna, with an annual colleague, was declared senator of Rome during the term of five years. And the muse of Petrarch inspired a wish, a hope, a prediction, that the generous youth, the son of his venerable hero, would restore Rome and Italy to their pristine glory, that his justice would extirpate the wolves and lions, the serpents and bears, who labored to subvert the eternal basis of the marble column. In the apprehension of modern times, Petrarch is the Italian songster of Laura and love. In the harmony of his Tuscan rhymes, Italy applauds, or rather adores, the father of her lyric poetry, and his verse, or at least his name, is repeated by the enthusiasm or affectation of amorous sensibility. Whatever may be the private taste of a stranger, his slight and superficial knowledge should humbly acquiesce in the judgment of a learned nation, yet I may hope or presume that the Italians do not compare the tedious uniformity of sonnets and elegies with the sublime compositions of their epic muse, the original wildness of Dante, the regular beauties of Tasso, and the boundless variety of the incomparable Ariosto. The merits of the lover I am still less qualified to appreciate, nor am I deeply interested in a metaphysical passion for a nymph so shadowy that her existence has been questioned, for a matron so prolific that she was delivered of eleven legitimate children, while her amorous swain sighed and sung at the fountain of Vaucluse. But, in the eyes of Petrarch, and those of his graver contemporaries, his love was a sin, and Italian verse a frivolous amusement. His Latin works, of philosophy, poetry, and eloquence, established his serious reputation, which was soon diffused from Avignon over France and Italy. His friends and disciples were multiplied in every city, and if the ponderous volume of his writings be now abandoned to a long repose, our gratitude must applaud the man who, by precept and example, revived the spirit and study of the Augustan age. From his earliest youth, Petrarch aspired to the poetic crown. The academical honours of the three faculties had introduced a royal degree of master or doctor in the art of poetry, and the title of poet laureate, which custom rather than vanity perpetuates in the English court, was first invented by the Caesars of Germany. In the musical games of antiquity, a prize was bestowed on the victor. The belief that Virgil and Horace had been crowned in the capital inflamed the emulation of a Latin bard, and the laurel was endeared to the lover by a verbal resemblance with the name of his mistress. The value of either object was enhanced by the difficulties of the pursuit, and if the virtue or prudence of Laura was inexorable, he enjoyed, and might boast of enjoying, the nymph of poetry. His vanity was not of the most delicate kind, since he applauds the success of his own labours, his name was popular, his friends were active, the open or secret opposition of envy and prejudice was surmounted by the dexterity of patient merit. In the thirty-sixth year of his age he was solicited to accept the object of his wishes, and on the same day, in the solitude of Vaucluse, he received a similar and solemn invitation from the Senate of Rome and the University of Paris. The learning of a theological school and the ignorance of a lawless city were alike unqualified to bestow the ideal though immortal wreath which genius may obtain from the free applause of the public and of posterity. But the candidate dismissed this troublesome reflection, and after some moments of complacency and suspense, preferred the summons of the metropolis of the world. The ceremony of his coronation was performed in the capital, by his friend and patron the Supreme Magistrate of the Republic. 
Twelve patrician youths were arrayed in scarlet, six representatives of the most illustrious families in green robes with garlands of flowers accompanied the procession. In the midst of the princes and nobles, the senator, Count of Anguillara, a kinsman of the Colonna, assumed his throne, and at the voice of a herald, Petrarch arose. After discoursing on a text of Virgil, and thrice repeating his vows for the prosperity of Rome, he knelt before the throne, and received from the senator a laurel crown, with a more precious declaration, This is the reward of merit. The people shouted, Long life to the capital and the poet! A sonnet in praise of Rome was accepted as the effusion of genius and gratitude, and after the whole procession had visited the Vatican, the profane wreath was suspended before the shrine of St. Peter. In the act or diploma which was presented to Petrarch, the title and prerogatives of Poet Laureate are revived in the capital, after the lapse of thirteen hundred years, and he receives the perpetual privilege of wearing, at his choice, a crown of laurel, ivy, or myrtle, of assuming the poetic habit, and of teaching, disputing, interpreting, and composing in all places whatsoever, and on all subjects of literature. The grant was ratified by the authority of the Senate and people, and the character of citizen was the recompense of his affection for the Roman name. They did him honour, but they did him justice. In the familiar society of Cicero and Livy, he had imbibed the ideas of an ancient patriot, and his ardent fancy kindled every idea to a sentiment, and every sentiment to a passion. The aspect of the seven hills and their majestic ruins confirmed these lively impressions, and he loved a country by whose liberal spirit he had been crowned and adopted. The poverty and debasement of Rome excited the indignation and pity of her grateful son, he dissembled the faults of his fellow-citizens, applauded with partial fondness the last of their heroes and matrons, and, in the remembrance of the past, in the hopes of the future, was pleased to forget the miseries of the present time. Rome was still the lawful mistress of the world. The Pope and the Emperor, the Bishop and General, had abdicated their station by an inglorious retreat to the Rhone and the Danube, but if she could resume her virtue, the Republic might again vindicate her liberty and dominion. Amidst the indulgence of enthusiasm and eloquence, Petrarch, Italy, and Europe were astonished by a revolution which realised for a moment his most splendid visions. The rise and fall of the Tribune Rienzi will occupy the following pages. The subject is interesting, the materials are rich, and the glance of a patriot bard will sometimes vivify the copious but simple narrative of the Florentine, and more especially of the Roman, historian. In a quarter of the city which was inhabited only by mechanics and Jews, the marriage of an innkeeper and a washerwoman produced the future deliverer of Rome. From such parents, Nicolas Rienzi Gabrini could inherit neither dignity nor fortune, and the gift of a liberal education which they painfully bestowed was the cause of his glory and untimely end. The study of history and eloquence, the writings of Cicero, Seneca, Livy, Caesar, and Valerius Maximus, elevated above his equals and contemporaries the genius of the young plebeian. He perused with indefatigable diligence the manuscripts and marbles of antiquity, loved to dispense his knowledge in familiar language, and was often provoked to exclaim, Where are now these Romans? Their virtue, their justice, their power! Why was I not born in these happy times? When the Republic addressed to the throne of Avignon an embassy of the three orders, the spirit and eloquence of Rienzi recommended him to a place among the thirteen deputies of the Commons. The orator had the honour of haranguing Pope Clement the Sixth, and the satisfaction of conversing with Petrarch, a congenial mind. But his aspiring hopes were chilled by disgrace and poverty, and the patriot was reduced to a single garment and the charity of the hospital. From this misery he was relieved by the sense of merit or the smile of favour, and the employment of apostolic notary afforded him a daily stipend of five gold florins, a more honourable and extensive connection, 
and the right of contrasting both in words and actions his own integrity with the vices of the state. The eloquence of Rienzi was prompt and persuasive. The multitude is always prone to envy and censure. He was stimulated by the loss of a brother and the impunity of the assassins, nor was it possible to excuse or exaggerate the public calamities. The blessings of peace and justice for which civil society has been instituted were banished from Rome. The jealous citizens who might have endured every personal or pecuniary injury were most deeply wounded in the dishonour of their wives and daughters. They were equally oppressed by the arrogance of the nobles and the corruption of the magistrates, and the abuse of arms or of laws was the only circumstance that distinguished the lions from the dogs and serpents of the capital. These allegorical emblems were variously repeated in the pictures which Rienzi exhibited in the streets and churches, and while the spectators gazed with curious wonder, the bold and ready orator unfolded the meaning, applied the satire, inflamed their passions, and announced a distant hope of comfort and deliverance. The privileges of Rome, her eternal sovereignty over her princes and provinces, was the theme of his public and private discourse, and a monument of servitude became in his hands a title and incentive of liberty. The decree of the Senate, which granted the most ample prerogatives to the Emperor Vespasian, had been inscribed on a copper plate still extant in the choir of the Church of St. John Lateran. A numerous assembly of nobles and plebeians was invited to this political lecture, and a convenient theatre was erected for their reception. The notary appeared in a magnificent and mysterious habit, explained the inscription by aversion and commentary, and descanted with eloquence and zeal on the ancient glories of the Senate and people, from whom all legal authority was derived. The supine ignorance of the nobles was incapable of discerning the serious tendency of such representations. They might sometimes chastise with words and blows the plebeian reformer, but he was often suffered in the Colonna Palace to amuse the company with his threats and predictions, and the modern Brutus was concealed under the mask of folly and the character of a buffoon. While they indulged their contempt, the restoration of the good estate, his favourite expression, was entertained among the people as a desirable, a possible, and at length as an approaching event, and while all had the disposition to applaud, some had the courage to assist their promised deliverer. A prophecy, or rather a summons, affixed on the church door of St. George was the first public evidence of his designs. A nocturnal assembly of a hundred citizens on Mount Aventine, the first step to their execution. After an oath of secrecy and aid, he represented to the conspirators the importance and facility of their enterprise, that the nobles, without union or resources, were strong only in the fear of their imaginary strength, that all power as well as right was in the hands of the people, that the revenues of the apostolical chamber might relieve the public distress, and that the Pope himself would approve their victory over the common enemies of government and freedom. After securing a faithful band to protect his first declaration, he proclaimed through the city, by sound of trumpet, that on the evening of the following day all persons should assemble without arms before the church of St. Angelo to provide for the re-establishment of the good estate. The whole night was employed in the celebration of thirty masses of the Holy Ghost, and in the morning Rienzi, bareheaded but in complete armour, issued from the church, encompassed by the hundred conspirators. The Pope's vicar, the simple Bishop of Orvieto, who had been persuaded to sustain a part in this singular ceremony, marched on his right hand, and three great standards were borne aloft as the emblems of their design. In the first, the Banner of Liberty, Rome was seated on two lions, with a palm in one hand and a globe in the other. St. Paul, with a drawn sword, was delineated in the banner of justice, and in the third, St. Peter held the keys of concord and peace. Rienzi was encouraged by the presence and applause of an innumerable crowd, who understood little and hoped much, 
and the procession slowly rolled forwards from the castle of St. Angelo to the capital. His triumph was disturbed by some secret emotions which he laboured to suppress. He ascended without opposition, and with seeming confidence, the citadel of the Republic, harangued the people from the balcony, and received the most flattering confirmation of his acts and laws. The nobles, as if destitute of arms and councils, beheld in silent consternation this strange revolution, and the moment had been prudently chosen when the most formidable, Stephen Colonna, was absent from the city. On the first rumour he returned to his palace, affected to despise this plebeian tumult, and declared to the messenger of Rienzi that at his leisure he would cast the madman from the windows of the capital. The great bell instantly rang an alarm, and so rapid was the tide, so urgent was the danger, that Colonna escaped with precipitation to the suburb of St. Lawrence. From thence, after a moment's refreshment, he continued the same speedy career, till he reached in safety his castle of Palestrina, lamenting his own imprudence, which had not trampled the spark of this mighty conflagration. A general and peremptory order was issued from the capital to all the nobles that they should peaceably retire to their estates. They obeyed, and their departure secured the tranquillity of the free and obedient citizens of Rome. But such voluntary obedience evaporates with the first transports of zeal, and Rienzi felt the importance of justifying his usurpation by a regular form and a legal title. At his own choice the Roman people would have displayed their attachment and authority by lavishing on his head the names of senator or consul, of king or emperor. He preferred the ancient and modest appellation of tribune. The protection of the commons was the essence of that sacred office, and they were ignorant that it had never been invested with any share in the legislative or executive powers of the Republic. In this character, and with the consent of the Roman, the tribune enacted the most salutary laws for the restoration and maintenance of the good estate. By the first he fulfils the wish of honesty and inexperience that no civil suit should be protracted beyond the term of fifteen days. The danger of frequent perjury might justify the pronouncing against a false accuser the same penalty which his evidence would have inflicted. The disorders of the times might compel the legislator to punish every homicide with death, and every injury with equal retaliation. But the execution of justice was hopeless till he had previously abolished the tyranny of the nobles. It was formally provided that none except the supreme magistrate should possess or command the gates, bridges, or towers of the state, that no private garrison should be introduced into the towns or castles of the Roman territory, that none should bear arms or presume to fortify their houses in the city or country, that the barons should be responsible for the safety of the highways and the free passage of provisions, and that the protection of malefactors and robbers should be expiated by a fine of a thousand marks of silver. But these regulations would have been impotent and nugatory had not the licentious nobles been awed by the sword of the civil power. A sudden alarm from the bell of the capital could still summon to the standard above twenty thousand volunteers. The support of the tribune and the laws required a more regular and permanent force. In each harbour of the coast a vessel was stationed for the assurance of commerce. A standing militia of three hundred and sixty horse and thirteen hundred foot was levied, clothed and paid in the thirteen quarters of the city, and the spirit of a commonwealth may be traced in the grateful allowance of one hundred florins or pounds to the heirs of every soldier who lost his life in the service of his country. For the maintenance of the public defence, for the establishment of granaries, for the relief of widows, orphans, and indigent convents, Rienzi applied, without fear of sacrilege, the revenues of the apostolic chamber. The three branches of hearth-money, the salt-duty and the customs, were each of the annual produce of one hundred thousand florins, and scandalous were the abuses, if in four or five months the amount of the salt-duty could be trebled by his judicious economy. After thus restoring the forces and finances of the Republic, the Tribune recalled the nobles from their solitary independence, required their personal appearance in the capital, 
and imposed an oath of allegiance to the new government and of submission to the laws of the good estate. Apprehensive of their safety, but still more apprehensive of the danger of a refusal, the princes and barons returned to their houses at Rome in the garb of simple and peaceful citizens. The Colonna and Orsini, the Savelli and Frangipani, were confounded before the tribunal of a plebeian, of the vile buffoon whom they had so often derided, and their disgrace was aggravated by the indignation which they vainly struggled to disguise. The same oath was successively pronounced by the several orders of society, the clergy and gentlemen, the judges and notaries, the merchants and artisans, and the gradual descent was marked by the increase of sincerity and zeal. They swore to live and die with the Republic and the Church, whose interest was artfully united by the nominal association of the Bishop of Orvieto, the Pope's vicar, to the office of tribune. It was the boast of Rienzi that he had delivered the throne and patrimony of St. Peter from a rebellious aristocracy, and Clement the Sixth, who rejoiced in its fall, affected to believe the professions, to applaud the merits, and to confirm the title of his trusty servant. The speech, perhaps the mind, of the tribune was inspired with a lively regard for the purity of the faith. He insinuated his claim to a supernatural mission from the Holy Ghost, enforced by a heavy forfeiture the annual duty of confession and communion, and strictly guarded the spiritual as well as the temporal welfare of his faithful people. Never, perhaps, has the energy and effect of a single mind been more remarkably felt than in the sudden, though transient, reformation of Rome by the Tribune Rienzi. A den of robbers was converted to the discipline of a camp or convent, patient to hear, swift to redress, inexorable to punish. His tribunal was always accessible to the poor and stranger, nor could birth or dignity or the immunities of the church protect the offender or his accomplices. The privileged houses, the private sanctuaries in Rome, on which no officer of justice would presume to trespass, were abolished, and he applied the timber and iron of their barricades in the fortifications of the capital. The venerable father of the Colonna was exposed in his own palace to the double shame of being desirous and of being unable to protect a criminal. A mule with a jar of oil had been stolen near Capranica, and the lord of the Ursini family was condemned to restore the damage and to discharge a fine of four hundred florins for his negligence in guarding the highways. Nor were the persons of the barons more inviolate than their lands or houses, and either from accident or design the same impartial rigour was exercised against the heads of the adverse factions. Peter Agapet Colonna, who had himself been senator of Rome, was arrested in the street for injury or debt, and justice was appeased by the tardy execution of Martin Ursini, who, among his various acts of violence and rapine, had pillaged a shipwrecked vessel at the mouth of the Tiber. His name, the purple of two cardinals, his uncles, a recent marriage and a mortal disease, were disregarded by the inflexible tribune who had chosen his victim. The public officers dragged him from his palace and nuptial bed, his trial was short and satisfactory, the bell of the capital convened the people, stripped of his mantle, on his knees, with his hands bound behind his back, he heard the sentence of death, and after a brief confession Orsini was led away to the gallows. After such an example, none who were conscious of guilt could hope for impunity, and the flight of the wicked, the licentious, and the idle soon purified the city and territory of Rome. In this time, says the historian, the woods began to rejoice that they were no longer infested with robbers, the oxen began to plough, the pilgrims visited the sanctuaries, the roads and inns were replenished with travellers, trade, plenty, and good faith were restored in the markets, and a purse of gold might be exposed without danger in the midst of the highway. As soon as the life and property of the subject are secure, the labours and rewards of industry spontaneously revive. Rome was still the metropolis of the Christian world, and the fame and fortunes of the tribune were diffused in every country by the strangers who had enjoyed the blessings of his government. 
The deliverance of his country inspired Rienzi with a vast and perhaps visionary idea of uniting Italy in a great federative republic, of which Rome should be the ancient and lawful head, and the free cities and princes the members and associates. His pen was not less eloquent than his tongue, and his numerous epistles were delivered to swift and trusty messengers. On foot, with a white wand in their hand, they traversed the forests and mountains, enjoyed in the most hostile states the sacred security of ambassadors, and reported, in the style of flattery or truth, that the highways along their passage were lined with kneeling multitudes who implored heaven for the success of their undertaking. Could passion have listened to reason, could private interest have yielded to the public welfare, the supreme tribunal and confederate union of the Italian Republic might have healed their intestine discord, and closed the Alps against the barbarians of the north. But the propitious season had elapsed, and if Venice, Florence, Siena, Perugia, and many inferior cities offered their lives and fortunes to the good estate, the tyrants of Lombardy and Tuscany must despise or hate the plebeian author of a free constitution. From them, however, and from every part of Italy, the tribune received the most friendly and respectful answers. They were followed by the ambassadors of the princes and republics, and in this foreign conflux, on all the occasions of pleasure or business, the low-born notary could assume the familiar or majestic courtesy of a sovereign. The most glorious circumstance of his reign was an appeal to his justice from Louis, King of Hungary, who complained that his brother and her husband had been perfidiously strangled by Jane, Queen of Naples. Her guilt or innocence was pleaded in a solemn trial at Rome, but after hearing the advocates, the tribune adjourned this weighty and invidious cause, which was soon determined by the sword of the Hungarian. Beyond the Alps, more especially at Avignon, the revolution was the theme of curiosity, wonder, and applause. Petrarch had been the private friend, perhaps the secret counsellor, of Rienzi. His writings breathed the most ardent spirit of patriotism and joy, and all respect for the Pope, all gratitude for the Colonna, was lost in the superior duties of a Roman citizen. The poet laureate of the capital maintains the act, applauds the hero, and mingles with some apprehension and advice the most lofty hopes of the permanent and rising greatness of the Republic. While Petrarch indulged these prophetic visions, the Roman hero was fast declining from the meridian of fame and power, and the people who had gazed with astonishment on the ascending meteor began to mark the irregularity of its course and the vicissitudes of light and obscurity. More eloquent than judicious, more enterprising than resolute, the faculties of Rienzi were not balanced by cool and commanding reason. He magnified in a tenfold proportion the objects of hope and fear, and prudence, which could not have erected, did not presume to fortify his throne. In the blaze of prosperity, his virtues were insensibly tinctured with the adjacent vices. Justice with cruelty, liberality with profusion, and the desire of fame with puerile and ostentatious vanity. He might have learned that the ancient tribunes, so strong and sacred in the public opinion, were not distinguished in style, habit, or appearance from an ordinary plebeian, and that as often as they visited the city on foot, a single viator or beadle attended the exercise of their office. The Gracchi would have frowned or smiled could they have read the sonorous titles and epithets of their successor. Nicholas, severe and merciful, deliverer of Rome, defender of Italy, friend of mankind, and of liberty, peace, and justice, tribune august. His theatrical pageants had prepared the revolution, but Rienzi abused, in luxury and pride, the political maxim of speaking to the eyes as well as the understanding of the multitude. From nature he had received the gift of a handsome person, till it was swelled and disfigured by intemperance, and his propensity to laughter was corrected in the magistrate by the affectation of gravity and sternness. He was clothed, at least on public occasions, in a party-coloured robe of velvet or satin, lined with fur and embroidered with gold. The rod of justice which he carried in his hand was a sceptre of polished steel, crowned with a globe and a cross of gold, 
and enclosing a small fragment of the true and holy wood. In his civil and religious processions through the city, he rode on a white steed, the symbol of royalty. The great banner of the Republic, a sun with a circle of stars, a dove with an olive branch, was displayed over his head. A shower of gold and silver was scattered among the populace. Fifty guards with halberds encompassed his person. A troop of horse preceded his march, and their timbrels and trumpets were of massy silver. The ambition of the honours of chivalry betrayed the meanness of his birth, and degraded the importance of his office, and the equestrian tribune was not less odious to the nobles, whom he adopted, than to the plebeians, whom he deserted. All that yet remained of treasure or luxury or art was exhausted on that solemn day. Rienzi led the procession from the capital to the Lateran, the tediousness of the way was relieved with decorations and games, the ecclesiastical, civil, and military orders marched under their various banners, the Roman ladies attended his wife, and the ambassadors of Italy might loudly applaud or secretly deride the novelty of the pomp. In the evening, when they had reached the church and palace of Constantine, he thanked and dismissed the numerous assembly, with an invitation to the festival of the ensuing day. From the hands of a venerable knight he received the order of the Holy Ghost. The purification of the bath was a previous ceremony, but in no step of his life did Rienzi excite such scandal and censure as by the profane use of the porphyry vase in which Constantine, a foolish legend, had been healed of his leprosy by Pope Sylvester. With equal presumption the tribune watched or reposed within the consecrated precincts of the baptistery, and the failure of his state bed was interpreted as an omen of his approaching downfall. At the hour of worship he showed himself to the returning crowds in a majestic attitude, with a robe of purple, his sword and gilt spurs, but the holy rites were soon interrupted by his levity and insolence. Rising from his throne, and advancing towards the congregation, he proclaimed in a loud voice, "'We summon to our tribunal Pope Clement, and command him to reside in his diocese of Rome. We also summon the sacred college of cardinals.' We again summon the two pretenders, Charles of Bohemia and Louis of Bavaria, who style themselves emperors. We likewise summon all the electors of Germany to inform us on what pretense they have usurped the inalienable right of the Roman people, the ancient and lawful sovereigns of the empire. Unsheathing his maiden sword, he thrice brandished it to the three parts of the world, and thrice repeated the extravagant declaration— and this too is mine. The Pope's vicar, the Bishop of Orvieto, attempted to check this career of folly, but his feeble protest was silenced by martial music, and instead of withdrawing from the assembly he consented to dine with his brother tribune at a table which had hitherto been reserved for the supreme pontiff. A banquet such as the Caesars had given was prepared for the Romans. The apartments, porticos, and courts of the Lateran were spread with innumerable tables for either sex and every condition. A stream of wine flowed from the nostrils of Constantine's brazen horse. No complaint, except of the scarcity of water, could be heard, and the licentiousness of the multitude was curbed by discipline and fear. A subsequent day was appointed for the coronation of Rienzi, Seven crowns of different leaves or metals were successively placed on his head by the most eminent of the Roman clergy. They represented the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost, and he still professed to imitate the example of the ancient tribunes. These extraordinary spectacles might deceive or flatter the people, and their own vanity was gratified in the vanity of their leader. But in his private life he soon deviated from the strict rule of frugality and abstinence, and the plebeians, who were awed by the splendour of the nobles, were provoked by the luxury of their equal. His wife, his son, his uncle, a barber in name and profession, exposed the contrast of vulgar manners and princely expense, and without acquiring the majesty, Rienzi degenerated into the vices of a king. A simple citizen describes with pity, or perhaps with pleasure, the humiliation of the barons of Rome. Bareheaded, 
their hands crossed on their breast, they stood with downcast looks in the presence of the tribune, and they trembled, good God, how they trembled! As long as the yoke of Rienzi was that of justice and their country, their conscience forced them to esteem the man, whom pride and interest provoked them to hate. His extravagant conduct soon fortified their hatred by contempt, and they conceived the hope of subverting a power which was no longer so deeply rooted in the public confidence. The old animosity of the Colonna and Ursini was suspended for a moment by their common disgrace. They associated their wishes, and perhaps their designs. An assassin was seized and tortured. He accused the nobles, and as soon as Rienzi deserved the fate, he adopted the suspicions and maxims of a tyrant. On the same day, under various pretenses, he invited to the capital his principal enemies, among whom were five members of the Ursini and three of the Colonna name. But instead of a council or a banquet, they found themselves prisoners under the sword of despotism or justice, and the consciousness of innocence or guilt might inspire them with equal apprehensions of danger. At the sound of the great bell the people assembled. They were arraigned for a conspiracy against the tribune's life, and though some might sympathize in their distress, not a hand nor a voice was raised to rescue the first of the nobility from their impending doom. Their apparent boldness was prompted by despair. They passed in separate chambers a sleepless and painful night, and the venerable hero Stephen Colonna, striking against the door of his prison, repeatedly urged his guards to deliver him by a speedy death from such ignominious servitude. In the morning they understood their sentence from the visit of a confessor and the tolling of the bell. The great hall of the capital had been decorated for the bloody scene with red and white hangings. The countenance of the tribune was dark and severe, the swords of the executioners were unsheathed, and the barons were interrupted in their dying speeches by the sound of trumpets. But in this decisive moment Rienzi was not less anxious or apprehensive than his captives. He dreaded the splendour of their names, their surviving kinsmen, the inconstancy of the people, the reproaches of the world, and, after rashly offering a mortal injury, he vainly presumed that, if he could forgive, he might himself be forgiven. His elaborate oration was that of a Christian and a suppliant, and as the humble minister of the commons he entreated his masters to pardon these noble criminals, for whose repentance and future service he pledged his faith and authority. "'If you are spared,' said the tribune, "'by the mercy of the Romans, will you not promise to support the good estate with your lives and fortunes?' Astonished by this marvellous clemency, the barons bowed their heads, and while they devoutly repeated the oath of allegiance, might whisper a secret and more sincere assurance of revenge. A priest, in the name of the people, pronounced their absolution. They received the communion with the tribune, assisted at the banquet, followed the procession, and after every spiritual and temporal sign of reconciliation, were dismissed in safety to their respective homes with the new honours and titles of generals, consuls, and patricians. During some weeks they were checked by the memory of their danger, rather than of their deliverance, till the most powerful of the Ursini, escaping with the Colonna from the city, erected at Marino the standard of rebellion. The fortifications of the castle were instantly restored, the vassals attended their lord, the outlaws armed against the magistrate, the flocks and herds, the harvests and vineyards, from Marino to the gates of Rome, were swept away or destroyed, and the people arraigned Rienzi as the author of the calamities which his government had taught them to forget. In the camp Rienzi appeared to less advantage than in the rostrum, and he neglected the progress of the rebel barons till their numbers were strong and their castles impregnable. From the pages of Livy he had not imbibed the art, or even the courage, of a general. An army of twenty thousand Romans returned without honour or effect from the attack of Marino, and his vengeance was amused by painting his enemies their heads downwards, and drowning two dogs, at least they should have been bears, as the representatives of the Ursini. 
The belief of his incapacity encouraged their operations. They were invited by their secret adherents, and the barons attempted with four thousand foot and sixteen hundred horse to enter Rome by force or surprise. The city was prepared for their reception. The alarm bell rung all night. The gates were strictly guarded or insolently open, and after some hesitation they sounded a retreat. The two first divisions had passed along the walls, but the prospect of a free entrance tempted the headstrong valour of the nobles in the rear, and after a successful skirmish they were overthrown and massacred without quarter by the crowds of the Roman people. Stephen Colonna the Younger, the noble spirit to whom Petrarch ascribed the restoration of Italy, was preceded or accompanied in death by his son John, a gallant youth, by his brother Peter, who might regret the ease and honours of the church, by a nephew of legitimate birth, and by two bastards of the Colonna race, and the number of seven, the seven crowns as Rienzi styled them of the Holy Ghost, was completed by the agony of the deplorable parent and the veteran chief, who had survived the hope and fortune of his house. The vision and prophecies of St. Martin and Pope Boniface had been used by the tribune to animate his troops. He displayed, at least in the pursuit, the spirit of a hero, but he forgot the maxims of the ancient Romans who abhorred the triumphs of civil war. The conqueror ascended the capital, deposited his crown and sceptre on the altar, and boasted, with some truth, that he had cut off an ear which neither pope nor emperor had been able to amputate. His base and implacable revenge denied the honours of burial, and the bodies of the Colonna, which he threatened to expose with those of the vilest malefactors, were secretly interred by the holy virgins of their name and family. The people sympathised in their grief, repented of their own fury, and detested the indecent joy of Rienzi, who visited the spot where these illustrious victims had fallen. It was on that fatal spot that he conferred on his son the honour of knighthood, and the ceremony was accomplished by a slight blow from each of the horsemen of the guard, and by a ridiculous and inhuman ablution from a pool of water which was yet polluted with patrician blood. A short delay would have saved the Colonna, the delay of a single month which elapsed between the triumph and the exile of Rienzi. In the pride of victory he forfeited what yet remained of his civil virtues, without acquiring the fame of military prowess. A free and vigorous opposition was formed in the city, and when the tribune proposed in the public council to impose a new tax, and to regulate the government of Perugia, thirty-nine members voted against his measures, repelled the injurious charge of treachery and corruption, and urged him to prove by their forcible exclusion that if the populace adhered to his cause, it was already disclaimed by the most respectable citizens. The Pope and the Sacred College had never been dazzled by his specious professions, they were justly offended by the insolence of his conduct. A cardinal legate was sent to Italy, and after some fruitless treaty and two personal interviews, he fulminated a bull of excommunication in which the tribune is degraded from his office and branded with the guilt of rebellion, sacrilege, and heresy. The surviving barons of Rome were now humbled to a sense of allegiance. Their interest and revenge engaged them in the service of the church. But as the fate of the Colonna was before their eyes, they abandoned to a private adventurer the peril and glory of the revolution. John Pepin, Count of Minorbino, in the Kingdom of Naples, had been condemned for his crimes, or his riches, to perpetual imprisonment, and Petrarch, by soliciting his release, indirectly contributed to the ruin of his friend. At the head of one hundred and fifty soldiers, the Count of Minorbino introduced himself into Rome, barricaded the quarter of the Colonna, and found the enterprise as easy as it had seemed impossible. From the first alarm the bell of the capital incessantly tolled, but instead of repairing to the well-known sound, the people were silent and inactive, and the pusillanimous Rienzi, deploring their ingratitude with sighs and tears, abdicated the government and palace of the Republic. Without drawing his sword, Count Pepin restored the aristocracy and the church. Three senators were chosen, and the legate, assuming the first rank, 
accepted his two colleagues from the rival families of Colonna and Orsini. The acts of the tribune were abolished, his head was proscribed, yet such was the terror of his name that the barons hesitated three days before they would trust themselves in the city, and Rienzi was left above a month in the castle of St. Angelo, from whence he peaceably withdrew after labouring without effect to revive the affection and courage of the Romans. The vision of freedom and empire had vanished. Their fallen spirit would have acquiesced in servitude had it been smoothed by tranquillity and order, and it was scarcely observed that the new senators derived their authority from the apostolic see, that four cardinals were appointed to reform with dictatorial power the state of the republic. Rome was again agitated by the bloody feuds of the barons, who detested each other and despised the commons. Their hostile fortresses, both in town and country, again rose, and were again demolished. And the peaceful citizens, a flock of sheep, were devoured, says the Florentine historian, by these rapacious wolves. But when their pride and avarice had exhausted the patience of the Romans— a confraternity of the Virgin Mary protected or avenged the Republic. The bell of the Capitol was again tolled, the nobles in arms trembled in the presence of an unarmed multitude, and of the two senators, Colonna escaped from the window of the palace, and Ursini was stoned at the foot of the altar. The dangerous office of tribune was successively occupied by two plebeians, Ceroni and Baroncelli. The mildness of Ceroni was unequal to the times, and after a faint struggle he retired with a fair reputation and a decent fortune to the comforts of rural life. Devoid of eloquence or genius, Baroncelli was distinguished by a resolute spirit. He spoke the language of a patriot, and trod in the footsteps of tyrants. His suspicion was a sentence of death, and his own death was the reward of his cruelties. Amidst the public misfortunes the faults of Rienzi were forgotten— and the Romans sighed for the peace and prosperity of their good estate. After an exile of seven years, the first deliverer was again restored to his country. In the disguise of a monk or a pilgrim, he escaped from the castle of St. Angelo, implored the friendship of the King of Hungary at Naples, tempted the ambition of every bold adventurer, mingled at Rome with the pilgrims of the Jubilee, lay concealed among the hermits of the Apennine, and wandered through the cities of Italy, Germany, and Bohemia. His person was invisible, his name was yet formidable, and the anxiety of the court of Avignon supposes and even magnifies his personal merit. The emperor, Charles IV, gave audience to a stranger who frankly revealed himself as the tribune of the Republic, and astonished an assembly of ambassadors and princes by the eloquence of a patriot and the visions of a prophet the downfall of tyranny, and the kingdom of the Holy Ghost. Whatever had been his hopes, Rienzi found himself a captive, but he supported a character of independence and dignity, and obeyed, as his own choice, the irresistible summons of the supreme pontiff. The zeal of Petrarch, which had been cooled by the unworthy conduct, was rekindled by the sufferings and the presence of his friend, and he boldly complains of the times in which the saviour of Rome was delivered by her emperor into the hands of her bishop. Rienzi was transported slowly but in safe custody from Prague to Avignon. His entrance into the city was that of a malefactor. In his prison he was chained by the leg, and four cardinals were named to inquire into the crimes of heresy and rebellion but his trial and condemnation would have involved some questions which it was more prudent to leave under the veil of mystery, the temporal supremacy of the popes, the duty of residents, the civil and ecclesiastical privileges of the clergy and people of Rome. The reigning pontiff well deserved the appellation of Clement. The strange vicissitudes and magnanimous spirit of the captive excited his pity and esteem, and Petrarch believes that he respected in the hero the name and sacred character of a poet. Rienzi was indulged with an easy confinement and the use of books, and in the assiduous study of Livy and the Bible, he sought the cause and the consolation of his misfortunes. The succeeding pontificate of Innocent the Sixth opened a new prospect of his deliverance and restoration, and the court of Avignon was persuaded 
that the successful rebel could alone appease and reform the anarchy of the metropolis. After a solemn profession of fidelity, the Roman tribune was sent into Italy with the title of senator, but the death of Baroncelli appeared to supersede the use of his mission, and the legate, Cardinal Albornoz, a consummate statesman, allowed him, with reluctance and without aid, to undertake the perilous experiment. His first reception was equal to his wishes. The day of his entrance was a public festival, and his eloquence and authority revived the laws of the good estate. But this momentary sunshine was soon clouded by his own vices and those of the people. In the capital he might often regret the prison of Avignon, and after a second administration of four months, Rienzi was massacred in a tumult which had been fermented by the Roman barons. In the society of the Germans and Bohemians he is said to have contracted the habits of intemperance and cruelty. Adversity had chilled his enthusiasm without fortifying his reason or virtue, and that youthful hope, that lively assurance which is the pledge of success, was now succeeded by the cold impotence of distrust and despair. The tribune had reigned with absolute dominion by the choice and in the hearts of the Romans. The senator was the servile minister of a foreign court, and while he was suspected by the people he was abandoned by the prince. The legate Albornoz, who seemed desirous of his ruin, inflexibly refused all supplies of men and money. A faithful subject could no longer presume to touch the revenues of the apostolical chamber, and the first idea of a tax was the signal of clamour and sedition. Even his justice was tainted with the guilt or reproach of selfish cruelty. The most virtuous citizen of Rome was sacrificed to his jealousy, and in the execution of a public robber from whose purse he had been assisted, the magistrate too much forgot, or too much remembered, the obligations of the debtor. A civil war exhausted his treasures, and the patience of the city. The Colonna maintained their hostile station at Palestrina, and his mercenaries soon despised a leader whose ignorance and fear were envious of all subordinate merit. In the death, as in the life of Rienzi, the hero and the coward were strangely mingled. When the capital was invested by a furious multitude, when he was basely deserted by his civil and military servants, the intrepid senator, waving the banner of liberty, presented himself on the balcony, addressed his eloquence to the various passions of the Romans, and laboured to persuade them that in the same cause himself and the Republic must either stand or fall. His oration was interrupted by a volley of imprecations and stones, and after an arrow had transpierced his hand, he sunk into abject despair and fled weeping to the inner chambers, from whence he was let down by a sheet before the windows of the prison. Destitute of aid or hope, he was besieged till the evening. The doors of the capital were destroyed with axes and fire, and while the senator attempted to escape in a plebeian habit, he was discovered and dragged to the platform of the palace, the fatal scene of his judgments and executions. A whole hour, without voice or motion, he stood amidst the multitude, half naked and half dead. Their rage was hushed into curiosity and wonder. The last feelings of reverence and compassion yet struggled in his favour, and they might have prevailed if a bold assassin had not plunged a dagger in his breast. He fell senseless with the first stroke. The impotent revenge of his enemies inflicted a thousand wounds, and the senator's body was abandoned to the dogs, to the Jews, and the flames. Posterity will compare the virtues and failings of this extraordinary man, but in a long period of anarchy and servitude, the name of Rienzi has often been celebrated as the deliverer of his country, and the last of the Roman patriots. The first and most generous wish of Petrarch was the restoration of a free republic, but after the exile and death of his plebeian hero, he turned his eyes from the tribune to the king of the Romans. The capital was yet stained with the blood of Rienzi when Charles the Fourth descended from the Alps to obtain the Italian and imperial crowns. In his passage through Milan, 
he received the visit and repaid the flattery of the poet laureate, accepted a medal of Augustus, and promised without a smile to imitate the founder of the Roman monarchy. A false application of the name and maxims of antiquity was the source of the hopes and disappointments of Petrarch. Yet he could not overlook the difference of times and characters, the immeasurable distance between the first Caesars and a Bohemian prince, who by the favour of the clergy had been elected the titular head of the German aristocracy. Instead of restoring to Rome her glory and her provinces, he had bound himself by a secret treaty with the Pope to evacuate the city on the day of his coronation, and his shameful retreat was pursued by the reproaches of the patriot bard. After the loss of liberty and empire, his third and more humble wish was to reconcile the shepherd with his flock, to recall the Roman bishop to his ancient and peculiar diocese. In the fervour of youth, with the authority of age, Petrarch addressed his exhortations to five successive popes, and his eloquence was always inspired by the enthusiasm of sentiment and the freedom of language. The son of a citizen of Florence invariably preferred the country of his birth to that of his education, and Italy, in his eyes, was the queen and garden of the world— Amidst her domestic factions she was doubtless superior to France both in art and science, in wealth and politeness, but the difference could scarcely support the epithet of barbarous which he promiscuously bestows on the countries beyond the Alps. Avignon, the mystic Babylon, the sink of vice and corruption, was the object of hatred and contempt, but he forgets that her scandalous vices were not the growth of the soil and that in every residence they would adhere to the power and luxury of the papal court. He confesses that the successor of St. Peter is the bishop of the universal church, yet it was not on the banks of the Rhone, but of the Tiber, that the apostle had fixed his everlasting throne. And while every city in the Christian world was blessed with a bishop, the metropolis alone was desolate and forlorn. Since the removal of the Holy See, the sacred buildings of the Lateran and the Vatican, their altars and their saints, were left in a state of poverty and decay, and Rome was often painted under the image of a disconsolate matron, as if the wandering husband could be reclaimed by the homely portrait of the age and infirmities of his weeping spouse. But the cloud which hung over the seven hills would be dispelled by the presence of their lawful sovereign. Eternal fame, the prosperity of Rome, and the peace of Italy— would be the recompense of the Pope who should dare to embrace this generous resolution. Of the five whom Petrarch exhorted, the three first, John the twenty-second, Benedict the twelfth, and Clement the sixth, were importuned or amused by the boldness of the orator. But the memorable change which had been attempted by Urban the fifth was finally accomplished by Gregory the eleventh. The execution of their design was opposed by weighty and almost insuperable obstacles. A king of France, who has deserved the epithet of wise, was unwilling to release them from a local dependence. The cardinals, for the most part his subjects, were attached to the language, manners, and climate of Avignon, to their stately palaces, above all to the wines of Burgundy. In their eyes Italy was foreign or hostile, and they reluctantly embarked at Marseilles, as if they had been sold or banished into the land of the Saracens. Urban V resided three years in the Vatican with safety and honour. His sanctity was protected by a guard of two thousand horse, and the King of Cyprus, the Queen of Naples, and the Emperors of the East and West devoutly saluted their common father in the chair of St. Peter but the joy of Petrarch and the Italians was soon turned into grief and indignation. Some reasons of public or private moment, his own impatience or the prayers of the cardinals, recalled Urban to France, and the approaching election was saved from the tyrannic patriotism of the Romans. The powers of heaven were interested in their cause. Bridget of Sweden, a saint and pilgrim, disapproved the return, and foretold the death of Urban V. The migration of Gregory the Eleventh was encouraged by St. Catherine of Siena, the spouse of Christ and ambassadress of the Florentines, and the popes themselves, the great masters of human credulity, 
appear to have listened to these visionary females. Yet those celestial admonitions were supported by some arguments of temporal policy. The residents of Avignon had been invaded by hostile violence. At the head of thirty thousand robbers, a hero had extorted ransom and absolution from the Vicar of Christ and the Sacred College, and the maxim of the French warriors to spare the people and plunder the church was a new heresy of the most dangerous import. While the Pope was driven from Avignon, he was strenuously invited to Rome. The Senate and people acknowledged him as their lawful sovereign, and laid at his feet the keys of the gates, the bridges, and the fortresses, of the quarter at least beyond the Tiber. But this loyal offer was accompanied by a declaration, that they could no longer suffer the scandal and calamity of his absence, and that his obstinacy would finally provoke them to revive and assert the primitive right of election. The abbot of Mount Cassin had been consulted whether he would accept the triple crown from the clergy and people. "'I am a citizen of Rome,' replied the venerable ecclesiastic, "'and my first law is the voice of my country.' If superstition will interpret an untimely death, if the merit of counsels be judged from the event, the heavens may seem to frown on a measure of such apparent season and propriety. Gregory the Eleventh did not survive above fourteen months his return to the Vatican, and his decease was followed by the great schism of the West, which distracted the Latin Church above forty years. The Sacred College was then composed of twenty-two cardinals, Six of these had remained at Avignon. Eleven Frenchmen, one Spaniard, and four Italians entered the conclave in their usual form. Their choice was not yet limited to the purple, and their unanimous votes acquiesced in the Archbishop of Bari, a subject of Naples, conspicuous for his zeal and learning, who ascended the throne of St. Peter under the name of Urban VI. The epistle of the Sacred College affirms his free and regular election— which had been inspired, as usual, by the Holy Ghost. He was adored, invested, and crowned with the customary rites. His temporal authority was obeyed at Rome and Avignon, and his ecclesiastical supremacy was acknowledged in the Latin world. During several weeks the cardinals attended their new master with the fairest professions of attachment and loyalty, till the summer heats permitted a decent escape from the city. But as soon as they were united at Anani and Fundi, in a place of security, they cast aside the mask, accused their own falsehood and hypocrisy, excommunicated the apostate and antichrist of Rome, and proceeded to a new election of Robert of Geneva, Clement the Seventh, whom they announced to the nations as the true and rightful vicar of Christ. Their first choice, an involuntary and illegal act, was annulled by fear of death and the menaces of the Romans, and their complaint is justified by the strong evidence of probability and fact. The twelve French cardinals, above two-thirds of the votes, were masters of the election, and whatever might be their provincial jealousies, it cannot fairly be presumed that they would have sacrificed their right and interest to a foreign candidate, who would never restore them to their native country. In the various and often inconsistent narratives, the shades of popular violence are more darkly or faintly coloured, but the licentiousness of the seditious Romans was inflamed by a sense of their privileges, and the danger of a second emigration. The conclave was intimidated by the shouts, and encompassed by the arms, of thirty thousand rebels. The bells of the Capitol and St. Peter's rang an alarm, "'Death or an Italian Pope!' was the universal cry." The same threat was repeated by the twelve bannerets or chiefs of the quarters, in the form of charitable advice. Some preparations were made for burning the obstinate cardinals, and had they chosen a transalpine subject, it is probable that they would never have departed alive from the Vatican. The same constraint imposed the necessity of dissembling in the eyes of Rome and of the world. The pride and cruelty of Urban presented a more inevitable danger— and they soon discovered the features of the tyrant, who could walk in his garden and recite his breviary, while he heard from an adjacent chamber six cardinals groaning on the rack. His inflexible zeal, which loudly censured their luxury and vice, would have attached them to the stations and duties of their parishes at Rome, 
and had he not fatally delayed a new promotion, the French cardinals would have been reduced to a helpless minority in the sacred college. For these reasons, and the hope of repassing the Alps, they rashly violated the peace and unity of the Church, and the merits of their double choice are yet agitated in the Catholic schools. The vanity rather than the interest of the nation determined the court and the clergy of France— the states of Savoy, Sicily, Cyprus, Aragon, Castile, Navarre, and Scotland were inclined by their example and authority to the obedience of Clement the Seventh, and after his decease of Benedict the Thirteenth. Rome and the principal states of Italy, Germany, Portugal, England, the Low Countries, and the kingdoms of the North adhered to the prior election of Urban the Sixth, who was succeeded by Boniface the Ninth, Innocent the Seventh, and Gregory the Twelfth. From the banks of the Tiber and the Rhone, the hostile pontiffs encountered each other with the pen and the sword, the civil and ecclesiastical order of society was disturbed, and the Romans had their full share of the mischiefs of which they may be arraigned as the primary authors. They had vainly flattered themselves with the hope of restoring the seat of the ecclesiastical monarchy, and of relieving their poverty with the tributes and offerings of the nations— but the separation of France and Spain diverted the stream of lucrative devotion, nor could the loss be compensated by the two jubilees which were crowded into the space of ten years. By the avocations of the schism, by foreign arms and popular tumults, Urban the Sixth and his three successors were often compelled to interrupt their residence in the Vatican. The Colonna and Orsini still exercised their deadly feuds, the bannerets of Rome asserted and abused the privileges of a republic, the vicars of Christ who had levied a military force chastised their rebellion with the gibbet, the sword, and the dagger, and, in a friendly conference, eleven deputies of the people were perfidiously murdered and cast into the street. Since the invasion of Robert the Norman, the Romans had pursued their domestic quarrels without the dangerous interposition of a stranger. But in the disorders of the schism, an aspiring neighbour, Ladislaus, king of Naples, alternately supported and betrayed the Pope and the people. By the former he was declared Gonfalonie, or General of the Church, while the latter submitted to his choice the nomination of their magistrates. Besieging Rome by land and water, he thrice entered the gates as a barbarian conqueror, profaned the altars, violated the virgins, pillaged the merchants, performed his devotions at St. Peter's, and left a garrison in the castle of St. Angelo. His arms were sometimes unfortunate, and to a delay of three days he was indebted for his life and crown. But Ladislaus triumphed in his turn, and it was only his premature death that could save the metropolis and the ecclesiastical state from the ambitious conqueror, who had assumed the title, or at least the powers, of King of Rome. I have not undertaken the ecclesiastical history of the schism, but Rome, the object of these last chapters, is deeply interested in the disputed succession of her sovereigns. The first councils for the peace and union of Christendom arose from the University of Paris, from the faculty of the Sorbonne, whose doctors were esteemed, at least in the Gallican Church, as the most consummate masters of theological science. Prudently waiving all invidious inquiry into the origin and merits of the dispute, they proposed, as a healing measure, that the two pretenders of Rome and Avignon should abdicate at the same time, after qualifying the cardinals of the adverse factions to join in a legitimate election, and that the nations should subtract their obedience, if either of the competitor preferred his own interest to that of the public. At each vacancy these positions of the Church deprecated the mischiefs of a hasty choice, but the policy of the conclave and the ambition of its members were deaf to reason and entreaties, and whatsoever promises were made, the Pope could never be bound by the oaths of the Cardinal. During fifteen years the pacific designs of the university were eluded by the arts of the rival pontiffs, the scruples or passions of their adherents, and the vicissitudes of French factions that ruled the insanity of Charles the Sixth. At length a vigorous resolution was embraced, and a solemn embassy of the titular Patriarch of Alexandria, two archbishops, five bishops, five abbots, three knights, and twenty doctors, 
was sent to the courts of Avignon and Rome to require, in the name of the Church and King, the abdication of the two pretenders, of Peter de Luna, who styled himself Benedict the Thirteenth, and of Angelo Corario, who assumed the name of Gregory the Twelfth. For the ancient honour of Rome, and the success of their commission, the ambassadors solicited a conference with the magistrates of the city, whom they gratified by a positive declaration that the most Christian king did not entertain a wish of transporting the Holy See from the Vatican, which he considered as the genuine and proper seat of the successor of St. Peter. In the name of the Senate and the people, an eloquent Roman asserted their desire to cooperate in the union of the Church, deplored the temporal and spiritual calamities of the long schism, and requested the protection of France against the arms of the King of Naples. The answers of Benedict and Gregory were alike edifying and alike deceitful, and in evading the demand of their abdication, the two rivals were animated by a common spirit. They agreed on the necessity of a previous interview, but the time, the place, and the manner could never be ascertained by mutual consent. If the one advances, says a servant of Gregory, the other retreats. The one appears an animal fearful of the land, the other a creature apprehensive of the water. And thus, for a short remnant of life and power, will these aged priests endanger the peace and salvation of the Christian world. The Christian world was at length provoked by their obstinacy and fraud. They were deserted by their cardinals, who embraced each other as friends and colleagues, and their revolt was supported by a numerous assembly of prelates and ambassadors. With equal justice the Council of Pisa deposed the popes of Rome and Avignon. The conclave was unanimous in the choice of Alexander V, and his vacant seat was soon filled by a similar election of John the Twenty-Third, the most profligate of mankind. But instead of extinguishing the schism, the rashness of the French and Italians had given a third pretender to the chair of St. Peter. Such new claims of the synod and conclave were disputed. Three kings of Germany, Hungary, and Naples adhered to the cause of Gregory the Twelfth, and Benedict the Thirteenth, himself a Spaniard, was acknowledged by the devotion and patriotism of that powerful nation. The rash proceedings of Pisa were corrected by the Council of Constance, the Emperor Sigismund acted a conspicuous part as the advocate or protector of the Catholic Church, and the number and weight of civil and ecclesiastical members might seem to constitute the States-General of Europe. Of the three popes, John the Twenty-Third was the first victim. He fled, and was brought back a prisoner. The most scandalous charges were suppressed. The Vicar of Christ was only accused of piracy, murder, rape, sodomy, and incest and after subscribing his own condemnation, he expiated in prison the imprudence of trusting his person to a free city beyond the Alps. Gregory the Twelfth, whose obedience was reduced to the narrow precincts of Rimini, descended with more honour from the throne, and his ambassador convened the session, in which he renounced the title and authority of lawful pope. To vanquish the obstinacy of Benedict the Thirteenth or his adherents, the emperor in person undertook a journey from Constance to Perpignan. The kings of Castile, Aragon, Navarre, and Scotland obtained an equal and honourable treaty. With the concurrence of the Spaniards, Benedict was deposed by the council. But the harmless old man was left in a solitary castle to excommunicate twice each day the rebel kingdoms which had deserted his cause. After thus eradicating the remains of the schism, the Synod of Constance proceeded with slow and cautious steps to elect the Sovereign of Rome and the Head of the Church. On this momentous occasion the College of Twenty-Three Cardinals was fortified with thirty deputies, six of whom were chosen in each of the five great nations of Christendom, the Italian, the German, the French, the Spanish, and the English. The interference of strangers was softened by their generous preference of an Italian and a Roman, and the hereditary as well as personal merit of Otto Colonna recommended him to the conclave. Rome accepted with joy and obedience the noblest of her sons, the ecclesiastical state was defended by his powerful family, and the elevation of Martin V is the era of the restoration and establishment of the popes in the Vatican. 
The royal prerogative of coining money, which had been exercised near three hundred years by the Senate, was first resumed by Martin V, and his image and superscription introduced the series of the papal medals. Of his two immediate successors, Eugenius IV was the last pope expelled by the tumults of the Roman people, and Nicholas V, the last who was importuned by the presence of a Roman emperor. 1. The conflict of Eugenius with the fathers of Basil, and the weight or apprehension of a new excise, emboldened and provoked the Romans to usurp the temporal government of the city. They rose in arms, elected seven governors of the Republic, and a constable of the capital, imprisoned the Pope's nephew, besieged his person in the palace, and shot volleys of arrows into his bark as he escaped down the Tiber in the habit of a monk. But he still possessed in the castle of St. Angelo a faithful garrison and a train of artillery. Their batteries incessantly thundered on the city, and a bullet more dexterously pointed broke down the barricade of the bridge and scattered with a single shot the heroes of the Republic. Their constancy was exhausted by a rebellion of five months. Under the tyranny of the Ghibelline nobles, the wisest patriots regretted the dominion of the Church, and their repentance was unanimous and effectual. The troops of St. Peter again occupied the capital, the magistrates departed to their homes, the most guilty were executed or exiled, and the legate, at the head of two thousand foot and four thousand horse, was saluted as the father of the city. The synods of Ferrara and Florence, the fear or resentment of Eugenius, prolonged his absence. He was received by a submissive people, but the pontiff understood from the acclamations of his triumphal entry that to secure their loyalty and his own repose, he must grant without delay the abolition of the odious excise. 2. Rome was restored, adorned, and enlightened by the peaceful reign of Nicholas V. In the midst of these laudable occupations, the Pope was alarmed by the approach of Frederick III of Austria, though his fears could not be justified by the character or the power of the imperial candidate. After drawing his military force to the metropolis, and imposing the best security of oaths and treaties, Nicholas received with a smiling countenance the faithful advocate and vassal of the Church. So tame were the times, so feeble was the Austrian, that the pomp of his coronation was accomplished with order and harmony. But the superfluous honour was so disgraceful to an independent nation that his successors have excused themselves from the toilsome pilgrimage to the Vatican, and rest their imperial title on the choice of the electors of Germany. A citizen has remarked with pride and pleasure that the king of the Romans, after passing with a slight salute the cardinals and prelates who met him at the gate, distinguished the dress and person of the senator of Rome, and in this last farewell the pageants of the empire and the republic were clasped in a friendly embrace. According to the laws of Rome, her first magistrate was required to be a doctor of laws, an alien, of a place at least forty miles from the city, with whose inhabitants he must not be connected in the third canonical degree of blood or alliance. The election was annual. A severe scrutiny was instituted into the conduct of the departing senator, nor could he be recalled to the same office till after the expiration of two years. A liberal salary of three thousand florins was assigned for his expense and reward, and his public appearance represented the majesty of the Republic. His robes were of gold brocade or crimson velvet, or in the summer season of a lighter silk. He bore in his hand an ivory sceptre, the sound of trumpets announced his approach, and his solemn steps were preceded at least by four lictors or attendants whose red wands were enveloped with bands or streamers of the golden colour or livery of the city. His oath in the capital proclaims his right and duty to observe and assert the laws, to control the proud, to protect the poor, and to exercise justice and mercy within the extent of his jurisdiction. In these useful functions he was assisted by three learned strangers, the two collaterals and the judge of criminal appeals, their frequent trials of robberies, rapes, and murders are attested by the laws, and the weakness of these laws connives at the licentiousness of private feuds 
and armed associations for mutual defence. But the senator was confined to the administration of justice. The capital, the treasury, and the government of the city and its territory were entrusted to the three conservators, who were changed four times in each year. The militia of the thirteen regions assembled under the banners of their respective chiefs, or caporioni, and the first of these was distinguished by the name and dignity of the prior. The popular legislature consisted of the secret and the common councils of the Romans. The former was composed of the magistrates and their immediate predecessors, with some fiscal and legal officers, and three classes of thirteen, twenty-six, and forty councillors, amounting in the whole to about one hundred and twenty persons. In the common council all male citizens had a right to vote, and the value of their privilege was enhanced by the care with which any foreigners were prevented from usurping the title and character of Romans. The tumult of a democracy was checked by wise and jealous precautions. Except the magistrates, none could propose a question, none were permitted to speak except from an open pulpit or tribunal, all disorderly acclamations were suppressed, the sense of the majority was decided by a secret ballot, and their decrees were promulgated in the venerable name of the Roman Senate and people. It would not be easy to assign a period in which this theory of government has been reduced to accurate and constant practice, since the establishment of order has been gradually connected with the decay of liberty. But in the year 1580 the ancient statutes were collected, methodized in three books, and adapted to present use under the pontificate and with the approbation of Gregory the Thirteenth. This civil and criminal code is the modern law of the city, and if the popular assemblies have been abolished, a foreign senator with the three conservators still resides in the palace of the capital. The policy of the Caesars has been repeated by the popes, and the bishop of Rome affected to maintain the form of a republic, while he reigned with the absolute powers of a temporal as well as a spiritual monarch. It is an obvious truth that the times must be suited to extraordinary characters, and that the genius of Cromwell or Retz might now expire in obscurity. The political enthusiasm of Rienzi had exalted him to a throne. The same enthusiasm in the next century conducted his imitator to the gallows. The birth of Stephen Porcaro was noble, his reputation spotless, his tongue was armed with eloquence, his mind was enlightened with learning, and he aspired, beyond the aim of vulgar ambition, to free his country and immortalize his name. The dominion of priests is most odious to a liberal spirit. Every scruple was removed by the recent knowledge of the fable and forgery of Constantine's donation. Petrarch was now the oracle of the Italians, and as often as Porcaro revolved the ode which describes the patriot and hero of Rome, he applied to himself the visions of the prophetic bard. His first trial of the popular feelings was at the funeral of Eugenius IV. In an elaborate speech he called the Romans to liberty and arms, and they listened with apparent pleasure, till Porcaro was interrupted and answered by a grave advocate who pleaded for the church and state. By every law the seditious orator was guilty of treason, but the benevolence of the new pontiff, who viewed his character with pity and esteem, attempted by an honourable office to convert the patriot into a friend. The inflexible Roman returned from Anagni with an increase of reputation and zeal, and on the first opportunity, the games of the Place Navona, he tried to inflame the casual dispute of some boys and mechanics into a general rising of the people. Yet the humane Nicholas was still averse to accept the forfeit of his life, and the traitor was removed from the scene of temptation to Bologna, with a liberal allowance for his support, and the easy obligation of presenting himself each day before the governor of the city. But Porcaro had learned from the younger Brutus that with tyrants no faith or gratitude should be observed. The exile declaimed against the arbitrary sentence. A party and a conspiracy were gradually formed. His nephew, a daring youth, assembled a band of volunteers, and on the appointed evening a feast was prepared at his house for the friends of the Republic. 
Their leader, who had escaped from Bologna, appeared among them in a robe of purple and gold. His voice, his countenance, his gestures bespoke the man who had devoted his life or death to the glorious cause. In a studied oration he expiated on the motives and the means of their enterprise, the name and liberties of Rome, the sloth and pride of their ecclesiastical tyrants, the active or passive consent of their fellow-citizens, three hundred soldiers and four hundred exiles long exercised in arms or in wrongs, the license of revenge to edge their swords, and a million of ducats to reward their victory. It would be easy, he said, on the next day, the festival of the Epiphany, to seize the Pope and his cardinals before the doors or at the altar of St. Peter's, to lead them in chains under the walls of St. Angelo, to extort by the threat of their instant death a surrender of the castle, to ascend the vacant capital, to ring the alarm bell, and to restore in a popular assembly the ancient Republic of Rome. While he triumphed, he was already betrayed. The senator, with a strong guard, invested the house. The nephew of Porcaro cut his way through the crowd, but the unfortunate Stephen was drawn from a chest, lamenting that his enemies had anticipated by three hours the execution of his design. After such manifest and repeated guilt, even the mercy of Nicholas was silent. Porcaro and nine of his accomplices were hanged without the benefit of the sacraments, and amidst the fears and invectives of the papal court, the Romans pitied and almost applauded these martyrs of their country. But their applause was mute, their pity ineffectual, their liberty forever extinct, and if they have since risen in a vacancy of the throne or a scarcity of bread, such accidental tumults may be found in the bosom of the most abject servitude. But the independence of the nobles, which was fomented by discord, survived the freedom of the commons, which must be founded in union. A privilege of rapine and oppression was long maintained by the barons of Rome. Their houses were a fortress and a sanctuary, and the ferocious train of banditti and criminals whom they protected from the law repaid the hospitality with the service of their swords and daggers. The private interest of the pontiffs, or their nephews, sometimes involved them in these domestic feuds. Under the reign of Sixtus IV, Rome was distracted by the battles and sieges of the rival houses. After the conflagration of his palace, the prothonotary Colonna was tortured and beheaded, and Savelli, his captive friend, was murdered on the spot for refusing to join in the acclamations of the victorious Ursini. But the popes no longer trembled in the Vatican. They had strength to command, if they had resolution to claim, the obedience of their subjects, and the strangers who observed these partial disorders admired the easy taxes and wise administration of the ecclesiastical state. The spiritual thunders of the Vatican depend on the force of opinion, and if that opinion be supplanted by reason or passion, the sound may idly waste itself in the air, and the helpless priest is exposed to the brutal violence of a noble or a plebeian adversary. But after their return from Avignon, the keys of St. Peter were guarded by the sword of St. Paul. Rome was commanded by an impregnable citadel. The use of cannon is a powerful engine against popular seditions. A regular force of cavalry and infantry was enlisted under the banners of the Pope. His ample revenues supplied the resources of war, and, from the extent of his domain, he could bring down on a rebellious city an army of hostile neighbours and loyal subjects. Since the union of the duchies of Ferrara and Urbino, the ecclesiastical state extends from the Mediterranean to the Adriatic, and from the confines of Naples to the banks of the Po, and as early as the sixteenth century the greater part of that spacious and fruitful country acknowledged the lawful claims and temporal sovereignty of the Roman pontiffs. Their claims were readily deduced from the genuine or fabulous donations of the darker ages. The successive steps of their final settlement would engage us too far in the transactions of Italy and even of Europe. The crimes of Alexander the Sixth, the martial operations of Julius the Second, and the liberal policy of Leo the Tenth, 
a theme which has been adorned by the pens of the noblest historians of the times. In the first period of their conquests, till the expedition of Charles the Eighth, the popes might successfully wrestle with the adjacent princes and states, whose military force was equal or inferior to their own. But as soon as the monarchs of France, Germany, and Spain contended with gigantic arms for the dominion of Italy, they supplied with art the deficiency of strength, and concealed in a labyrinth of wars and treaties their aspiring views, and the immortal hope of chasing the barbarians beyond the Alps. The nice balance of the Vatican was often subverted by the soldiers of the North and West, who were united under the standard of Charles V. The feeble and fluctuating policy of Clement VII exposed his person and dominions to the conqueror, and Rome was abandoned seven months to a lawless army, more cruel and rapacious than the Goths and Vandals. After this severe lesson, the popes contracted their ambition, which was almost satisfied, resumed the character of a common parent, and abstained from all offensive hostilities, except in a hasty quarrel when the vicar of Christ and the Turkish sultan were armed at the same time against the kingdom of Naples. The French and Germans at length withdrew from the field of battle. Milan, Naples, Sicily, Sardinia, and the sea-coast of Tuscany were firmly possessed by the Spaniards, and it became their interest to maintain the peace and dependence of Italy, which continued almost without disturbance from the middle of the sixteenth to the opening of the eighteenth century. The Vatican was swayed and protected by the religious policy of the Catholic king. His prejudice and interest disposed him in every dispute to support the prince against the people, and instead of the encouragement, the aid, and the asylum which they obtained from the adjacent states, the friends of liberty, or the enemies of law, were enclosed on all sides within the iron circle of despotism. The long habits of obedience and education subdued the turbulent spirits of the nobles and commons of Rome. The barons forgot the arms and factions of their ancestors, and insensibly became the servants of luxury and government. Instead of maintaining a crowd of tenants and followers, the produce of their estates was consumed in the private expenses which multiply the pleasures and diminish the power of the lord. The Colonna and Orsini vied with each other in the decoration of their palaces and chapels, and their antique splendour was rivalled or surpassed by the sudden opulence of the papal families. In Rome the voice of freedom and discord is no longer heard and instead of the foaming torrent, a smooth and stagnant lake reflects the image of idleness and servitude. A Christian, a philosopher, and a patriot will be equally scandalized by the temporal kingdom of the clergy, and the local majesty of Rome, the remembrance of her consuls and triumph, may seem to embitter the sense and aggravate the shame of her slavery. If we calmly weigh the merits and defects of the ecclesiastical government, it may be praised in its present state as a mild, decent, and tranquil system, exempt from the dangers of a minority, the sallies of youth, the expenses of luxury, and the calamities of war. But these advantages are overbalanced by a frequent, perhaps a septennial, election of a sovereign who is seldom a native of the country. The reign of a young statesman of threescore, in the decline of his life and abilities, without hope to accomplish and without children to inherit, the labours of his transitory reign. The successful candidate is drawn from the church, and even the convent, from the mode of education and life the most adverse to reason, humanity, and freedom. In the trammels of servile faith he has learned to believe because it is absurd, to revere all that is contemptible, and to despise whatever might deserve the esteem of a rational being, to punish error as a crime, to reward mortification and celibacy as the first of virtues, to place the saints of the calendar above the heroes of Rome and the sages of Athens, and to consider the missal or the crucifix as more useful instruments than the plough or the loom. In the office of nuncio or the rank of cardinal he may acquire some knowledge of the world, but the primitive stain will adhere to his mind and manners. From study and experience he may suspect the mystery of his profession, 
but the sacerdotal artist will imbibe some portion of the bigotry which he inculcates. The genius of Sixtus V burst from the gloom of a Franciscan cloister. In a reign of five years he exterminated the outlaws and banditti, abolished the profane sanctuaries of Rome, formed a naval and military force, restored and emulated the monuments of antiquity, and after a liberal use and large increase of the revenue, left five millions of crowns in the castle of St. Angelo. But his justice was sullied with cruelty, his activity was prompted by the ambition of conquest, after his decease the abuses revived, the treasure was dissipated, he entailed on posterity thirty-five new taxes and the venality of offices, and after his death his statue was demolished by an ungrateful or an injured people. The wild and original character of Sixtus V stands alone in the series of the pontiffs. The maxims and effects of their temporal government may be collected from the positive and comparative view of the arts and philosophy, the agriculture and trade, the wealth and population of the ecclesiastical state. For myself, it is my wish to depart in charity with all mankind, nor am I willing in these last moments to offend even the Pope and clergy of Rome. In the last days of Pope Eugenius IV, two of his servants, the learned Pogius and a friend, ascended the Capitoline Hill, reposed themselves among the ruins of columns and temples, and viewed from that commanding spot the wide and various prospect of desolation. The place and the object gave ample scope for moralizing on the vicissitudes of fortune, which spares neither man nor the proudest of his works, which buries empires and cities in a common grave, and it was agreed that, in proportion to her former greatness, the fall of Rome was the more awful and deplorable. Her primeval state, such as she might appear in a remote age, when Evander entertained the stranger of Troy, has been delineated by the fancy of Virgil. This Tarpeian rock was then a savage and solitary thicket. In the time of the poet, it was crowned with the golden roofs of a temple. The temple is overthrown. The gold has been pillaged. The wheel of fortune has accomplished her revolution. And the sacred ground is again disfigured with thorns and brambles. The hill of the capital, on which we sit, was formerly the head of the Roman Empire, the citadel of the earth, the terror of kings illustrated by the footsteps of so many triumphs, enriched with the spoils and tributes of so many nations. This spectacle of the world, how is fallen, how changed, how defaced. The path of victory is obliterated by vines, and the benches of the senators are concealed by a dunghill. Cast your eyes on the Palatine Hill, and seek among the shapeless and enormous fragments the marble theater, the obelisks, this colossal statues, the portico of Nero's palace. Survey the other hills of the city. The vacant space is interrupted only by ruins and gardens. The forum of the Roman people, where they assemble to enact their laws and elect their magistrates, is now enclosed for the cultivation of potherbs, or thrown open for the reception of swine and buffaloes. The public and private edifices that were founded for eternity lie prostrate, naked, and broken like limbs of a mighty giant, and the ruin is more visible from the stupendous relics that have survived the injuries of time and fortune. These relics are minutely described by Pogius, one of the first who raised his eyes from the monuments of legendary to those of classic superstition. 1. Besides a bridge, an arch, a sepulchre, and the pyramid of Cestius, he could discern, of the age of the Republic, a double row of vaults in the salt office of the capital, which were inscribed with the name and munificence of Catullus. 2. Eleven temples were visible in some degree, from the perfect form of the Pantheon, to the three arches and a marble column of the Temple of Peace, which Vespasian erected after the civil wars and the Jewish triumph. 3. Of the number, which he rashly defines, of seven thermi, or public baths, None were sufficiently entire to represent the use and distribution of the several parts. But those of Diocletian and Antoninus Caracalla still retained the titles of their founders, and astonished the curious spectator, who
who, in observing their solidity and extent, the variety of marbles, the size and multitude of the columns, compared the labor and expense with the use and importance. Of the baths of Constantine, of Alexander, of Domitian, or rather of Titus, some vestige might yet be found. 4. The triumphal arches of Titus, Severus, and Constantine were entire, both the structure and the inscriptions. A falling fragment was honored with the name of Trajan, and two arches then extant in the Flaminian way had been ascribed to the base memory of Faustina and Gallienus. 5. After the wonder of the Colosseum, Pogius might have overlooked a small amphitheater of brick, most probably for the use of the Praetorian camp. The theaters of Marcellus and Pompeii were occupied in a great measure by the public and private buildings, and in the circus, Agonilus and Maximus, little more than the situation and the form could be investigated. 6. The columns of Trajan and Antonine were still erect, but the Egyptian obelisks were broken or buried. A people of gods and heroes, the workmanship of art, was reduced to one equestrian figure of gilt brass and to five marble statues of which the two most conspicuous were the two horses, Aphidius and Praxiteles. The two mausoleums, or sepulchres, of Augustus and Hadrian could not totally be lost, but the former was only visible as a mound of earth, and the latter, the castle of St. Angelo, had acquired the name and appearance of a modern fortress. With the addition of some separate and nameless columns, such were the remains of the ancient city for the marks of a more recent structure might be detected in the walls, which form the circumference of ten miles, included three hundred and seventy-nine turrets, and opened into the country by thirteen gates. This melancholy picture was drawn above nine hundred years after the fall of the Western Empire, and even of the Gothic kingdom of Italy, a long period of distress and anarchy, in which empire and arts and riches had migrated from the banks of the Tiber, was incapable of restoring or adorning the city, and as all that is human must retrograde if it do not advance, every successive age must have hastened the ruin of the works of antiquity. To measure the progress of decay, and to ascertain, at each era, the state of each edifice, would be an endless and a useless labor, and I shall content myself with two observations, which will introduce a short inquiry into the general causes and effects. Two hundred years before the eloquent complaint of Pogius, an anonymous writer composed a description of Rome. His ignorance may repeat the same objects under strange and fabulous names, yet this barbarous topographer had ears and eyes. He could observe the visible remains, he could listen to the tradition of the people, and he distinctly enumerates seven theaters, eleven baths, twelve arches, and eighteen palaces, of which many had disappeared before the time of Pogius. It is apparent that many stately monuments of antiquity survived till a late period, and that the principles of destruction acted with vigorous and increasing energy in the 13th and 14th centuries. 2. The same reflection may be applied to the last three ages, and we should vainly seek the Septizonium of Severus, which is celebrated by Petrarch and the antiquarians of the 16th century. While the Roman edifices are still entire, the first blows however weighty and impetuous, were resisted by the solidity of the mass and the harmony of the parts. But the slightest touch would precipitate the fragments of arches and columns that already nodded to their fall. After a diligent inquiry, I can discern four principal causes of the ruin of Rome, which continued to operate in a period of more than a thousand years. 1. The injuries of time and nature. 2. The hostile acts of the barbarians and Christians. 3 the use and abuse of the materials, and four, the domestic quarrels of the Romans. One, the art of man is able to construct monuments far more permanent than the narrow span of his own existence. Yet these monuments, like himself, are perishable and frail, and in the boundless annals of time, his life and his labors must equally be measured as a fleeting moment. Of the simple and solid edifice, it is not easy to circumscribe the duration. As the wonder of ancient days, the pyramids attracted the curiosity of the ancients. A hundred generations, the leaves of autumn, have dropped into the grave, and after the fall of the pharaohs, and the Ptolemies, and the Caesars, and Caliphs, 
the same pyramids stand erect and unshaken above the floods of the Nile. A complex figure of various and minute parts is more accessible to injury and decay, and the silent lapse of time is often accelerated by hurricanes and earthquakes, by fires and inundations. The air and earth have doubtless been shaken, and the lofty turrets of Rome have tottered from their foundations. Yet the seven hills do not appear to be placed on the great cavities of the globe, nor has the city, in any age, been exposed to convulsions of nature, which, in the climate of Lisbon, Antioch, or Lima, have crumbled in a few moments the work of ages into dust. Fire is the more powerful agent of life and death. The rapid mischief may be kindled and propagated by the industry or negligence of mankind, and every period of the Roman annals is marked by the repetition of similar calamities. A memorable conflagration, the guilt or misfortune of Nero's reign, continued, though with unequal fury, either six or nine days. Innumerable buildings, crowded in close and crooked streets, supplied perpetual fuel for the flames, and when they ceased, four only of the fourteen regions were left entire, three were totally destroyed, and seven were deformed by the relics of smoking and lacerated edifices. In the full meridian of empire, the metropolis arose with fresh beauty from her ashes, yet the memory of the old deplored their irreparable losses, the arts of Greece, the trophies of victory, the monuments of primitive or fabulous antiquity. In the days of distress and anarchy, every wound is mortal, every fall irretrievable, nor can the damage be restored either by the public care of government or the activity of private interest. Yet two causes may be alleged which render the calamity of fire more destructive to a flourishing than a decayed city. 1. The more combustible materials of brick, timber, and metals are first melted or consumed, but the flames may play without injury or effect on the naked walls and massy arches that have been despoiled of their ornaments. 2. It is among the common and plebeian habitations that a mischievous spark is most easily blown to a conflagration, but as soon as they are devoured, the greater edifices, which have resisted or escaped, are left as so many islands in a state of solitude and safety. From her situation, Rome is exposed to the danger of frequent inundations. Without accepting the Tiber, the rivers that descend from either side of the Apennine have a short and irregular course. A shallow stream in the summer heats, and impetuous torrent when it is swelled in the spring or winter, by the fall of rain or the melting of snows. When the current is repelled from the sea by adverse winds, when the ordinary bed is inadequate to the weight of waters, they rise above the banks, and overspread without limits or control the plains and cities of the adjacent country. Soon after the triumph of the First Punic War, the Tiber was increased by unusual rains, and the inundation, surpassing all former measure of time and place, destroyed all the buildings that were situate below the hills of Rome. According to the variety of ground, the same mischief was produced by different means, and the edifices were either swept away by the sudden impulse, or dissolved and undermined by the long continuance of the flood. Under the reign of Augustus, the same calamity was renewed. The lawless river overturned the palaces and temples on its banks, and after the labors of the emperor in cleansing and widening the bed that was encumbered with ruins, the vigilance of his successors was exercised by similar dangers and designs. The project of diverting into new channels the Tiber itself, or some of the dependent streams, was long opposed by superstition and local interests. Nor did the use compensate the toil and cost of the tardy and imperfect execution. The servitude of rivers is the noblest and most important victory which man has obtained over the licentiousness of nature. And if such were the ravages of the Tiber under a firm and active government, what could oppose, or who could enumerate, the injuries of the city after the fall of the Western Empire? A remedy was at length produced by the evil itself. The accumulation of rubbish and the earth that has been washed down from the hills is supposed to have elevated the plain of Rome fourteen or fifteen feet, perhaps, above the ancient level, and the modern city is less accessible to the attacks of the river. 2. The crowd of writers of every nation who impute the destruction of the Roman monuments to the Goths and the Christians have neglected to inquire how far they were animated by a hostile principle and how far they possessed the means and leisure to satiate their enmity. In the preceding volumes of this history, I have described the triumph of barbarism and religion. 
I can only resume, in a few words, their real or imaginary connection with the ruin of ancient Rome. Our fancy may create, or adopt, a pleasing romance, that the Goths and Vandals sallied from Scandinavia, ardent to avenge the flight of Odin, to break the chains, and to chastise the oppressors of mankind, that they wished to burn the records of classic literature, and to found their national architecture on the broken remains of the Tuscan and Corinthian orders. But, in simple truth, the northern conquerors were neither sufficiently savage nor sufficiently refined to entertain such aspiring ideas of destruction and revenge. The shepherds of Scythia and Germany had been educated in the armies of empire, whose discipline they acquired and whose weakness they invaded. With the familiar use of the Latin tongue, they had learned to reverence the names and titles of Rome, and though incapable of emulating, they were more inclined to admire than to abolish the arts and studies of a brighter period. In the transient possession of a rich and unresisting capital, the soldiers of Alaric and Genseric were stimulated by the passions of a victorious army. Amidst the wanton indulgence of lust or cruelty, portable wealth was the object of their search, nor could they derive either pride or pleasure from the unprofitable reflection that they had battered to the ground the works of the consuls and Caesars. Their monuments were indeed precious. The Goths evacuated Rome on the 6th, the Vandals on the 15th day, and though it be far more difficult to build than to destroy, their hasty assault would have made a slight impression on the solid piles of antiquity. We may remember that both Alaric and Genseric affected to spare the buildings of the city, that they subsisted in strength and beauty under the auspicious government of Theodoric, and that the momentary resentment of Totila was disarmed by his own temper and the advice of his friends and enemies. From these innocent barbarians, the reproach may be transferred to the Catholics of Rome. The statues, altars, and houses of the demons were an abomination in their eyes, and in the absolute command of the city, they might labor with zeal and perseverance to erase the idolatry of their ancestors. The demolition of the temples in the east affords to them an example of conduct, and to us an argument of belief, and it is probable that a portion of guilt or merit may be imputed with justice to the Roman proselytes. Yet their abhorrence was confined to the monuments of heathen superstition, and the civil structures that were dedicated to the business or pleasure of society might be preserved without injury or scandal. The change of religion was accomplished not by a popular tumult, but by the decrees of the emperors, of the senate, and of time. The bishops of Rome were commonly the most prudent and least fanatic, nor can any positive charge be opposed to the meritorious act of saving and converting the majestic structure of the Pantheon. 3. The value of any object that supplies the wants or pleasures of mankind is compounded of its substance and its form, of the materials and the manufacture. Its price must depend on the number of persons by which it may be acquired and used, on the extent of the market, and consequently on the ease or difficulty of remote exportation. According to the nature of the commodity, its local situation, and the temporary circumstances of the world. The barbarian conquerors of Rome usurped in a moment the toil and treasures of successive ages. But, except the luxuries of immediate consumption, they must view without desire all that cannot be removed from the city in the Gothic wagons or in the fleet of the Vandals. Gold and silver were the first objects of their avarice. As in every country, and in the smallest compass, they represent the most ample command of the industry and possessions of mankind. A vase or a statue of those precious metals might tempt the vanity of some barbarian chief, but the grosser multitude, regardless of the form, was tenacious only of the substance, and the melted ingots might be readily divided and stamped into the current coin of the empire. The less active or less fortunate robbers were reduced to the baser plunder of brass, lead, iron, and copper. Whatever had escaped the Goths and Vandals were pillaged by the Greek tyrants, and the Emperor Constans, in his rapacious visit, stripped the bronze tiles from the roof of the Pantheon. The edifices of Rome might be considered as a vast and various mine. The first labor of extracting the materials was already performed. The metals were purified and cast, the marbles were hewn and polished, and after foreign or domestic rapine had been satiated, the remains of the city, could a purchaser have been found, were still venal. 
the monuments of antiquity had been left naked of their precious ornaments. But the Romans would demolish with their own hands the arches and walls, if the hope of profit could surpass the cost of the labor and exportation. If Charlemagne had fixed in Italy the seat of the Western Empire, his genius would have aspired to restore, rather than to violate, the works of the Caesars. But policy confined the French monarch to the forests of Germany. His taste could be gratified only by destruction, and the new palace of Aix-la-Chapelle was decorated with the marbles of Ravenna and Rome. Five hundred years after Charlemagne, a king of Sicily, Robert, the wisest and most liberal sovereign of the age, was supplied with the same materials by the easy navigation of the Tiber and the sea, and Petrarch sighs an indignant complaint that the ancient capital of the world should adorn from her own bowels the slothful luxury of Naples. But these examples of plunder or purchase were rare in the darker ages, and the Romans, alone and unenvied, might have applied to their private or public use the remaining structures of antiquity. If, in their present form and situation, they had not been useless in a great measure to the city and its inhabitants. The walls still described the old circumference, but the city had descended from the seven hills into the campus martius, and some of the most noblest monuments, which have braved the injuries of time, were left in a desert far remote from the habitations of mankind. The palaces of the senators were no longer adapted to the manners or fortunes of their indigent successors. The use of baths and porticos was forgotten. In the sixth century, the games of the theater, amphitheater, and circus had been interrupted. Some temples were devoted to the prevailing worship, but the Christian churches preferred the holy figure of the cross, and fashion, or reason, had distributed, after a peculiar model, the cells and offices of the cloister. Under the ecclesiastical reign, the number of these pious foundations was enormously multiplied and the city was crowned with forty monasteries of men, twenty of women, and sixty chapters and colleges of canons and priests, who aggravated, instead of relieving, the depopulation of the tenth century. But if the forms of ancient architecture were disregarded by a people insensible of their use and beauty, the plentiful materials were applied to every call of necessity or superstition, till the fairest columns of the Ionic and Corinthian orders the richest marbles of Paros and Numidia were degraded, perhaps to the support of a convent or a stable. The daily havoc which is perpetuated by the Turks in the cities of Greece and Asia may afford a melancholy example, and in the gradual destruction of the monuments of Rome, Sixtus V may alone be excused for employing the stones of the Septizonium in the glorious edifice of St. Peter's. A fragment, a ruin, howsoever mangled or profaned, may be viewed with pleasure and regret. But the greater part of the marble was deprived of substance, as well as of place and proportion. It was burnt to lime for the purpose of cement. Since the arrival of Pogius, the Temple of Concord, and many capital structures had vanished from his eyes. And an epigram of the same age expresses a just and pious fear that the continuance of this practice would finally annihilate all the monuments of antiquity. The smallness of their numbers was the sole check on the demands and depredations of the Romans. The imagination of Petrarch might create the presence of a mighty people, but I hesitate to believe that, even in the 14th century, they could be reduced to a contemptible list of 33,000 inhabitants. From that period to the reign of Leo X, if they multiplied to the amount of 85,000, the increase of citizens was in some degree pernicious to the ancient city. 4. I have reserved for the last the most potent and forcible cause of destruction, the domestic hostilities of the Romans themselves. Under the dominion of the Greek and French emperors, the peace of the city was disturbed by accidental, though frequent, seditions, and it is from the decline of the latter, from the beginning of the tenth century, that we may date the licentiousness of private war, which violated with impunity the laws of the code and the gospel, without respecting the majesty of the absent sovereign, or the presence and person of the vicar of Christ. In a dark period of five hundred years, Rome was perpetually afflicted by the sanguinary quarrels of the nobles and the people, the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, the Colonna and the Ursini. And if much has escaped the knowledge, and much is unworthy of the notice of history, 
I have exposed in the two preceding chapters the causes and effects of the public disorders. At such a time, when every quarrel was decided by the sword, and none could trust their lives or properties to the impotence of law, the powerful citizens were armed for safety or offense against the domestic enemies whom they feared or hated. Except Venice alone, the same dangers and designs were common to all the free republics of Italy, and the nobles usurped the prerogative of fortifying their houses and erecting strong towers that were capable of resisting a sudden attack. The cities were filled with these hostile edifices, and the example of Luca, which contained three hundred towers, her law, which confined their height to the measure of fourscore feet, may be extended with suitable latitude to the more opulent and populous states. The first step of the senator Brancaleone in the establishment of peace and justice was to demolish, as we have already seen, one hundred and forty towers of Rome, and in the last days of anarchy and discord, as late as the reign of Martin V, forty-four still stood in one of the thirteen or fourteen regions of the city. To this mischievous purpose, the remains of antiquity were most readily adapted. The temples and arches afforded a broad and solid basis for the new structures of brick and stone, and we can name the modern turrets which were raised on the triumphal monuments of Julius Caesar, Titus, and the Antonines. With some slight alterations, a theater, an amphitheater, a mausoleum, was transformed into a strong and spacious citadel. I need not repeat that the mole of Hadrian had assumed the title and form of the castle of St. Angelo. The septizonium of Severus was capable of standing against a royal army, and the sepulchre of Metella had sunk under its outworks. The theaters of Pompeii and Marcellus were occupied by the Savelli and Ursini families, and the rough fortress had been gradually softened to the splendor and elegance of an Italian palace. Even the churches were encompassed with arms and bulwarks, and the military engines on the roof of St. Peter's were the terror of the Vatican and the scandal of the Christian world. Whatever is fortified will be attacked, and whatever is attacked may be destroyed. Could the Romans have wrested from the popes the castle of St. Angelo, they had resolved by a public decree to annihilate that monument of servitude. Every building of defense was exposed to a siege, and in every siege the arts and engines of destruction were laboriously employed. After the death of Nicholas IV, Rome, without a sovereign or a senate, was abandoned six months to the fury of civil war. The houses, says a cardinal and poet of the time, were crushed by the weight and velocity of enormous stones. The walls were perforated by the strokes of the battering ram. The towers were involved in fire and smoke, and the assailants were stimulated by rapine and revenge. The work was consummated by the tyranny of the laws, and the factions of Italy alternately exercised a blind and thoughtless vengeance on their adversaries, whose houses and castles they raised to the ground. In comparing the days of foreign with the ages of domestic hostility, we must pronounce that the latter has been far more ruinous to the city and our opinion is confirmed by the evidence of Petrarch. Behold, says the laureate, the relics of Rome, the image of her pristine greatness. Neither time nor the barbarian can boast the merit of this stupendous destruction. It was perpetuated by her own citizens, by the most illustrious of her sons, and your ancestors, he writes to the noble Annibaldi, have done with the battering ram what the Punic hero cannot accomplish with the sword. The influence of the two last principles of decay must in some degree be multiplied by each other, since the houses and towers which were subverted by civil war required a new and perpetual supply from the monuments of antiquity. These general observations may be separately applied to the amphitheater of Titus, which had obtained the name of the Colosseum, either from its magnitude or from Nero's colossal statue. An edifice, had it been left to time and nature, which might have perhaps have claimed an eternal duration. The curious antiquaries who have computed the numbers and seats are disposed to believe that above the upper row of stone steps, the amphitheater was encircled and elevated with several stages of wooden galleries, which were repeatedly consumed by fire and restored by the emperors. Whatever was precious or portable or profane, the statues of gods and heroes, and the costly ornaments of sculpture, which were cast in brass, or overspread with leaves of silver and gold, became the first prey of conquest, or fanaticism, of the avarice of the barbarians, or the Christians. 
In the massy stones of the Colosseum, many holes were discerned, and the two most probable conjectures represent the various accidents of its decay. These stones were connected by solid links of brass or iron, nor had the eye of rapine overlooked the value of the baser metals. The vacant space was converted into a fair or market. The artisans of the Colosseum are mentioned in an ancient survey, and the chasms were perforated or enlarged to receive the poles that supported the tents or shops of the mechanic trades. Reduced to its naked majesty, the Flavian amphitheater was contemplated with awe and admiration by the pilgrims of the north, and their rude enthusiasm broke forth in a sublime, proverbial expression, which is recorded in the 8th century in the fragments of the venerable Bede. As long as the Colosseum stands, Rome shall stand. When the Colosseum falls, Rome will fall. When Rome falls, the world will fall. In the modern system of war, a situation commanded by three hills would not be chosen for a fortress, but the strength of the walls and arches could resist the engines of assault. A numerous garrison might be lodged in the enclosure, and while one faction occupied the Vatican and the capital, the other was entrenched in the Lateran and the Colosseum. The abolition at Rome of the ancient games must be understood with some latitude, and the carnival sports of the Testacian Mound and the Circus Agnullius were regulated by the law or custom of the city. The senator presided with dignity and pomp, to adjudge and distribute the prizes. The gold ring, or the pallium, which, as it was styled, of cloth or silk, a tribute on the Jews supplied the annual expense, and the races on foot or horseback, or in chariots, were ennobled by a tilt and tournament of seventy-two of the Roman youth. In the year 1332, a bull-feast was celebrated in the Colosseum itself, and the living manners were painted in a diary of the times. A convenient order of benches was restored, and a general proclamation, as far as Rimini and Ravenna, invited the nobles to exercise their skill and courage in this perilous adventure. The Roman ladies were marshaled in three squadrons, and seated in three balconies, which, on this day, the 3rd of September, were lined with scarlet cloth. The fair Jacova de Revole led the matrons from beyond the Tiber, a pure and native race who still represented the features and characters of antiquity. The remainder of the city was divided as usual between the Colonna and the Ursini. The two factions were proud of the number and beauty of their female bands, and the charms of Savella Ursini were mentioned with praise, and the Colonna regretted the absence of the youngest of their house who had sprained her ankle in the garden of Nero's tower. The lots of the champions were drawn by an old and respectable citizen, and they descended into the arena, or pit, to encounter the wild bulls, on foot as it should seem, with a single spear. Amidst the crowd, our analyst has selected the names, colors, and devices of twenty of the most conspicuous knights. Several of the names are the most illustrious of Rome and the ecclesiastical state. Malatesta, Polenta, De La Valle, Caffarello, Savelli, Capoccio, Conti, Annabaldi, Altieri, Corsi. The colors were adapted to their taste and situation. The devices are expressive of hope or despair, and breathe the spirit of gallantry and arms. I am alone, like the youngest of the Horatii, the confidence of the intrepid stranger. I live disconsolate, a weeping widower. I burn under the ashes, a discreet lover. I adore Lavinia, or Lucretia, the ambiguous declaration of a modern passion. My faith is as pure, the motto of a white livery. Who is stronger than myself, of a lion's hide? If I am drowned in blood, what a pleasant death, the wish of ferocious courage. The pride or prudence of the Ursini restrained them from the field which was occupied by three of their hereditary rivals, whose inscriptions denoted the lofty greatness of the Colonna name. Though sad, I am strong, strong as I am great. If I fall, addressing himself to the spectators, you fall with me. Intimating, says the contemporary writer, that while the other families were the subjects of the Vatican, they alone were the supporters of the capital. The combats of the amphitheater were dangerous and bloody. Every champion successively encountered a wild bull, and the victory may be ascribed to the quadrupeds, 
since no more than eleven were left on the field, with the loss of nine wounded and eighteen killed on the side of their adversaries. Some of the noblest families might mourn, but the pomp of the funerals in the churches of St. John Lateran and Santa Maria Maggiore afforded a second holiday to the people. Doubtless it was not in such conflicts that the blood of the Romans should have been shed, yet in blaming their rashness we are compelled to applaud their gallantry, and the noble volunteers who display their magnificence and risk their lives under the balconies of the fair excite a more generous sympathy than the thousands of captives and malefactors who were reluctantly dragged to the scene of slaughter. This use of the amphitheater was a rare and perhaps singular festival. The demand for the materials was a daily and continual want, which the citizens could gratify without restraint or remorse. In the 14th century, a scandalous act of concord secured to both factions the privilege of extracting stones from the free and common quarry of the Colosseum, and Pogius laments that the greater part of these stones had been burnt to lime by the folly of the Romans. To check this abuse, and to prevent the nocturnal crimes that might be perpetuated in the vast and gloomy recess, Eugenius the Fourth surrounded it with a wall, and, by a charter, long extant, granted both the ground and edifice to the monks of an adjacent convent. After his death, the wall was overthrown in a tumult of the people, and had they themselves respected the noblest monuments of their fathers, they might have justified the resolve that it should never be degraded to private property. The inside was damaged, but in the middle of the 16th century, an era of taste and learning, the exterior circumference of 1,612 feet was still entire and inviolate. A triple elevation of fourscore arches which rose to the height of 108 feet. Of the present ruin, the nephews of Paul III are the guilty agents, and every traveler who views the Farnese Palace may curse the sacrilege and luxury of these upstart princes. A similar approach is applied to the Barberini, and the repetition of injury might be dreaded from every reign, till the Colosseum was placed under the safeguard of religion by the most liberal of the pontiffs, Benedict the Fourteenth, who consecrated a spot, which persecution and fable had stained with the blood of so many Christian martyrs. When Petrarch first gratified his eyes with the view of those monuments, whose scattered fragments so far surpass the most eloquent descriptions, he was astonished at the supine indifference of the Romans themselves. He was humbled rather than elated by the discovery that, except for his friend Rizzini and one of the Colonna, a stranger of the Rhone was more conversant with these antiquities than the nobles and natives of the metropolis. The ignorance and credulity of the Romans are elaborately displayed in the old survey of the city, which was composed about the beginning of the 13th century. And without dwelling on the manifold errors of name and place, the legend of the capital may provoke a smile of contempt and indignation. The capital, says the anonymous writer, is so named as being the head of the world, where the consuls and senators formerly resided for the government of the city and the globe. The strong and lofty walls were covered with glass and gold, and crowned with the roof of the richest and most curious carving. Below the citadel stood a palace of gold for the greatest part, decorated with precious stones, and whose value might be esteemed at one-third of the world itself. The statues of all the provinces were arranged in order, each with a small bell suspended from its neck, and such was the contrivance of art magic, that, if the province rebelled against Rome, the statue turned round to that quarter of the heavens, the bell rang, and the prophet of the citadel reported the prodigy, and the senate was admonished of the impending danger. A second example, of less importance though of equal absurdity, may be drawn from the two marble houses, led by two naked youths, which have long been transported from the baths of Constantine to the Quirinal Hill. The groundless application of the names of Phidias and Praxiteles may perhaps be excused, but these Grecian sculptures should not have been removed above four hundred years from the age of Pericles to that of Tiberius. They should not have been transformed into two philosophers or magicians, whose nakedness was the symbol of truth and knowledge, who revealed to the emperor his most secret actions, and, after refusing all pecuniary recompense, solicited the honor of leaving this internal monument of themselves. Thus awake to the power of magic, 
the Romans were insensible to the beauties of art. No more than five statues were visible to the eyes of Pogius, and the multitudes which chance or design had buried under the ruins, the resurrection was fortunately delayed till a safer and more enlightened age. The Nile, which now adorns the Vatican, had been explored by some laborers in digging a vineyard near the temple or convent of the Minerva. But the impatient proprietor, who was tormented by some visits of curiosity, restored the unprofitable marble to its former grave. The discovery of a statue of Pompeii, ten feet in length, was the occasion of a lawsuit. It had been found under a partition wall. The equitable judge had pronounced that the head should be separated from the body to satisfy the claims of the contiguous owners and the sentence would have been executed if the intercession of a cardinal and the liberality of a pope had not rescued the Roman hero from the hands of his barbarous countrymen. But the clouds of barbarism were gradually dispelled, and the peaceful authority of Martin V and his successors restored the ornaments of the city, as well as the order of the ecclesiastical state. The improvements of Rome since the 15th century have not been the spontaneous produce of freedom and industry. The first and most natural root of a great city is the labor and populousness of the adjacent country, which supplies the materials of subsistence, of manufactures, and of foreign trade. But the greater part of the Campania of Rome is reduced to a dreary and desolate wilderness. The overgrown estates of the princes and the clergy are cultivated by the lazy hands of indigent and hopeless vassals, and the scanty harvests are confined or exported for the benefit of a monopoly. A second and more artificial cause of the growth of a metropolis is the residence of a monarch, the expense of a luxurious court, and the tributes of dependent provinces. Those provinces and tributes had been lost in the fall of the empire, and if some streams of the silver of Peru and the gold of Brazil had been attracted by the Vatican, the revenues of the cardinals, the fees of office, the oblations of pilgrims and clients, and the remnant of ecclesiastical taxes, afford a poor and precarious supply, which maintains, however, the idleness of the court and city. The population of Rome, far below the measure of the great capitals of Europe, does not exceed 170,000 inhabitants, and within the spacious enclosure of the walls, the largest portion of the seven hills is overspread with vineyards and ruins. The beauty and splendor of the modern city may be ascribed to the abuses of the government, to the influence of superstition. Each reign, the exceptions are rare, has been marked by the rapid elevation of a new family, enriched by the childless pontiff at the expense of the church and country. The palaces of these fortunate nephews are the most costly monuments of elegance and servitude. The perfect arts of architecture, painting, and sculpture have been prostituted in their service, and their galleries and gardens are decorated with the most precious works of antiquity, which taste or vanity has prompted them to collect. The ecclesiastical revenues were more decently employed by the popes themselves in the pomp of the Catholic worship, but it is superfluous to enumerate their pious foundations of altars, chapels, and churches, since these lesser stars are eclipsed by the sun of the Vatican, by the dome of St. Peter, the most glorious structure that has ever been applied to the use of religion. The fame of Julius II, Leo X, and Sixtus V is accompanied by the superior merit of Bramante and Fontana, of Raphael, and Michael Angelo, and the same munificence which had been displayed in palaces and temples was directed with equal zeal to revive and emulate the labors of antiquity. Prostrate obelisks were raised from the ground, and erected in the most conspicuous places. Of the eleven aqueducts of the Caesars and consuls, three were restored. The artificial rivers were conducted over a long series of old or of new arches, to discharge into marble basins a flood of salubrious and refreshing waters, and the spectator, impatient to ascend the steps of St. Peter's, is detained by a column of Egyptian granite, which rises between two lofty and perpetual fountains to the height of one hundred and twenty feet. The map, the description, the monuments of ancient Rome have been elucidated by the diligence of the antiquarian and the student, and the footsteps of heroes the relics not of superstition but of empire, are devoutly visited by a new race of pilgrims from the remote and once savage countries of the north. Of these pilgrims, and of every reader, the attentions will be excited by a history 
of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, the greatest, perhaps, and most awful scene in the history of mankind. The various causes and progressive effects are connected with many of the events most interesting in human annals. The artful policy of the Caesars, who long maintained the name and image of a free republic. The disorders of military despotism. The rise, establishment, and sects of Christianity. The foundation of Constantinople. The division of the monarchy. The invasion and settlements of the barbarians of Germany and Scythia. The institutions of the civil law the character and religion of Mohammed, the temporal sovereignty of the popes, the restoration and decay of the western empire of Charlemagne, the crusades of the Latins in the east, the conquest of the Saracens and Turks, the ruin of the Greek empire, the state and revolutions of Rome in the Middle Age. The historian may applaud the importance and variety of his subject, but while he is conscious of his own imperfections, he must often accuse the deficiency of his materials. It was among the ruins of the capital that I first conceived the idea of a work which has amused and exercised near twenty years of my life, and which, however inadequate to my own wishes, I finally deliver to the curiosity and candor of the public. Lausanne, June 27, 1787 And End of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.